This Immortal by Roger Zelasny Copyright 1966 by Roger Zelasny Narrated by Donald Hotaling This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains a marker allowing direct access to the beginning of the book. About the Author Roger Zelasny is probably the most rapidly rising star in the science fiction firmament today. Still a young man, his first tales did not begin to appear until 1962, and in the following year his story, A Rose for Ecclesiastes, won instant acclaim and a Hugo nomination. Several of his tales achieved anthology merits, and at the 1966 awards presentation of the Science Fiction Writers of America, he carried off two of the six nebulas. You are a Calacanzaurus, she announced suddenly. I turned onto my left side and smiled through the darkness. I left my hooves and my horns at the office. You've heard the story. Well, the name is Nomikos. I reached for her, found her. Are you going to destroy the world this time around? I laughed and drew her to me. I'll think about it. If that's the way the earth crumbles, you know that children born here on Christmas are of the Calacanzaroi blood, she said, and you once told me that your birthday, all right. It had struck me that she was only half joking. Knowing some of the things one occasionally meets in the old places, the hot places, you can almost believe in myths without extra effort. Such as the story of those pan-like sprites who gather together every spring to spend ten days sawing at the tree of the world, only to be dispersed at the last moment by the ringing of the Easter bells. Ring-a-ding the bells, gnash-gnash the teeth, clackety-clack the hooves, etc. Cassandra and I were not in the habit of discussing religion, politics, or Aegean folklore in bed, but, me having been born in these parts, the memories are still somehow alive. I'm hurt, I said, only half joking. You're hurting me, too. Sorry. I relaxed again. After a time, I explained, back when I was a brat, the other brats used to push me around calling me Constantine Calacanzaris. When I got bigger and uglier, they stopped doing it. At least they didn't say it to my face. Constantine, that was your name? I've wondered. It's Conrad now, so forget it. But I like it. I'd rather call you Constantine than Conrad. If it makes you happy. The moon pushed her ravaged face up over the window sill to mock me. I couldn't reach the moon or even the window, so I looked away. The night was cold, was damp, was misty, as it always is here. The Commissioner of Arts, Monuments, and Archives for the planet Earth is hardly out to chop down the tree of the world, I rasped. My Calacanzaris, she said too quickly. I did not say that. But there are fewer bells every year, and it is not always desire that matters. I have this feeling that you will change things somehow. Perhaps you are wrong, Cassandra, and I am afraid and cold. And she was lovely in the darkness, so I held her in my arms to sort of keep her from the foggy, foggy dew. In attempting to reconstruct the affairs of these past six months, I realize now that we willed walls of passion around our October and the Isle of Cause. The earth had already fallen into the hands of those powers which smash all Octobers. Marshaled from within and without, the forces of final disruption were even then goose-stepping amidst the ruins, faceless, ineluctable, arms upraised, Court Mishtigo had landed at Port-au-Prince in the antique Soul Bus 9, which had borne him in from Titan, along with a load of shirts and shoes, underwear, socks, assorted wines, medical supplies, and the latest tapes from civilization. A wealthy and influential galacto-journalist, he. 
just how wealthy we were not to learn for many weeks. Just how influential I found out only five days ago. As we wandered among the olive groves gone wild, picked our way through the ruins of the Frankish castle, or mixed our tracks with the hieroglyph prints of the herring gulls there on the wet sands of the beaches of Cos, we were burning time while waiting for a ransom which could not come, which should never really have been expected. Cassandra's hair is the color of Katamara olives and shiny. Her hands are soft, the fingers short, delicately webbed. Her eyes are very dark. She is only about four inches shorter than me, which makes her gracefulness something of an achievement, me being well over six feet. Of course, any woman looks graceful, precise, and handsome when walking at my side, because I am none of these things. My left cheek was then a map of Africa, done up in varying purples, because of that mutant fungus I'd picked up from a moldy canvas back when I'd been disinterring the Guggenheim for the New York tour. My hairline peaks to within a finger breadth of my brow. My eyes are mismatched. I glare at people through the cold blue one on the right side when I want to intimidate them. The brown one is for glances sincere and honest. I wear a reinforced boot because of my short right leg. Cassandra doesn't require contrasting, though. She's beautiful. I met her by accident, pursued her with desperation, married her against my will. The last part was her idea. I wasn't really thinking about it myself. Even on the day when I brought my kayak into the harbor and saw her there, sunning herself like a mermaid beside the plain tree of Hippocrates, and decided that I wanted her. Calacans Aroy have never been much the family sort. I just sort of slipped up again. It was a clean morning. It was starting our third month together. It was my last day on cause because of a call I'd received the evening before. Everything was still moist from the night's rain, and we sat out on the patio drinking Turkish coffee and eating oranges. Day was starting to lever its way into the world. The breeze was intermittent, was damp, goose-pimpled us beneath the black hulk of our sweaters, skimmed the steam off the top of the coffee. Rhodos dactylos aurora, she said, pointing. Yeah, I said, nodding. Real rosy-fingered and nice. Let's enjoy it. Yeah, sorry. We finished our coffee, sat smoking. I feel crummy, I said. I know, she said. Don't. Can't help it. Got to go away and leave you, and that's crummy. It may only be a few weeks, you said so yourself. Then you'll be back. Hope so, I said. If it takes any longer, though, I'll send for you. To know where all I'll be yet. Who is Court Mishtiko? Vegan, actor, journalist, important one. Wants to write about what's left of Earth. So I've got to show it to him. Me. Personally. Damn. Anybody who takes ten-month vacations to go sailing can't complain about being overworked. I can complain. And I will. My job is supposed to be a sinecure. Why? Mainly because I made it that way. I worked hard for twenty years to make arts, monuments, and archives what it is, and ten years ago I got it to the point where my staff could handle just about everything. So I got me turned out to pasture. I got me told to come back occasionally to sign papers and to do whatever I damn pleased in the meantime. Now this, this bootlicking gesture, having a commissioner take a vegan scribbler on a tour any staff guide could conduct. Vegans aren't gods. Wait a minute, please, she said. Twenty years? Ten years? Sinking feeling. You're not even thirty years old. I sank further. I waited. I rose again. Um, there's something I... Well, in my own reticent way, sort of never quite got around to mentioning to you. How old are you, anyway, Cassandra? Twenty. Uh-huh. Well, uh, I'm about four times your age. 
I don't understand. Neither do I, or the doctors. I just sort of stopped somewhere between twenty and thirty, and I stayed that way. I guess that's a sort of, well, a, a part of my particular mutation, I guess. Does it make any difference? I don't know. Yes. You don't mind my limb or my excessive shagginess or even my face. Why should my age bother you? I am young for all necessary purposes. It's just that it's not the same, she said with an unarguable finality. What if you never grow old? I bit my lip. I'm bound to sooner or later. And if it's later, I love you. I don't want to outage you. You'll live to be a hundred and fifty. There are the SS treatments. You'll have them. But they won't keep me young like you. I'm not really young. I was born old. That one didn't work either. She started to cry. That's years and years away, I told her. Who knows what will happen in the meantime? That only made her cry more. I've always been impulsive. My thinking is usually pretty good, but I always seem to do it after I do my talking, by which time I've generally destroyed all basis for further conversation. Which is one of the reasons I have a competent staff, a good radio, and am out to pasture most of the time. There are some things you just can't delegate, though. So I said, look, you have a touch of the hot stuff in you, too. It took me forty years to realize I wasn't forty years old. Maybe you're the same way. I'm just a neighborhood kid. Do you know of any other cases like your own? Well, no, you don't. No, I don't. I remember wishing then that I was back aboard my ship. Not the big blaze boat, just my old hulk, the golden vanity, out there in the harbor. I remember wishing that I was putting it into port all over again and seeing her there for the first shiny time and being able to start everything all over again from the beginning and either telling her all about it right there or else working my way back up to the going away time and keeping my mouth shut about my age. It was a nice dream, but hell, the honeymoon was over. I waited until she had stopped crying and I could feel her eyes on me again. And then I waited some more. Well, I asked finally. Pretty well, thanks. I found and held her passive hand, raised it to my lips. Rhodos dactylos, I breathed. And she said, maybe it's a good idea you're going away, for a while anyhow. And the breeze that skimmed the steam came again, was damp, goose-pimpled us, and made either her hand or my hand shake, I'm not sure which. It shook the leaves, too, and they emptied over our heads. Did you exaggerate your age to me, she asked, even a little bit? Her tone of voice suggested that agreement would be the wisest reply. So, yes, I said truthfully. She smiled back then, somewhat reassured of my humanity. Ha <laughs> ha. So we sat there, holding hands and watching the morning. After a while she began humming. It was a sad song, centuries old, a ballad. It told the story of a young wrestler named Themocles, a wrestler who had never been beaten. He eventually came to consider himself the greatest wrestler alive. Finally, he called out his challenge from a mountain top, and that being too near home, the gods acted fast. The following day, a crippled boy rode into the town on the plated back of a huge wild dog. They wrestled for three days and three nights, Themocles and the boy, and on the fourth day, the boy broke his back and left him there in the field. Wherever his blood fell, there sprang up the Strigefleur as Emmett calls it, the blood-drinking flower that creeps rootless at night, seeking the lost spirit of the fallen champion in the blood of its victims. But Themocles' spirit is gone from the earth, so they must creep, seeking forever. 
simpler than Aeschylus, but then we're a simpler people than we once were, especially the mainlanders. Besides, that's not the way it really happened. Why are you weeping? she asked me suddenly. I am thinking of the picture on Achilles' shield, I said, and of what a terrible thing it is to be an educated beast. And I am not weeping. The leaves are dripping on me. I'll make some more coffee. I washed out the cups while she was doing that, and I told her to take care of the vanity while I was gone, and to have it hauled up into dry dock if I sent for her. She said that she would. The sun wandered up higher into the sky, and after a time there came a sound of hammering from the yard of old Aldonis, the coffin-maker. The cyclamen had come awake, and the breezes carried their fragrance to us from across the fields. High overhead, like a dark omen, a spider-bat glided across the sky toward the mainland. I ached to wrap my fingers around the stock of a thirty o six, make loud noises, and watch it fall. The only firearms I knew of were aboard the vanity, though, so I just watched it vanish from sight. They say that they're not really native to Earth, she told me, watching it go, and that they were brought here from Titan for zoos and things like that. That's right. And that they got loose during the three days and went wild, and that they grow bigger here than they ever did in their own world. One time I saw one with a thirty-two-foot wing spread. My great-uncle once told me a story he had heard in Athens, she recalled, about a man killing one without any weapons. It snatched him up from off the dock he was standing on, at Piraeus, and the man broke its neck with his hands. They fell about a hundred feet into the bay. The man lived. That was a long time ago, I remembered, back before the office started its campaign to exterminate the things. They were a lot more around, and they were bolder in those days. They shy away from cities now. The man's name was Constantine, as I recall the story. Could it have been you? His last name was Caragiosis. Are you Caragiosis? If you want me to be, why? because he later helped to found the Returnist Radpal in Athens, and you have very strong hands. Are you a Returnist? Yes. Are you? I work for the office. I don't have any political opinions. Caragiosis bombed resorts. So he did. Are you sorry he bombed them? No. I don't really know much about you, do I? You know anything about me. Just ask. I'm really quite simple. My air taxi is coming now. I don't hear anything. You will. After a moment it came sliding down the sky toward Cos, homing in on the beacon I had set up at the end of the patio. I stood and drew her to her feet as it buzzed in low, a Radson skimmer, a twenty-foot cockle-shell of reflection and transparency, flat-bottomed, blunt-nosed. Anything you want to take with you? she asked. You know it, but I can't. The skimmer settled and its sides slid open. The goggled pilot turned his head. I have a feeling, she said, that you are heading into some sort of danger. I doubt it, Cassandra. Nor pressure, nor osmosis will restore Adam's lost rib, thank God. Goodbye, Cassandra. Goodbye, my Calacanzaras. And I got into the skimmer and jumped into the sky, breathing a prayer to Aphrodite. Below me, Cassandra waved. Behind me, the sun tightened its net of light. We sped westward, and this is the place for a smooth transition, but there isn't any. From Cos to Port-au-Prince was four hours, grey water, pale stars, and me mad. Watch the coloured lights. The hall was lousy with people, a big tropical moon was shining fit to bust, and the reason I could see both was that I'd finally managed to lure Ellen Emmett out onto the balcony, and the doors were mag-pegged open. 
Back from the dead again, she had greeted me, smiling slightly. Gone almost a year, and not so much as a get-well card from Ceylon. Were you ill? I could have been. She was small, and, like all day-haters, creamy somewhere under her simicolor. She reminded me of an elaborate action doll with a faulty mechanism, cold grace and a propensity to kick people in the shins when they least expected it. And she had lots and lots of orange-brown hair woven into a Gordian knot of a coif that frustrated me as I worked at untying it mentally. Her eyes were of whatever color it pleased the god of her choice on that particular day. I forget now, but they're always blue somewhere, deep, deep down inside. Whatever she was wearing was brown-green, and there was enough of it to go around a couple of times and make her look like a shapeless weed, which was a dressmaker's lie if there ever was one, unless she was pregnant again, which I doubted. Well, get well, I said, if you need to. I didn't make Ceylon. I was in the Mediterranean most of the time. There was applause within. I was glad I was without. The players had just finished Graeber's Mask of Demeter, which he had written in pentameter in honor of our vegan guest. And the thing had been two hours long and bad. Phil was all educated and sparse-haired, and he looked the part all right, but we had been pretty hard up for a laureate on the day we'd picked him. He was given to fits of Rabindranath Tagore and Chris Isherwood, the writing of fearfully long metaphysical epics, talking a lot about enlightenment, and performing his daily breathing exercises on the beach. Otherwise, he was a fairly decent human being. The applause died down, and I heard the glassy tinkle of philinstra music and the sound of resuming voices. Ellen leaned back on the railing. I hear you're somewhat married these days. True, I agreed. Also somewhat harried. Why did they call me back? Ask your boss. I did. He said I'm going to be a guide. What I want to know, though, is why. The real reason. I've been thinking about it, and it's grown more puzzling. So how should I know? You know everything. You overestimate me, dear. What's she like? I shrugged. A mermaid, maybe. Why? She shrugged. Just curious. What do you tell people I'm like? I don't tell people you're like anything. I'm insulted. I must be like something, unless I'm unique. That's it, you're unique. Then why didn't you take me away with you last year? Because you're a people person, and you require a city around you. You could only be happy here at the port. But I'm not happy here at the port. You are less unhappy here at the port than you'd be anywhere else on this planet. We could have tried, she said, and she turned her back on me to look down the slope toward the lights of the harbor section. You know, she said after a time, you're so damned ugly, you're attractive. That must be it. I stopped in mid-reach, a couple inches from her shoulder. You know, she continued, her voice flat, emptied of emotion, you're a nightmare that walks like a man. I dropped my hand, chuckled inside a tight chest. I know, I said. Pleasant dreams. I started to turn away, and she caught my sleeve. Wait. I looked down at her hand, up at her eyes, then back down at her hand. She let go. You know I never tell the truth, she said. Then she laughed her little brittle laugh. And I have thought of something you ought to know about this trip. Donald Dos Santos is here, and I think he's going along. Dos Santos? That's ridiculous. He's up in the library now, with George and some big Arab. I looked past her and down into the harbor section, watching the shadows, like my thoughts, move along dim streets, dark and slow. Big Arab, I said after a time, scarred hands, yellow eyes, name of Hassan. Yes, that's right. 
Have you met him? He's done some work for me in the past, I acknowledged. So I smiled, even though my blood was refrigerating, because I don't like people to know what I'm thinking. You're smiling, she said. What are you thinking? She's like that. I'm thinking you take things more seriously than I thought you took things. Nonsense. I've often told you I'm a fearful liar. Just a second ago, in fact. And I was only referring to a minor encounter in a great war. And you're right about my being less unhappy here than anywhere else on earth. So maybe you could talk to George. Get him to take a job on Taller or Baycab. Maybe, huh? Yeah, I said, sure, you bet. Just like that. After you've tried for ten years? How is his bug collection these days? She sort of smiled. Growing, she replied, by leaps and bounds. Buzzes and crawls, too, and some of those crawlies are radioactive. I say to him, George, why don't you run around with other women instead of spending all your time with those bugs? But he just shakes his head and looks dedicated. Then I say, George, one day one of those uglies is going to bite you and make you impotent. What'll you do then? Then he explains that that can't happen, and he lectures me on insect toxins. Maybe he's really a big bug himself in disguise. I think he gets some kind of sexual pleasure out of watching them swarm around in those tanks. I don't know what else. I turned away and looked inside the hall then, because her face was no longer her face. When I heard her laugh a moment later, I turned back and squeezed her shoulder. Okay, I know more than I knew before. Thanks. I'll see you sometime soon. Should I wait? No. Good night. Good night, Conrad. And I was away. Crossing a room can be a ticklish and time-consuming business. If it's full of people, if the people all know you, if the people are all holding glasses, if you have even a slight tendency to limp. It was, they did, and they were, and I do. So, thinking inconspicuous thoughts, I edged my way along the wall just at the periphery of humanity for about twenty feet until I reached the enclave of young ladies the old celibate always had hovering about him. He was chinless, nearly lipless, and going hairless, and the expression that had once lived in that flesh covering his skull had long ago retreated into the darkness of his eyes, and the eyes had it as they caught me, the smile of imminent outrage. Phil, I said, nodding, not everybody can write a mask like that. I've heard it said that it's a dying art, but now I know better. You're still alive, he said, in a voice seventy years younger than the rest of him, and late again, as usual. I abase myself in my contrition, I told him, but I was detained at a birthday party for a lady aged seven at the home of an old friend. Which was true, but it has nothing to do with this story. All your friends are old friends, aren't they? he asked. And that was hitting below the belt, just because I had once known his barely remembered parents and had taken them around to the south side of the Erechtheum in order to show them the porch of the maidens and point out what Lord Elgin had done with the rest, all the while carrying their bright-eyed youngsters on my shoulders and telling him tales that were old when the place was built. And I need your help. I added, ignoring the jibe, and gently pushing my way through the soft, pungent circle of femininity. It'll take me all night to cross this hall to where Sands is holding court with the vegan, pardon me, miss, and I don't have all night, excuse me, ma'am, so I want you to run interference for me. You're Nomikos, breathed one little lovely, staring at my cheek. I've always wanted to... I seized her hand, pressed it to my lips noted that her camille ring was glowing pink, said, and negative kismet, eh, and dropped it. So how about it? I asked Graber. Get me from here to there in a minimum of time in your typical courtier-like fashion with a running conversation that no one would dare interrupt. Okay, let's run. He nodded brusquely. 
Excuse me, ladies, I'll be back. We started across the room, negotiating alleys of people. High overhead, the chandeliers drifted and turned like faceted satellites of ice. The Thalinstra was an intelligent aeolian harp, tossing its shards of song into the air, pieces of colored glass. The people buzzed and drifted like certain of George Emmett's insects, and we avoided their swarms by putting one foot in front of another without pause and making noises of our own. We didn't step on anybody who squashed. The night was warm. Most of the men wore the featherweight black dress uniform, which protocol dictates the staff suffer at these functions. Those who didn't weren't staff. Uncomfortable, despite their lightness, the dress blacks mag-bind down the sides, leaving a smooth front whereon is displayed a green, blue, gray, white earth insignia, about three inches in diameter, high up on the left breast. Below, the symbol of one's department is worn, followed by the rank sigil. On the right side goes every blessed bit of chicken manure that can be dreamt up to fake dignity. This, by the highly imaginative Office of Awards, Furbishments, Insignae, Symbols, and Heraldry. Ofish, for short. Its first director appreciated his position. The caller has a tendency to become a garret after the first ten minutes, at least mine does. The ladies wore, or didn't, whatever they pleased, usually bright or accompanied by pastel simicoloring, unless they were staff, in which case they were neatly packed into short-skirted dress blacks, but with bearable collars, which makes it somewhat easier to tell some of the keepers from the kept. I hear Dos Santos is here, I said. So he is. Why? I don't really know or care. Tisk and tisk? What happened to your wonderful political consciousness? The Department of Literary Criticism used to praise you for it. At my age, the smell of death becomes more and more unsettling each time it's encountered. And Dos Santos smells? He tends to reek. I've heard that he's employed a former associate of ours from the days of the Madagascar affair. Phil cocked his head to one side and shot me a quizzical look. You hear things quite quickly, but then you're a friend of Ellen's. Yes, Hassan is here. He's upstairs with Don. Whose karmic burden is he likely to help lighten? As I said before, I don't really know or care about any of this. Want to venture a guess? Not especially. We entered a thinly wooded section of the forest, and I paused to grab a rum and other from the dip tray, which had followed overhead, until I could hear its anguish no longer, and it finally pressed the acorn which hung at the end of its tail. At this it had dipped obligingly, smiled open, and revealed the treasures of its frosty interior. Ah, joy! Buy your drink, Phil? I thought you were in a hurry. I am, but I want to survey the situation some. Very well, I'll have a semi-coke. I squinted at him, passed him the thing. Then, as he turned away, I followed the direction of his gaze toward the easy chairs set in the alcove formed by the northeast corner of the room on two sides and the bulk of the Thalinstra on the third. The Thalinstra player was an old lady with dreamy eyes. Earth director Laurel Sands was smoking his pipe. Now, the pipe is one of the more interesting facets of Laurel's personality. It's a real meerschaum, and there aren't too many of them left in the world. As for the rest of him, his function is rather like that of an anti-computer. You feed him all kinds of carefully garnered facts, figures, and statistics, and he translates them into garbage. Keen, dark eyes, and a slow, rumbly way of speaking while he holds you with them. Rarely given to gestures, but then very deliberate as he saws the air with a wide right hand or pokes imaginary ladies with his pipe. White at the temples and dark above, he is high of cheekbone, has a complexion that matches his tweeds, he assiduously avoids dress blacks, 
and he constantly strives to push his jaw an inch higher and further forward than seems comfortable. He is a political appointee by the EarthGov on Taller, and he takes his work quite seriously, even to the extent of demonstrating his dedication with periodic attacks of ulcers. He is not the most intelligent man on earth. He is my boss. He is also one of the best friends I have. Beside him sat Court Mishtigo. I could almost feel Phil hating him, from the pale blue soles of his six-toed feet to the pink upper-cast dye of his temple-to-temple hair strip. Not hating him so much, because he was him, but hating him, I was sure, because he was the closest available relative, grandson, of Tatrim Ishtigo who forty years before had commenced to demonstrate that the greatest living writer in the English language was a vegan. The old gent is still at it, and I don't believe Phil has ever forgiven him. Out of the corner of my eye, the blue one, I saw Ellen ascending the big, ornate stairway on the other side of the hall. Out of the other corner of my other eye, I saw Laurel looking in my direction. I, said I, have been spotted, and I must go now to pay my respects to the William Seabrook of Taller. Come along? Well, very well, said Phil, suffering is good for the soul. We moved on to the alcove and stood before the two chairs, between the music and the noise, there in the place of power. Laurel stood slowly and shook hands. Mishtigo stood more slowly and did not shake hands. He stared, amber-eyed, his face expressionless, as we were introduced. His loose-hanging orange shirt fluttered constantly as his chambered lungs forced their perpetual exhalation out of the anterior nostrils at the base of his wide ribcage. He nodded briefly, repeated my name. Then he turned to Phil with something like a smile. Would you care to have me translate your mask into English? he asked, his voice sounding like a dying down tuning fork. Phil turned on his heel and walked away. Then I thought the vegan was ill for a second, until I recollected that a vegan's laugh sounds something like a billy goat choking. I try to stay away from vegans by avoiding the resorts. Sit down, said Laurel looking uncomfortable behind his pipe. I drew up a chair and set it across from them. Okay. Court is going to write a book, said Laurel. So you said. About the earth. I nodded. He expressed a desire that you be his guide on a tour of certain of the old places. I am honored, I said rather stiffly. Also, I am curious what determined his selection of me as guide. And even more curious as to what he may know about you, eh? said the vegan. Yes, I am, I agreed, by a couple hundred percent. I asked the machine. Fine, now I know. I leaned back and finished my drink. I started by checking the Weitstats register for Earth when I first conceived of this project, just for general human data. Then, after I'd turned up an interesting item, I tried the Earth office personnel banks. Uh-huh, I said. And I was more impressed by what they did not say of you than by what they said. I shrugged. There are many gaps in your career. Even now, no one really knows what you do most of the time. And, by the way, when were you born? I don't know. It was in a tiny Greek village, and they were all out of calendars that year. Christmas Day, though, I'm told. According to your personnel record, you're seventy-seven years old. According to Weitstadt, you're either a hundred eleven or a hundred thirty. I fibbed about my age to get the job. There was a depression going on. So I made up a nomikos profile, which is a kind of distinctive thing, and I set Weitstats to hunting down point zero zero one physical analogues in all of its banks, including the closed ones. 
Some people collect old coins. Other people build model rockets. I found that you could have been three or four or five other persons, all of them Greeks, and one of them truly amazing. But of course, Constantine Coronis, one of the older ones, was born 234 years ago, on Christmas. Blue eye, brown eye, game right leg, same hairline at age 23, same height and same Bertillon scales. Same fingerprints, same retinal patterns. These were not included in many of the older registry files. Maybe they were sloppier in those days, I don't know. More careless, perhaps, as to who had access to public records. You are aware that there are over four million persons on this planet right now. By searching back through the past three or four centuries, I dare say you could find doubles or even triples for quite a few of them. So what? It serves to make you somewhat intriguing, that's all, almost like a spirit of place. And you are as curiously ruined as this place is. Doubtless I shall never achieve your age, whatever it may be, and I was curious as to the sort of sensibilities a human might cultivate, given so much time, especially in view of your position as a master of your world's history and art. So that is why I asked for your services, he concluded. Now that you've met me, ruined and all, can I go home? Conrad, the pipe attacked me. No, Mr. Nomikos, there are practical considerations also. This is a tough world, and you have a high survival potential. I want you with me because I want to survive. I shrugged again. Well, that's settled. What now? He chuckled. I perceive that you dislike me. Whatever gave you that idea? Just because you insulted a friend of mine, asked me impertinent questions, impressed me into your service on a whim, exploited your countrymen, turned your world into a brothel, and demonstrated the utter provinciality of the human race as compared to a galactic culture eons older. I'm not talking your race, my race. I'm talking personal talk. And I repeat, you insulted my friend, asked me impertinent questions, impressed me into your service on a whim. Billy Goat snuffle, to all three. It is an insult to the shades of Homer and Dante to have that man sing for the human race. At the moment he's the best we've got, in which case you should do without. That's no reason to treat him the way you did. I think it is, or I wouldn't have done it. Second, I asked whatever questions I feel like asking, and it is your privilege to answer or not to answer as you see fit, just as you did. Finally, nobody impressed you into anything. You're a civil servant. You have been given assignment. Argue with your office, not me. And as an afterthought, I doubt that you possess sufficient data to use the word whim as freely as you do, he finished. From his expression, it appeared that Laurel's ulcer was making silent commentary, as I observed, Then call your rudeness plain dealing, if you will, or the product of another culture, and justify your influence with sophistries and afterthink all you like and by all means deliver me all manner of spurious judgments, that I may judge you in return. You behave like a royal representative in a crown colony, I decided, pronouncing the capitals, and I don't like it. I've read all your books. I've also read your granddad's, like his Earth Whore's Lament, and you'll never be the man he is. He has a thing called compassion. You don't. Anything you feel about old Phil goes double for you in my book. That part about Grandpa must have touched on a sore spot because he flinched when my blue gaze hit him. So kiss my elbow, I said, or something like that, in Vegan. Sands doesn't speak enough Beggy to have caught it, but he made conciliatory noises immediately, looking about the while to be sure we were not being overheard. 
Conrad, please find your professional attitude and put it back on. Srin's Geo, why don't we get on with the planning? Mishtigo smiled his blue-green smile. And minimize our differences, he asked. All right. Then let's adjourn to the library, where it's quieter, and we can use the map screen. Fine. I felt a bit reinforced as we rose to go, because Don Dos Santos was up there, and he hates vegans, and wherever Dos Santos is, there is always Diane, the girl with the red wig, and she hates everybody, and I knew George Emmett was upstairs, and Ellen too, and George is a real cold fish around strangers, friends too, for that matter, and perhaps Phil would wander in later and fire on Fort Sumter, and then there was Hassan. He doesn't say much, he just sits there and smokes his weeds and looks opaque. And if you stood too near him and took a couple deep breaths, you wouldn't care what the hell you said to vegans or people either. I had hoped that Hassan's memory would be on the rocks or else up there somewhere among the clouds. Hope died as we entered the library. He was sitting straight and sipping lemonade. Eighty or ninety or more, looking about forty, he could still act thirty. The sprung Samsa treatments had found highly responsive material. It's not often that way, almost never, in fact. They put some people into accelerated anaphylactic shock for no apparent reason, and even an intracardial blast of adrenaline won't haul them back. Others, most others, they freeze at five or six decades but some rare ones actually grow younger when they take the series, about one in a hundred thousand. It struck me as odd that in Destiny's big shooting gallery, this one should make it in such a way. It had been over fifty years since the Madagascar affair, in which Hassan had been employed by the Radpal in their vendetta against the Talarites. He had been in the pay of, rest in peace, the big K in Athens, who had sent him to polish off the EarthGov Realty Company. He'd done it, too, and well, with one tiny fission device, POW, instant urban renewal. Called Hassan the Assassin by the few, he is the last mercenary on Earth. Also, besides Phil, who had not always been the wielder of the bladeless sword without a hilt, Hassan was one of the very few who could remember old Karagios. So, chin up and fungus forward, I tried to cloud his mind with my first glance. Either there were ancient and mysterious powers afoot, which I doubted, or he was higher than I'd thought, which was possible, or he had forgotten my face— which could have been possible, though not real likely, or he was exercising a professional ethic, or a low animal cunning. He possessed both of the latter in varying degrees, but the accent was on the animal cunning. He made no sign as we were introduced. My bodyguard Hassan, said Dos Santos, flashing his magnesium flare smile, as I shook the hand that once had shaken the world, so to speak. It was still a very strong hand. Conrad Nomikos, said Hassan, squinting as though he were reading it from off a scroll. I knew everyone else in the room, so I hastened to the chair farthest from Hassan, and I kept my second drink in front of my face most of the time, just to be safe. Diane of the Red Wig stood near. She spoke. She said, Good morning, Mr. Nomikos. I nodded my drink. Good evening, Diane. Tall, slim, wearing mostly white, she stood beside Dos Santos like a candle. I know it's a wig she wears, because I've seen it slip upwards on occasion, revealing part of an interesting and ugly scar which is usually hidden by the low hairline she keeps. I've often wondered about that scar— Sometimes, as I lay at anchor, staring up at parts of constellations through clouds, or when I unearth damaged statues, purple lips, tattooed, I think, and I've never seen them smile. Her jaw muscles are always raised cords, because her teeth are always clenched, and there's a little upside-down V between her eyes from all that frowning, and her chin is slight, 
held high, defiant. She barely moves her mouth when she speaks in that tight, choppy way of hers. I couldn't really guess at her age. Over thirty, that's all. She and Don make an interesting pair. He is dark, loquacious, always smoking, unable to sit still for more than two minutes. She is taller by about five inches, burns without flickering. I still don't know all of her story. I guess I never will. She came over and stood beside my chair while Laurel was introducing Court to Dos Santos. You, she said. Me, I said, will conduct the tour. Everybody knows all about it but me, said I. I don't suppose you could spare me a little of your knowledge on the matter. No knowledge, no matter, said she. You sound like Phil, said I. Didn't mean to. You did, though. So why? Why what? Why you, Don, here, tonight? She touched her tongue to her upper lip, then pressed it hard as though to squeeze out the grape juice or keep in the words. Then she looked over at Don, but he was too far away to have heard, and he was looking in another direction anyway. He was busy pouring Mishtigo, a real Coke, from the pitcher in the exec dip tray. The Coke formula had been the archaeological find of the century, according to the Vegans. It was lost during the three days and recovered only a decade or so ago. There had been lots of semi-cokes around, but none of them have the same effect on vegan metabolism as the real thing. Earth's second contribution to galactic culture, one of their contemporary historians had called it. The first contribution, of course, being a very fine new social problem of the sort that weary vegan philosophers had been waiting around for generations to have happen. Diane looked back. Don't know yet, she said. Ask Don. I will. I did, too. Later, though. And I wasn't disappointed, inasmuch as I expected nothing. But as I sat trying as hard as I could to eavesdrop, there was suddenly a sight-vision overlay, of the sort a shrink had once classified for me as a pseudo-telepathic wish-fulfillment. It works like this. I want to know what's going on somewhere. I have almost sufficient information to guess, therefore I do. Only it comes on as though I am seeing it and hearing it through the eyes and ears of one of the parties involved. It's not real telepathy, though. I don't think, because it can sometimes be wrong. It sure seems real, though. The shrink could tell me everything about it but why. Which is how I was standing in the middle of the room, was staring at Mishtigo, was Dos Santos, was saying, We'll be going along for your protection, not as Radpole's secretary, just a private citizen. I did not solicit your protection, the vegan was saying. However, I thank you. I will accept your offer to circumvent my death at the hands of your comrades. And he smiled as he said it, if they should seek it during my travels. I doubt that they will, but I should be a fool to refuse the shield of Dos Santos. You are wise, we said, bowing slightly. Quite, said Court. Now tell me, he nodded toward Ellen, who had just finished arguing with George about anything and was stamping away from him. Who is that? Ellen Emmett, the wife of George Emmett, the director of the Wildlife Conservation Department. What is her price? I don't know that she's quoted one recently. Well, what did it used to be? There never was one. Everything on earth has a price. In that case, I suppose you'll have to find out for yourself. I will, he said. Earth Thames have always held an odd attraction for vegans. A veggie once told me that they make him feel rather like a zoophilist, which is interesting because a pleasure girl at the Cote d'Or resort once told me, with a giggle, that vegans made her feel rather like un zoophiliste. I guess those jets of air must tickle or something and arouse both beasts. By the way, we said, have you stopped beating your wife lately? Which one? asked Miss Jigo. Fade out and me back in my chair. What, uh, George Emmett was asking, do you think of that? I stared at him. He hadn't been there a second ago. 
He had come up suddenly and perched himself on the wide wing of my chair. Come again, please. I was dozing. I said we've beaten the spider bat. What do you think of that? It rhymes, I observed. So tell me how we've beaten the spider bat. But he was laughing. He's one of those guys with whom laughter is an unpredictable thing. He'll go around looking sour for days, and then some little thing will set him off giggling. He sort of gasps when he laughs like a baby, and that impression is reinforced by his pink flaccidity and thinning hair. So I waited. Ellen was off insulting Laurel now, and Diane had turned to read the titles on the bookshelves. Finally, I've developed a new strain of sleeshy, he panted confidentially. Say, that's really great. Then, what are sleeshy? I asked softly. The schlish is a Bacabian parasite, he explained, rather like a large tick. Mine are about three-eighths of an inch long, he said proudly, and they burrow deep into the flesh and give off a highly poisonous waste product. Fatal? Mine are. Could you lend me one? I asked him. Why? I want to drop it down someone's back. On second thought, make it a couple dozen. I have lots of friends. Mine won't bother people, just spider bats. They discriminate against people. People would poison my sleeshy. He said my sleeshy very possessively. Their host has to have a copper rather than an iron-based metabolism, he explained, and spider bats fall into that category. That's why I want to go with you on this trip. You want me to find a spider bat and hold it for you while you dump sleeshy on it? Is that what you're trying to say? Well, I would like a couple spider bats to keep. I used all mine up last month, but I'm already sure the sleeshy will work. I want to go along to start the plague. Which plague? Among the bats. The sleeshy multiply quite rapidly under earth conditions, if they're given the proper host, and they should be extremely contagious if we could get them started at the right time of year. What I had in mind was the late southwestern spider bat mating season. It will begin in six to eight weeks in the territory of California, in an old place, not really hot any more, though, called Capistrano. I understand that your tour will take you out that way at about that time. When the spider bats return to Capistrano, I want to be waiting for them with the sleeshy. Also, I could use a vacation. Mm-hmm. Have you talked this over with Laurel? Yes, and he thinks it's a fine idea. In fact, he wants to meet us out there and take pictures. There may not be too many more opportunities to see them. Darkening the sky with their flight, nesting about the ruins the way they do, eating the wild pigs, leaving their green droppings in the streets. It's rather beautiful, you know. Uh-huh, sort of like Halloween. What happens to all those wild pigs if we kill off the spider bats? Oh, there'll be more of them around. But I figure the pumas will keep them from getting like Australian rabbits. Anyway, you'd rather have pigs than spider bats, wouldn't you? I'm not particularly fond of either. But now that I think of it, I suppose I would rather have pigs than spider bats. All right, sure, you can come along. Thank you, he said. I was sure you'd help. Don't mention it. Laurel made apologetic sounds deep in his throat about then. He stood beside the big desk in the middle of the room, before which the broad view screen was slowly lowering itself. It was a thick depth transparer, so nobody had to move around after a better seat. He pressed a button on the side of the desk, and the lights dimmed somewhat. Um, I'm about to project a series of maps, he said, if I can get this synchro thing. Uh, there, there it is. The upper part of Africa and most of the Mediterranean countries appeared in pastels. Is that the one you wanted first? he asked Mishtigo. It was, eventually, said the big vegan, turning away from a muffled conversation with Ellen, whom he had cornered in the French history alcove beneath a bust of Voltaire. The lights dimmed some more, and Mishtigo moved to the desk. 
He looked at the map, and then at nobody in particular. I want to visit certain key sites, which, for one reason or another, are important in the history of your world, he said. I'd like to start with Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Then I'd like to move on quickly through Madrid, Paris, and London. The map shifted as he talked, not fast enough, though, to keep up with him. Then I want to backtrack to Berlin, hit Brussels, visit St. Petersburg and Moscow, skip back over the Atlantic, and stop at Boston, New York, D.C., Chicago. Laurel was working up a sweat by then. Drop down to Yucatan and jump back up to the California Territory. In that order? I asked. Pretty much so, he said. What's wrong with India and the Middle East, or the Far East for that matter? asked a voice which I recognized as Phil's. He had come in after the lights had gone down low. Nothing, said Mishtigo, except that it's mainly mud and sand and hot and has nothing whatsoever to do with what I'm after. What are you after? A story. What kind of story? I'll send you an autographed copy. Thanks. With pleasure. When do you wish to leave? I asked him. Day after tomorrow, he said. Okay. I've had detailed maps of the specific sites made up for you. Laurel tells me they were delivered to your office this afternoon. Okay again. But there is something of which you may not be fully cognizant. It involves the fact that everything you've named so far is mainlandish. We're pretty much an island culture these days, and for very good reasons. During the three days the mainland got a good juicing, and most of the places you've named are still inclined to be somewhat hot. This, though, is not the only reason they are considered unsafe. I am not unfamiliar with your history, and I am also aware of the radiation precautions, he interrupted. Also, I am aware of the variety of mutated life forms which inhabit old places. I am concerned, but not worried. I shrugged in the artificial twilight. It's okay by me. Good. He took another sip of coke. Let me have a little light then, Laurel. Right, Srin. It was light again. As the screen was sucked upward behind him, Mishtigo asked me, Is it true that you are acquainted with several mambos and hugans here at the port? Why, yes, I said. Why? He approached my chair. I understand, he said conversationally, that voodoo, or voodoo, has survived pretty much unchanged over the centuries. Perhaps, I said. I wasn't around here when it got started, so I wouldn't know for sure. I understand that the participants do not much appreciate the presence of outsiders. That, too, is correct. But they'll put on a good show for you, if you pick the right home for and drop in on them with a few gifts. But I should like very much to witness a real ceremony. If I were to attend one with someone who was not a stranger to the participants, perhaps then I could obtain the genuine thing. Why should you want to? Morbid curiosity concerning barbaric customs? No, I am a student of comparative religions. I studied his face, but couldn't tell anything from it. It had been a while since I'd visited with Mama Julie and Papa Joe or any of the others, and the Hanfor wasn't that far away, but I didn't know how they'd take to me bringing a vegan around. They'd never objected when I'd brought people, of course. Well, I began, I just want to watch, he said. I'll stay out of the way. They'll hardly know I'm there. I mumbled a bit and finally gave in. I knew Mama Julie pretty well, and I didn't see any real harm being done, no matter what. So, okay, said I, I'll take you to one. Tonight, if you like. He agreed, thanked me, and went off after another coke. George, who had not strayed from the arm of my chair, leaned toward me and observed that it would be very interesting to dissect a vegan. I agreed with him. When Mishtigo returned, Dos Santos was at his side. 
What is this about you taking Mr. Mishtigo to a pagan ceremony? He asked, nostrils flared and quivering. That's right, I said, I am. Not without a bodyguard, you are not. I turned both palms upward. I am capable of handling anything which might arise. Hassan and I will accompany you. I was about to protest when Ellen insinuated herself between them. I want to go too, she said. I've never been to one. I shrugged. If Dos Santos went, then Diane would go too, which made for quite a few of us. So one more wouldn't matter, shouldn't matter. It was ruined before it got started. Why not, I said. The Home 4 was located down in the harbor section, possibly because it was dedicated to Agwe Woyo, god of the sea. More likely, though, it was because Mama Julie's people had always been harbor people. Agwe Woyo is not a jealous god, so lots of other deities are commemorated upon the walls in brilliant colors. There are more elaborate hound fours further inland, but they tend to be somewhat commercial. Agwe's big blaze boat was blue and orange and green and yellow and black, and it looked to be somewhat unseaworthy. Dambalavedo, crimson, writhed and coiled his length across most of the opposite wall. Several big rada drums were being stroked rhythmically by Papa Joe, forward and to the right of the door through which we entered, the only door. Various Christian saints peered from behind unfathomable expressions at the bright hearts and cocks and graveyard crosses, flags, machetes, and crossroads that clung to almost every inch of the walls about them, frozen into an after-the-hurricane surrealism by the ampateric paints of Titan. And whether or not the saints approved, one could never tell. They stared down through their cheap picture frames as though they were windows onto an alien world. The small altar bore numerous bottles of alcoholic beverages, gourds, sacred vessels for the spirits of the lower, charms, pipes, flags, depth photos of unknown persons, and among other things a pack of cigarettes for Papa Legba. A service was in progress when we were led in by a young Hunsi named Luis. The room was about eight meters long and five wide, had a high ceiling, a dirt floor. Dancers moved about the central pole with slow, strutting steps. Their flesh was dark, and it glistened in the dim light of the antique kerosene lamps. With our entry, the room became crowded. Mama Julie took my hand and smiled. She led me back to a place beside the altar and said Erzuli was kind. I nodded. She likes you, Nomiko. You live long, you travel much, and you come back. Always, I said. Those people? She indicated my companions with a flick of her dark eyes. Friends, they would be no bother. She laughed as I said it, so did I. I will keep them out of your way if you let us remain. We will stay in the shadows at the sides of the room. If you tell me to take them away, I will. I see that you have already danced much, emptied many bottles. Stay, she said. Come talk with me during daylight sometime. I will. She moved away then, and they made room for her in the circle of dances. She was quite large, though her voice was a small thing. She moved like a huge rubber doll, not without grace, stepping to the monotonous thunder of Papa Joe's drumming. After a time, this sound filled everything. My head, the earth, the air, like maybe the whale's heartbeat had seemed to half-digested Jonah. I watched the dancers, and I watched those who watched the dancers. I drank a pint of rum in an effort to catch up, but I couldn't. Mishtigo kept taking sips of coke from a bottle he had brought along with him. No one noticed that he was blue, but then we had gotten there rather late, and things were pretty well along the way to wherever they were going. Redwig stood in a corner, looking supercilious and frightened. She was holding a bottle at her side, but that's where it stayed. 
Mishtiga was holding Ellen at his side, and that's where she stayed. Dos Santos stood beside the door and watched everybody, even me. Hassan, crouched against the right-hand wall, was smoking a long-stemmed pipe with a small bowl. He appeared to be at peace. Mama Julie, I guess it was, began to sing. Other voices picked it up. Papa Legba Uvre Baye, Papa Legba Atabon Legba Uvre Baye, Puku Passe, Papa Legba. This went on and on and on. I began to feel drowsy. I drank more rum and felt thirstier and drank more rum. I'm not sure how long we had been there when it happened. The dancers had been kissing the pole and singing and rattling gourds and pouring out waters, and a couple of the Hunsi were acting possessed and talking incoherently, and the meal design on the floor was all blurred and there was lots of smoke in the air, and I was leaning back against the wall, and I guess my eyes had been closed for a minute or two. The sound came from an unexpected quarter. Hassan screamed. It was a long, wailing thing that brought me forward, then dizzily off balance, then back to the wall again with a thump. The drumming continued, not missing a single beat. Some of the dancers stopped, though, staring. Hassan had gotten to his feet. His teeth were bared and his eyes were slits and his face bore the ridges and valleys of exertion beneath its sheen of sweat. His beard was a fire-shot spearhead. His cloak, caught high against some wall decoration, was black wings. His hands, in a hypnosis of slow motion, were strangling a non-existent man. Animal sounds came from his throat. He continued to choke nobody. Finally he chuckled, and his hands sprang open. Dos Santos was at his side almost immediately, talking to him, but they inhabited two different worlds. One of the dancers began to moan softly, another joined him, and others. Mama Julie detached herself from the circle and came toward me, just as Hassan started the whole thing over again, this time with more elaborate histrionics. The drum continued its steady earth dance pronouncement. Papa Joe did not even look up. A bad sign, said Mama Julie. What do you know of this man? Plenty, I said, forcing my head to clear by an act of will. Angel Sue, she said. What? Angel Sue, she repeated. He is a dark god, one to be feared. Your friend is possessed by Angel Sue. Explain, please. He comes seldom to our hound for. He is not wanted here. Those he possesses become murderers. I think Hassan was trying a new pipe mixture, mutant ragweed or something. Angel Sue, she said again, your friend will become a killer, for Angel Sue is a death god and he only visits with his own. Mama Julie, said I, Hassan is a killer. If you had a piece of gum for every man he's killed and you tried to chew it all, you'd look like a chipmunk. He's a professional killer, within the limits of the law, usually. Since the code duello prevails on the mainland, he does most of his work there. It has been rumored that he does an illegal killing on occasion, but this thing has never been proved. So tell me, I finished, is Angel Sue the god of killers or the god of murderers? There should be a difference between the two, shouldn't there? Not to Angel Sue, she said. Dos Santos then, trying to stop the show, seized both of Hassan's wrists. He tried to pull his hands apart, but, well, try bending the bars of your cage sometime and you'll get the picture. I crossed the room, as did several of the others. This proved fortunate, because Hassan had finally noticed that someone was standing in front of him and dropped his hands, freeing them. Then he produced a long-bladed stiletto from under his cloak. Whether or not he would actually have used it on Don or anybody else is a moot point, 
because at that moment Mishtigo stoppered his Coke bottle with his thumb and hit him behind the ear with it. Hassan fell forward, and Don caught him, and I pried the blade from between his fingers, and Mishtigo finished his coat. Interesting ceremony, observed the vegan. I would never have suspected that big fellow of harboring such strong religious feelings. It just goes to show you that you can never be too sure, doesn't it? Yes, he gestured to indicate the onlookers. They are all pantheists, aren't they? I shook my head. Primitive animists. What is the difference? Well, that Coke bottle you just emptied is going to occupy the altar, or pay, as it is called, as a vessel for Anjelsu, since it has enjoyed an intimate mystical relationship with the god. That's the way an animist would see it. Now a pantheist just might get a little upset at somebody's coming in to his ceremonies uninvited and creating a disturbance such as we just did. A pantheist might be moved to sacrifice the intruders to Agwe Woyo, god of the sea, by hitting them all over the head in a similar ceremonial manner and tossing them off the end of the dock. Therefore I am going to have to explain to Mama Julie that all these people standing around glaring at us are really animists. Excuse me a minute. It wasn't really that bad, but I wanted to shake him up a bit. I think I did. After I'd apologized and said good night, I picked up Hassan. He was out cold, and I was the only one big enough to carry him. The street was deserted except for us and Agwe Woyo's big blaze boat was cutting the waves somewhere just under the eastern edge of the world and splashing the sky with all his favorite colors. Dos Santos, at my side, said, Perhaps you were correct. Maybe we should not have come along. I didn't bother to answer him, but Ellen, who was walking up ahead with Mishtigo, stopped, turned, and said, Nonsense! If you hadn't, we would have missed the tent-maker's wonderful dramatic monologue. By then I was within range, and both her hands shot out and wrapped around my throat. She applied no pressure, but she grimaced horribly, and observed, Er, mm, er, I'm possessed of Angel Sue, and you've had it. Then she laughed. Let go my throat, or I'll throw this Arab at you, I said, comparing the orange-brown color of her hair with the orange-pink color of the sky behind her, and smiled. He's a heavy one, too, I added. Then, a second before she let go, she applied some pressure, a little bit too much to be playful, and then she was back on Mishtigo's arm, and we were walking again. Well, women never slap me, because I always turn the other cheek first, and they're afraid of the fungus. So I guess a quick choke is about the only alternative. Frightfully interesting, said Redwig, felt strange, as if something inside me was dancing along with them. Odd feeling it was. I don't really like dancing, any kind. What kind of accent do you have? I interrupted her. I've been trying to place it. Don't know, she said. I'm sort of Irish-French. Lived in the Hebrides. Also Australia, Japan, till I was nineteen. Hassan moaned just then and flexed his muscles, and I felt a sharp pain in my shoulder. I set him down on a doorstep and shook him down. I found two throwing knives, another stiletto, a very neat gravity knife, a saw-edged buoy, strangling wires, and a small metal case containing various powders and vials of liquids, which I did not care to inspect too closely. I liked the gravity knife, so I kept it for myself. It was a korakama and very neat. Late the next day, call it evening, I shanghaied old Phil, determined to use him as the price of admission to Dos Santos' suite at the Royal. The Radpole still reveres Phil as a sort of returnist Tom Paine, even though he began pleading innocent to that about half a century ago, back when he began getting mysticism and respectability. While his Call of Earth probably is the best thing he ever wrote, he also drafted the Articles of Return, 
which helped to start the trouble I'd wanted started. He may do much disavowing these days, but he was a troublemaker then, and I'm sure he still files away all the fawning gazes and bright words it continues to bring him, takes them out every now and then, dusts them off, and regards them with something like pleasure. Besides Phil, I took along a pretext that I wanted to see how Hassan was feeling after the lamentable bash he'd received at the home for. Actually, what I wanted was a chance to talk to Hassan and find out how much, if anything, he'd be willing to tell me about his latest employment. So Phil and I walked it. It wasn't far from the office compound to the Royal, about seven minutes ambling. Have you finished writing my elegy yet? I asked. I'm still working on it. You've been saying that for the past twenty years. I wish you'd hurry up so I could read it. I could show you some very fine ones, laurels, georges, even one for Dos Santos. And I have all sorts of blank ones in my files, the fill-in kind for lesser notables. Yours is a problem, though. How so? I have to keep updating it. You go right on, quite blithely, living, doing things. You disapprove? Most people have the decency to do things for half a century and then stay put. Their elegies present no problems. I have cabinets full, but I'm afraid yours is going to be a last-minute thing with a discord ending. I don't like to work that way. I prefer to deliberate over a span of many years, to evaluate a person's life carefully and without pressure. You people who live your lives like folk songs trouble me. I think you're trying to force me to write you an epic, and I'm getting too old for that. I sometimes nod. I think you're being unfair, I told them. Other people get to read their elegies, and I'd even settle for a couple good limericks. Well, I have a feeling yours will be finished before too long, he noted. I'll try to get a copy to you in time. Oh? From whence springs this feeling? Who can isolate the source of an inspiration? You tell me. It came upon me as I meditated. I was in the process of composing one for the vegan, purely as an exercise, of course, and I found myself thinking, soon I will finish the Greeks. After a moment he continued, Conceptualize this thing, yourself as two men, each taller than the other. It could be done if I stood in front of a mirror and kept shifting my weight. I have this short leg. So I'm conceptualizing it. What now? Nothing. You don't go at these things properly. It's a cultural tradition against which I have never been successfully immunized. Like knots, horses, Gordia, Troy. You know, we're sneaky. He was silent for the next ten paces. So feathers or lead, I asked him. Pardon? It is the riddle of the Calacanzeros. Pick one. Feathers? You're wrong. If I had said lead? Uh-uh. You only have one chance. The correct answer is whatever the Calacanzeros wants it to be. You lose. That sounds a bit arbitrary. Calacanzaroi are that way. It's Greek rather than Oriental subtlety, less inscrutable, too. Because your life often depends on the answer, and the Calacanzeros generally want you to lose. Why is that? Ask the next Calacanzeros you meet, if you get the chance. They're mean spirits. We struck the proper avenue and turned up it. Why are you suddenly concerned with the Radpole again? he asked. It's been a long time since you left. I left at the proper time, and all I'm concerned with is whether it's coming alive again, like in the old days. Hassan comes high because he always delivers, and I want to know what's in the package. Are you worried they've found you out? No. It might be uncomfortable, but I doubt it would be incapacitating. The royal loomed before us, and we entered. We went directly to the suite. As we walked up the padded hallway, Phil, in a fit of perception, observed, I'm running interference again. That about says it. Okay. One'll get you ten, you find out nothing. 
I won't take you up on that. You're probably right. I knocked on the dark wood door. Hi there, I said as it opened. Come in, come in. And we were off. It took me ten minutes to turn the conversation to the lamentable bashing of the Bedouin, as Redwig was there distracting me by being there and being distracting. Good morning, she said. Good evening, I said. Anything new happening in arts? No. Monuments? No. Archives? No. But interesting work you must do. Oh, it's been over-publicized and glamorized, all out of shape by a few romanticists in the information office. Actually, all we do is locate, restore, and preserve the records and artifacts mankind has left lying about the earth. Sort of like cultural garbage collectors. Mm, yes, I think that's properly put. Well, why? Why what? Why do you do it? Someone has to, because it's cultural garbage. That makes it worth collecting. I know my garbage better than anyone else on earth. You're dedicated as well as being modest. That's good, too. Also, there weren't too many people to choose from when I applied for the job, and I knew where a lot of the garbage was stashed. She handed me a drink, took a sip and a half of her own, and asked, Are they actually still around? Who? I inquired. Divinity Incorporated. The old gods, like Anjosu. I thought all the gods had left the earth. No, they didn't. Just because most of them resemble us doesn't mean they act the same way. When man left, he didn't offer to take them along, and gods have some pride, too. But then maybe they had to stay anyhow. That thing called Ananke, death destiny. Nobody prevails against it. Like progress? Yeah. Uh, speaking of progress, how is Hassan progressing? The last time I saw him, he had stopped entirely. Up, around, big lump, thick skull, no harm. Where is he? Up the hall, left, games room. I believe I'll go render him my sympathy. Excuse me? Excused, she said, nodding, and she went away to listen to Dos Santos talk at Phil. Phil, of course, welcomed the addition. Neither looked up as I left. The games room was at the other end of the long hallway. As I approached, I heard a thunk, followed by a silence, followed by another thunk. I opened the door and looked inside. He was the only one there. His back was to me, but he heard the door open and turned quickly. He was wearing a long purple dressing gown and was balancing a knife in his right hand. There was a big wad of plastage on the back of his head. Good evening, Hassan. A tray of knives stood at his side, and he had set a target upon the opposite wall. Two blades were sticking into the target, one in the center and one about six inches off at nine o'clock. Good evening, he said slowly. Then, after thinking it over, he added, How are you? Oh, fine. I came to ask you that same question. How is your head? The pain is great, but it shall pass. I closed the door behind me. You must have been having quite a daydream last night. Yes. Mr. Dos Santos tells me I fought with ghosts. I do not remember. You weren't smoking what the fat Dr. Emmett would call cannabis sativa, that's for sure. No, carriage. I smoked a sturge fleur which had drunk human blood. I found it near the old place of Constantinople and dried its blossoms carefully. An old woman told me it would give me sight into the future. She lied. And the vampire blood incites the violence? Well, that's a new one to write down. By the way, you just called me Karaji. I wish you wouldn't. My name is Nomikos, Conrad Nomikos. Yes, Karaji. I was surprised to see you. I had thought you died long ago when your blaze boat broke up in the bay. Karaji did die then. You have not mentioned to anyone that I resemble him, have you? No, I do not make idle talk. That's a good habit. 
I crossed the room, selected a knife, weighed it, threw it, and laid it about ten inches to the right of center. Have you been working for Mr. Dos Santos very long? I asked him. For about the period of a month, he replied. He threw his knife. It struck five inches below the center. You are his bodyguard, eh? That's right. I also guard the blue one. Don says he fears an attempt on Mishtigo's life. Is there an actual threat, or is he just being safe? It's possible either way, Karaji, I do not know. He pays me only to guard. If I paid you more, would you tell me whom you've been hired to kill? I have only been hired to guard, but I would not tell you, even if it were otherwise. I didn't think so. Let's go get the knives. We crossed and drew the blades from the target. Now, if it happens to be me, which is possible, I offered, why don't we settle it right now? We are each holding two blades. The man who leaves this room will say that the other attacked him and that it was a matter of self-defense. There are no witnesses. We were both seen drunk or disorderly last night. No, Karaji. No what? No, it isn't me, or no, you don't want to do it that way. I could say, no, it is not you, but you would not know whether I spoke the truth or not. That is true. I could say, I do not want to do it that way. Is that true? I do not say. But to give you the satisfaction of an answer, what I will say is this. If I wish to kill you, I would not attempt it with a knife in my hand, nor would I box nor wrestle with you. Why is that? Because many years ago, when I was a boy, I worked at the resort of Kirch, attending at the tables of the wealthy vagans. You did not know me then. I had just come up from the places of Pamir. You and your friend the poet came to Kirch. I remember now, yes. Phil's parents had died that year. They were good friends of mine. And I was going to take Phil to the university. But there was a vagan who had taken his first woman from him, taken her to Kirch. Yes, the entertainer, I forget his name. He was Thrilpi Ligo, the Shedjadpa Boxer, and he looked like a mountain at the end of a great plain, high, immovable. He boxed with the Vagan Sestai, the leather strips with the ten sharpened studs that go all the way around the hand, open-handed. Yes, I remember. You had never boxed Shedjadpa before, but you fought with him for the girl. A great crowd came, of the Vagans and the Earth Girls, and I stood on a table to watch. After a minute, your head was all blood. He tried to make it run into your eyes, and you kept shaking your head. I was fifteen then, and had only killed three men myself, and I thought you were going to die because you had not even touched him. And then your right hand crossed to him like a thrown hammer, so fast. You struck him... In the center of that double bone, the blue ones have in their chests, and they are tougher there than we, and you crushed him like an egg. I could never have done that, I am sure, and that is why I fear your hands and your arms. Later I learned that you had also broken a spider back. No, Karaji, I would kill you from a distance. That was so long ago. I did not think anyone remembered. You won the girl. Yes. I forget her name. But you did not give her back to the poet. You kept her for yourself. That is why he probably hates you. Phil, that girl? I've even forgotten what she looked like. He has never forgotten. That is why I think he hates you. I can smell hate, sniff out its sources. You took away his first woman. I was there. It was her idea. And he grows old and you stay young. It is sad, Karaji, when a friend has reason to hate a friend. Yes, and I do not answer your questions. It is possible that you were hired to kill the Vagan. It is possible. Why? I said only that it is possible, not that it is fact. Then I will ask you one more question only and be done with it. What good would come of the Vagan's death? His book could be a very good thing in the way of vegan human relations. I do not know what good or bad would come of it, Karaji. Let us throw more knives. We did. I picked up the range and the balance and put two right in the center of the target. 
Then Hassan squeezed two in beside them, the last one giving out the sharp pain cry of metal as it vibrated against one of mine. I will tell you a thing, I said as we drew them again. I am head of the tour and responsible for the safety of its members. I, too, will guard the Vega. That will be a very good thing, Karaji. He needs protecting. I placed the knives back in the tray and moved to the door. We will be leaving at nine tomorrow morning, you know. I'll have a convoy of skimmers at the first field in the office compound. Yes. Good night, Karaji. And call me Conrad. Yes. He had a knife ready to throw at the target. I closed the door and moved back up the corridor. As I went, I heard another thunk, and it sounded much closer than the first one's head. It echoed all around me there in the hallway. As the six big skimmers fled across the oceans toward Egypt, I turned my thoughts first to Cos and Cassandra, and then dragged them back with some difficulty, and sent them on ahead to the land of sand, the Nile, mutated crocs, and some dead pharaohs, whom one of my most current projects was then disturbing. Death comes on swift wings to he who defiles, and so forth. And I thought then of humanity, roughly ensconced on the Titan way station, working in the Earth office, abasing itself on Toller and Bakab, getting by on Mars and doing so-so on Rilpa, Divba, Litan, and a couple dozen other worlds in the Vagan Combine. Then I thought about the Vagans. The blue-skinned folk with the funny names and the dimples like pockmarks had taken us in when we were cold, fed us when we were hungry. Yeah, they appreciated the fact that our Martian and Titanian colonies had suffered from nearly a century of sudden self-sufficiency after the three-day incident before a workable interstellar vehicle had been developed. Like the bowl weevil, Emmett tells me, we were just looking for a home because we'd used up the one we had. Did the Vagans reach for the insecticide? No, wise elder race that they are, they permitted us to settle among their worlds, to live and work in their land cities, their sea cities. For even a culture as advanced as the Vagans has some need for hand labor of the opposing thumb variety. Good domestic servants cannot be replaced by machines, nor can machine monitors, good gardeners, Salt sea fisher foe, subterranean and subsquian hazard workers, and ethnic entertainers of the alien variety. Admittedly, the presence of human dwelling places lowers the value of adjacent vegan properties, but then humans themselves compensate for it by contributing to the greater welfare. Which thought brought me back to Earth. The Vagans had never seen a completely devastated civilization before, so they were fascinated by our home planet, fascinated enough to tolerate our absentee government on Toller, enough to buy Earth tour tickets to view the ruins, even enough to buy property here and set up resorts. There is a certain kind of fascination to a planet that is run like a museum. What was it James Joyce said about Rome? Anyhow, dead earth still brings its living grandchildren a small but appreciable revenue every vegan fiscal year. That is why the office, Laurel, George, Phil, and all that. Sort of why me, even. Far below the ocean was a blue-gray rug being pulled out from beneath us. The dark continent replaced it. We raced on toward New Cairo. We sat down outside the city. There's no real airstrip. We just dropped all six skimmers down in an empty field we used as one, and we posted George as a guard. Old Cairo is still hot, but the people with whom one can do business live mainly in New Cairo, so things were pretty much okay for the tour. Mishtigo did want to see the mosque of Kait Bait in the City of the Dead, which had survived the three days. He settled, though, for me taking him up in my skimmer and flying in low, slow circles about it while he took photographs and did some peering. In the way of monuments, it was really the pyramids and Luxor, Karnak, and the Valley of Kings and the Valley of Queens that he wanted to see. It was well that we viewed the mosque from the air. Dark shapes scurried below us, stopping only to hurl rocks up toward the ship. 
What are they? asked Mishtigo. Hot ones, said I, sort of human. They vary in size, shape, and meanness. After circling for a time, he was satisfied, and we returned to the field. So, landing again beneath a glaring sun, we secured the final skimmer and disembarked, moving across equal proportions of sand and broken pavement, two temporary tour assistants, me, Mishtigo, Dos Santos, and Redwig, Ellen Hassan. Ellen had decided at the last minute to accompany her husband on the journey. There were fields of high, shiny sugar cane on both sides of the road. In a moment we had left them behind and were passing the low outbuildings of the city. The road widened. Here and there a palm tree cast some shade. Two great-eyed, brown-eyed children looked up as we passed. They had been watching a weary six-legged cow turn a great sakia wheel in much the same way as cows have always turned great sakia wheels hereabouts, only this one left more hoof prints. My area supervisor, Ramesses Smith, met us at the inn. He was big, his golden face tightly contained within a fine net of wrinkles, and he had the typical sad eyes, but his constant chuckle quickly offset them. We sat sipping beer in the main hall of the inn while we waited for George. Local guards had been sent to relieve him. The work is progressing well, Ramesses told me. Good, I said, somewhat pleased that no one had asked me what the work was. I wanted to surprise them. How is your wife and the children? They're fine, he stated. The new one? He has survived, and without defect, he said proudly. I sent my wife to Corsica until he was delivered. Here is his picture. I pretended to study it, making the expected appreciative noises. Then, uh, speaking of pictures, I said, Do you need any more equipment for the filming? No, we're well stocked. All goes well. When do you wish to view the work? Just as soon as we have something to eat. Are you a Muslim? interrupted Mishtigo. I am of the Coptic faith, replied Ramesses, not smiling. Oh, really? That was the monophysite heresy, was it not? We do not consider ourselves heretics, said Ramesses. I sat there wondering if we Greeks had done the right thing in unleashing logic onto a hapless world as Mishtigo launched into an amusing, to him, catalogue of Christian heresies. In a fit of spite at having to guide a tour, I recorded them all in the tour log. Later, Laurel told me that it was a fine and well-kept document, which just goes to show how nasty I must have felt at that moment. I even put in the bit about the accidental canonization of Buddha as a Saint Josephat in the 16th century. Finally, as Mishtigo sat there mocking us, I realized I would either have to cut him down or change the subject. Not being a Christian myself, his theological comedy of errors did not poke me in the religious plexus. It bothered me, though, that a member of another race had gone to such trouble doing research to make us look like a pack of idiots. Reconsidering the thing at this time, I know now that I was wrong. The success of the view tape I was making then, the word which Ramesses had referred to, bears out a more recent hypothesis of mine concerning the Vegans. They were so bloody bored with themselves, and we were so novel, that they seized upon our perennially popular problems and our classical problems, as well as the one we were currently presenting in the flesh. They engaged in massive speculation as to who really wrote Shakespeare's plays, whether or not Napoleon actually died on St. Helena, who were the first Europeans to set foot on North America, and if the books of Charles Fort indicated that Earth had been visited by an intelligent race unknown to them, and so on. High-caste vegan society just eats up our medieval theological debates, too. Funny. About your book, Srin Stigo, I interrupted. My use of the honorific stopped it. Yes, he answered. My impression, said I, is that you do not wish to discuss it at any length at this time. I respect this feeling, of course, but it places me in a slightly awkward position as head of this tour. We both knew I should have asked him in private, especially after his reply to Phil at the reception, 
but I was feeling cantankerous and wanted to let him know it, as well as to rechannel the talk. So, I'm curious, I said, whether it will be primarily a travelogue of the places we visit, or if you would like assistance in directing your attention to special local conditions of any sort, say, political or current cultural items. I am primarily interested in writing a descriptive travel book, he said, but I will appreciate your comments as we go along. I thought that was your job anyway. As it is, I do have a general awareness of earth traditions and current affairs, and I'm not very much concerned with them. Dos Santos, who was pacing and smoking as our meal was being prepared, stopped in mid-stride and said, Shrinstigo, what are your feelings toward the returnist movement? Are you sympathetic with our aims, or do you consider it a dead issue? Yes, he replied to the latter. I believe that when one is dead, one's only obligation then is to satisfy the consumer. I respect your aims, but I do not see how you can possibly hope to realize them. Why should your people give up the security they now possess to return to this place? Most of the members of the present generation have never even seen the earth except on tape, and you must admit that they are hardly the most encouraging documents. I disagree with you, said Dos Santos, and I find your attitude dreadfully patrician. That is as it should be, replied Mishtigo. George and the food arrived at about the same time. The waiters began serving the food. I should prefer to eat at a small table by myself, Dos Santos instructed the waiter. You are here because you asked to be here, I mentioned. He stopped in mid-flight and cast a furtive look at Redwig, who happened to be sitting at my right hand. I thought I detected an almost imperceptible movement of her head, first to the left, then to the right. Dos Santos composed his features around a small smile and bowed slightly. Forgive my Latin temperament, he observed. I should hardly expect to convert anyone to returnism in five minutes, and it has always been difficult for me to conceal my feelings. That is somewhat obvious. I'm hungry, I said. He seated himself across from us next to George. Behold the Sphinx, said Redwig, gesturing toward an etching on the far wall, whose speech alternates between long periods of silence and an occasional riddle. Old as time, highly respected, doubtless senile, she keeps her mouth shut and waits. For what? Who knows? Does your taste in art run to the monolithic, Srinstigo? Occasionally, he observed from my left. Dos Santos glanced once quickly over his shoulder, then back at Diane. He said nothing. I asked Redwig to pass me the salt, and she did. I really wanted to dump it on her to make her stay put so that I could study her at my leisure, but I used it on the potatoes instead. Behold the Sphinx indeed. High sun, short shadows, hot, that's how it was. I didn't want any sand cars or skimmers spoiling the scene, so I made everybody hike it. It wasn't that far, and I took a slightly roundabout way in order to achieve the calculated effect. We walked a crooked mile, climbing some, dipping some. I confiscated George's butterfly net so as to prevent any annoying pauses as we passed by the several clover fields which lay along our route. Walking backward through time, that's how it was. With bright birds flashing by, clear, clear, and a couple camels appearing against the far horizon whenever we topped a small rise. Camel outlines really done up in charcoal, but that's enough. Who cares about a camel's expressions? Not even other camels, not really. Sickening beasts. A short, swarthy woman trudged past us with a tall jar on her head. Mishtigo remarked on this fact to his pocket secretary. I nodded to the woman and spoke a greeting. The woman returned the greeting, but did not nod back, naturally. Ellen, moist already, kept fanning herself with a big green feather triangle. Red wig walked tall, tiny beads of perspiration seasoning her upper lip, eyes hidden behind sunshades which had darkened themselves as much as they could. Finally we were there. 
we climbed the last low hill. Behold, said Ramesses. Madre de Dios, said Dos Santos. Hassan grunted. Redwig turned toward me quickly, then turned away. I couldn't read her expression because of the shades. Ellen kept fanning herself. What are they doing? asked Mishtigo. It was the first time I had seen him genuinely surprised. Why, they're dismantling the great pyramid of Cheops, I said. After a time, Redwig asked it. Why? Well, now, I told her, they're kind of short on building materials hereabouts, the stuff from old Cairo being radioactive, so they're obtaining it by knocking apart that old piece of solid geometry out there. They are desecrating a monument to the past glories of the human race, she explained. Nothing is cheaper than past glories, I observed. It's the present that we're concerned with, and they need building materials now. For how long has this been going on? asked Mishtigo, his words rushing together. It was three days ago, said Ramesses, that we began the dismantling. What gives you the right to do a thing like that? It was authorized by the Earth Office Department of Arts, Monuments, and Archives, Srin. Mishtigo turned to me, his amber eyes glowing strangely. You, he said. I, I acknowledged, am commissioner thereof, that is correct. Why has no one else heard of this action of yours? Because very few people come here any more, I explained, which is another good reason for dismantling the thing. It doesn't even get looked at much these days. I do have the authority to authorize such actions. I came here from another world to see it. Well, take a quick look, then, I told him. It's going away fast. He turned and stared. You obviously have no conception of its intrinsic value. Or if you do, on the contrary, I know exactly what it's worth. And those unfortunate creatures you have working down there, his voice rose as he studied the scene, under the hot rays of your ugly sun, they're laboring under the most primitive conditions. Haven't you ever heard of moving machinery? Of course, it's expensive. And your foremen are carrying whips. How can you treat your own people that way? It's perverse. All those men volunteered for the job at token salaries, and actors' equity won't let us use the whips, even though the men argued in favor of it. All we're allowed to do is crack them in the air near them. Actors' equity? Their union. Want to see some machinery? I gestured. Look up on that hill. He did. What's going on there? We're recording it on view tape. To what end? When we're finished, we're going to edit it down to viewable length and run it backwards. The building of the Great Pyramid, we're going to call it. Should be good for some laughs, also money. Your historians have been conjecturing as to exactly how we put it together ever since the day they heard about it. This may make them somewhat happier. I decided a BFMI operation would go over best. BFMI? Brute force and massive ignorance. Look at them jamming it up, will you? Following the camera, lying down and standing up quickly when it swings in their direction. They'll be collapsing all over the place in the finished product. But then, this is the first Earth film in years. They're real excited. Dos Santos regarded Redwig's bared teeth and the bunched muscles beneath her eyes. He glared at the pyramid. You are a madman, he announced. No, I replied, the absence of a monument can, in its own way, be something of a monument also. A monument to Conrad Nomikos, he stated. No, said Redwig then, there is destructive art as surely as there is creative art. I think he may be attempting such a thing. He is playing Caligula. Perhaps I can even see why. Thank you. You are not welcome. I said perhaps. An artist does it with love. Love is a negative form of hatred. I am dying, Egypt, dying, said Ellen. Mishtigo laughed. You are tougher than I thought, Nomikos, he observed, but you are not indispensable. Try having a civil servant fired, especially me. 
It might be easier than you think. We'll see. We may. We turned again toward the great ninety percent pyramid of Cheops Khufu. Mishtigo began taking notes once more. I'd rather you viewed it from here for now, I said. Our presence would waste valuable footage. We're anachronisms. We can go down during coffee break. I agree, said Mishtigo, and I am certain I know an anachronism when I see one, but I have seen all that I care to here. Let us go back to the inn. I wish to talk with the locals. After a moment, I'll see Sakara ahead of schedule then, he mused. You haven't begun dismantling all the monuments of Luxor, Karnak, and the Valley of Kings yet, have you? Not yet, no. Good. Then we'll visit them ahead of time. Then let's not stand here, said Ellen. This heat is beastly. So we return. Do you really mean everything you say? asked Diane as we walked back. In my fashion. How do you think of such things? In Greek, of course. Then I translate them into English. I'm real good at it. Who are you? Ozymandias. Look at my work, she mighty, and despair. I'm not mighty. I wonder, I said, and I left the part of her face that I could see wearing a rather funny expression as we walked along. Let me tell you of the boa dial, said I. Our felucca moves slowly along that dazzling water path that burns its way before the great gray colonnades of Luxor. Mishtigo's back was to me. He was staring at those columns, dictating an occasional impression. Where will we put ashore? he asked me. About a mile further up ahead. Perhaps I had better tell you about the boa dial. I know what a boa dial is. I told you that I had studied your world. Uh-huh. Reading about them is one thing. I have also seen boa dials. There are four in the earth garden on Tala. And seeing them in a tank is another thing. Between yourself and Hassan, we are a veritable floating arsenal. I count three grenades on your belt, four on his. You can't use a grenade if one is on top of you, not without defeating the purpose of self-defense, that is. If it's any further away, you can't hit it with one. They move too fast. He finally turned. What do you use? I reached inside my galabium, having gone native, and withdrew the weapon I always try to have on hand when I come this way. He examined it. Name it. It's a machine pistol. Fires metacyanide slugs. One ton impact when a round strikes. Not real accurate, but that's not necessary. It's patterned after a twentieth-century handgun called a Schmeisser. It's rather unwieldy. Will it stop a boa dial? If you're lucky. I have a couple more in one of the cases. Want one? No, thank you, he paused. But you can tell me more about the boa dial. I really only glanced at them that day, and they were pretty well submerged. Well, heads something like a crocs, only bigger round forty feet long, able to roll itself into a big beach ball with teeth, fast on land or in water, and a hell of a lot of little legs on each side. How many legs? he interrupted. Hmm, I stopped. To tell you the absolute truth, I've never counted. Just a second. Hey, George, I called out to where Earth's eminent chief biologist lay dozing in the shade of the sail. How many legs on a boa dial? Huh? His head turned. I said, how many legs on a boa dial? He rose to his feet, stretched slightly, and came up beside us. Boa dials, he mused, poking a finger into his ear and leafing through the files inside. They're definitely of the class Reptilia, of that much we're certain. Whether they're of the order Crocodilia, suborder of their own, or whether they're of the order Squamata, suborder Lacertilia, family Neopoda, as a colleague of mine on Teller half-seriously insists, we are not certain. To me, they are somewhat reminiscent of pre-three-day photo-reproductions of artists' conceptions of the Mesozoic Phytosaurus, with, of course, the supernumerary legs and the constrictive ability. So I favor the order Crocodilia myself. He leaned on the rail and stared out across the shimmering water. 
I saw then that he wasn't about to say anything else. So, so how many legs on one? I asked again. Eh, legs? I never counted them. If we're lucky, we might get a chance to, though. There are lots around here. The young one I had didn't last too long. What happened to it? asked Mishtigo. My Megadonna Platte ate it. Megadonna Platte? Sort of like a duck-billed platypus with teeth, I explained, and about ten feet high. Picture that. So far as we know, they've only been seen about three or four times. Australian. We got ours through a fortunate accident. Probably won't last as a species, the way boadiles will, I mean. They're oviparous mammals, and their eggs are too large for a hungry world to permit the continuance of the species, if it is a true species. Maybe they're just isolated sports. Perhaps, said George, nodding wisely, and then again, perhaps not. Mishigo turned away, shaking his head. Hassan had partly unpacked his robot golem, Rolem, and was fooling with its controls. Ellen had finally given up on simicoloring and was lying in the sun, getting burnt all over. Redwig and Dos Santos were plotting something at the other end of the vessel. Those two never just meet. They always have assignations. Our felucca moved slowly along the dazzling water path that burns its way before the great gray colonnades of Luxor, and I decided it was time to head it in toward the shore and see what was new among the tombs and ruined temples. The next six days were rather uneventful and somewhat unforgettable, extremely active and sort of ugly beautiful, in the way that a flower can be, with its petals all intact and a dark and runny rot spot in the center. Here's how. Mishtigo must have interviewed every stone ram along the four miles of the way to Karnak. Both in the blaze of day and by torchlight, we navigated the ruins, disturbing bats, rats, snakes, and insects, listening to the vegan's monotonous note-taking in his monotonous language. At night we camped on the sands, setting up a 200-meter electrical warning perimeter and posting two guards. The Bobadile is cold-blooded. The nights were chill, so there was relatively little danger from without. Huge campfires lighted the nights, all about the areas we chose, because the vegan wanted things primitive, or purposes of atmosphere, I guess. Our skimmers were further south. We had flown them to a place I knew of and left them there under office guard, renting the felucca for our trip, which paralleled the king god's journey from Karnak to Luxor. Mishtigo had wanted it that way. Nights, Hassan would either practice with the Asagai he had bartered from a big Nubian, or he would strip to the waist and wrestle for hours with his tireless golem. A worthy opponent was the golem. Hassan had it programmed at twice the statistically average strength of a man and had upped its reflex time by 50%. Its memory contained hundreds of wrestling holes and its governor theoretically prevented it from killing or maiming its opponent, all through a series of chemelectrical afferent nerve analogues which permitted it to gauge to an ounce the amount of pressure necessary to snap a bone or tear a tendon. Roland was about five feet six inches in height, and weighed around 250 pounds. Manufactured on Baycab, he was quite expensive, was dough-colored and caricature-featured, and his brains were located somewhere below where his navel would be, if golems had navels, to protect his think-stuff from Greco-Roman shocks. Even as it is, accidents can happen. People have been killed by the things when something goes amok in the brains or some afference or just because the people themselves slipped or tried to jerk away, supplying the necessary extra ounces. I'd had one once for almost a year programmed for boxing. I used to spend fifteen minutes or so with it every afternoon. Got to thinking of it as a person almost. Then one day it fouled me, and I pounded it for over an hour and finally knocked its head off. The thing kept right on boxing, and I stopped thinking of it as a friendly sparring partner right then. It's a weird feeling, boxing with a headless golem, you know. Sort of like waking from a pleasant dream and finding a nightmare crouched at the foot of your bed. 
It doesn't really see its opponent with those eye things it has. It's all sheathed about with piezoelectric radar mesentery, and it watches from all its surfaces. Still, the death of an illusion tends to disconcert. I turned mine off and never turned it back on again. Sold it to a camel trader for a pretty good price. Don't know if he ever got the head back on, but he was a Turk, so who cares? Anyway, Hassan would tangle with Rolam, both of them gleaming in the firelight, and we'd all sit on blankets and watch, and bats would swoop low occasionally like big, fast ashes, and emaciated clouds would cover the moon, veil-like, and then move on again. It was that way on the third night when I went mad. I remember it only in the way you remember a passing countryside you might have seen through, a late summer evening storm, as a series of isolated, lightning-filled still-shots. Having spoken with Cassandra for the better part of an hour, I concluded the transmission with a promise to cop a skimmer the following afternoon and spend the next night on cause. I recall our last words. Take care, Constantine. I have been dreaming bad dreams. Bosh, Cassandra. Good night. And who knows but that her dreams might have been the result of a temporal shock wave moving backwards from a 9.6 Richter reading. A certain cruel gleam filling his eyes, Dos Santos applauded as Hassan hurled Rollum to the ground with a thunderous crash. That particular earthshaker continued, however, long after the golem had climbed back to his feet and gotten into another crouch, his arms doing serpent things in the Arab's direction. The ground shook and shook. What power! Still do I feel it, cried Dos Santos. Olé! It is a seismic disturbance, said George, even though I'm not a geologist. Earthquake, yelled his wife, dropping an unpasteurized date she had been feeding the Stigo. There was no reason to run, no place to run to. There was nothing nearby that could fall on us. The ground was level and pretty barren. So we just sat there and were thrown about, even knocked flat a few times. The fires did amazing things. Roland's time was up, and he went stiff then, and Hassan came and sat with George and me. The tremors lasted the better part of an hour, and they came again, more weakly, many times during that night. After the first bad shock had run its course, we got in touch with the port. The instruments there showed that the center of the thing lay a good distance to the north of us. A bad distance, really, in the Mediterranean. The Aegean, to be more specific. I felt sick, and suddenly I was. I tried to put through a call to Coz. Nothing. My Cassandra, my lovely lady, my princess, where was she? For two hours I tried to find out. Then the port called me. It was Laurel's voice, not just another lob watch operator's. Um... Conrad, I don't know how to tell you exactly what happened. Just talk, I said, and stop when you're finished. An observed satellite passed your way about twelve minutes ago. He crackled across the bands. Several of the Aegean islands were no longer present in the pictures it transmitted. No, I said. I'm afraid that Kaz was one of them. No, I said. I'm sorry, he told me, but that is the way it shows. I don't know what else to say. That's enough, I said. That's all, that's it. Goodbye. We'll talk more later. No, I guess. No. Wait, Conrad. I went mad. Bats, shaken loose from the night, were swooping about me. I struck out with my right hand and killed one as it flashed in my direction. I waited a few seconds and killed another. Then I picked up a big rock with both hands and was about to smash the radio when George laid a hand on my shoulder, and I dropped the rock and knocked his hand away and backhanded him across the mouth. I don't know what became of him then, but as I stooped to raise the rock once more, I heard the sound of footfalls behind me. I dropped to one knee and pivoted on it, scooping up a handful of sand to throw in someone's eyes. They were all of them there, Mishtigo and Redwig and Dos Santos. Ramesses, Ellen, three local civil servants, and Hassan, approaching in a group. Someone yelled scatter when they saw my face, and they fanned out. Then they were everyone I'd ever hated. I could feel it. 
I saw other faces, heard other voices. Everyone I'd ever known, hated, wanted to smash, head smashed, stood there resurrected before the fire, and only the whites of their teeth were showing through the shadows that crossed over their faces as they smiled and came toward me, bearing various dooms in their hands and soft, persuasive words on their lips. So I threw the sand at the foremost and rushed it. My uppercut knocked him over backward, then two Egyptians were on me from both sides. I shook them loose, and in the corner of my colder eye saw a great Arab with something like a black avocado in his hand. He was swinging it toward my head, so I dropped down. He had been coming in my direction, and I managed to give his stomach more than just a shove, so he sat down suddenly. Then the two men I had thrown away were back on me again. A woman was screaming somewhere in the distance, but I couldn't see any women. I tore my right arm free and batted someone with it, and the man went down, and another took his place. From straight ahead, a blue man threw a rock which struck me on the shoulder and only made me madder. I raised a kicking body into the air and threw it against another, then I hit someone with my fist. I shook myself. My galabia was torn and dirty, so I tore it the rest of the way off and threw it away. I looked around. They had stopped coming at me, and it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair that they should stop then when I wanted so badly to see things breaking. So I raised up the man at my feet and slapped him down again. Then I raised him up again, and someone yelled, Hey, Karagiosis, and began calling me names in broken Greek. I let the man fall back to the ground and turned. There before the fire there were two of them, one tall and bearded, the other squat and heavy and hairless and molded out of a mixture of putty and earth. My friend says he will break you, Greek, called out the tall one, as he did something to the other's back. I moved toward them, and the man of putty and mud sprang at me. He tripped me, but I came up again fast and caught him beneath the armpits and threw him off to the side. But he recovered his footing as rapidly as I had, and he came back again and caught me behind the neck with one hand. I did the same to him, also seizing his elbow, and we locked together there, and he was strong. Because he was strong, I kept changing holes, testing his strength. He was also fast, accommodating every move I made almost as soon as I thought of it. I threw my arms up between his, hard, and stepped back on my reinforced leg. Freed for a moment, we orbited each other, seeking another opening. I kept my arms low, and I was bent well forward because of his shortness. For a moment my arms were too near my sides, and he moved in faster than I had seen anyone move before, ever, and he caught me in a body lock that squeezed the big flat flowers of moisture out of my pores and caused a great pain in my sides. Still his arms tightened, and I knew that it would not be long before he broke me unless I could break his hold. I doubled my hands into fists and got them against his belly and pushed. His grip tightened. I stepped backward and heaved forward with both arms. My hands went up higher between us, and I got my right fist against the palm of my left hand and began to push them together and lift with my arms. My head swam as my arms came up higher and my kidneys were on fire. Then I tightened all the muscles in my back and my shoulders and felt the strength flow down through my arms and come together in my hands, and I smashed them up toward the sky, and his chin happened to be in the way, but it didn't stop them. My arms shot up over my head, and he fell backward. It should have broken a man's neck the force of that big snap that came when my hand struck his chin and he got a look at his heels from the backside. But he sprang up immediately, and I knew then that he was no mortal wrestler, but one of those creatures born and not of woman. Rather, I knew he had been torn, Antaeus-like, from the womb of the earth herself. I brought my hands down hard on his shoulders, and he dropped to his knees. I caught him across the throat then and stepped to his right side and got my left knee under the lower part of his back. I leaned forward, bearing down on his thighs and shoulders, trying to break it. But I couldn't. He just kept bending until his head touched the ground, and I couldn't push him any further. No one's back bends like that and doesn't snap, but his did. 
Then I heaved up with my knee and let go, and he was on me again, that fast. So I tried to strangle him. My arms were much longer than his. I caught him by the throat with both hands, my thumbs pressing hard against what should have been his windpipe. He got his arms across mine, though, at the elbows and inside, and began to pull downward and out. I kept squeezing, waiting for his face to darken, his eyes to bug out. My elbows began to bend under his downward pressure. Then his arms came across and caught me by the throat. And we stood there and choked one another, only he wouldn't be strangled. His thumbs were like two spikes pressing into the muscles in my neck. I felt my face flush. My temples began to throb. Off in the distance I heard a scream, Stop it, Hassan! It's not supposed to do that! It sounded like Redwig's voice. Anyhow, that's the name that came into my head, Redwig, which meant that Donald Dos Santos was somewhere nearby, and she had said Hassan, a name written on another picture that came suddenly clear, which meant that I was Conrad, and that I was in Egypt, and that the expressionless face swimming before me was therefore that of the golem wrestler, Roland, a creature which could be set for five times the strength of a human being, and probably was so set, a creature which could be given the reflexes of an adrenalized cat, and doubtless had them in full operation. Only a golem wasn't supposed to kill except by accident, and Roland was trying to kill me, which meant that his governor wasn't functioning. I released my choke, seeing that it wasn't working, and I placed the palm of my left hand beneath his right elbow. Then I reached across the top of his arms and seized his right wrist with my other hand, and I crouched as low as I could and pushed up on his elbow and pulled up on his wrist. As he went off balance to his left and the grip was broken, I kept hold of the wrist, twisting it so that the elbow was exposed upwards. I stiffened my left hand, snapped it up beside my ear, and brought it down across the elbow joint. Nothing. There was no snapping sound. The arm just gave way, bending backward at an unnatural angle. I released the wrist, and he fell to one knee. Then he stood again, quickly, and as he did so, the arm straightened itself and then bent forward again into a normal position. If I knew Hassan's mind, then Roland's timer had been set for maximum, two hours, which was a pretty long time, all things considered. But this time around I knew who I was and what I was doing. Also I knew what went into the structuring of a golem. This one was a wrestling golem. Therefore it could not box. I cast a quick look back over my shoulder to the place where I had been standing when the whole thing had started, over by the radio tent. It was about fifty feet away. He almost had me then. Just during that split second, while I had turned my attention to the rear, he had reached out and seized me behind the neck with one hand and caught me beneath the chin with the other. He might have broken my neck had he been able to follow through, but there came another trembler at that moment, a severe one which cast us both to the ground, and I broke this hold also. I scrambled to my feet seconds later, and the earth was still shaking. Rolem was up too, though, and facing me again. We were like two drunken sailors fighting on a storm-tossed ship. He came at me, and I gave ground. I hit him with a left jab, and while he snatched at my arm, I punched him in the stomach. Then I backed off. He came on again, and I kept throwing punches. Boxing was to him what the fourth dimension is to me. He just couldn't see it. He kept advancing, shaking off my punches, and I kept retreating in the direction of the radio tent, and the ground kept shaking, and somewhere a woman was screaming, and I heard a shouted ole as I landed a right below the belt, hoping to jar his brains a bit. Then we were there, and I saw what I wanted, the big rock I'd intended to use on the radio. I fainted with my left, then seized him, shoulder and thigh, and raised him high up over my head. I bent backwards, tightened up my muscles, and hurled him down upon the rock. It caught him in the stomach. He began to rise again, but more slowly than he had before, and I kicked him in the stomach three times with my great reinforced right boot, 
and I watched him sink back down. A strange whirring sound had begun in his midsection. The ground shook again, Rolam crumpled, stretched out, and the only sign of motion was in the fingers of his left hand. They kept clenching and unclenching, reminding me oddly of Hassan's hands that night back at the Honefor. Then I turned slowly, and they were all standing there, Mishtigo and Ellen and Dos Santos with a puffed-up cheek, Redwig, George, Ramesses, and Hassan, and the three plastaged Egyptians. I took a step toward them then, and they began to fan out, their faces filling with fear. But I shook my head. No, I'm all right now, I said. But leave me alone. I'm going down to the river to bathe. I took seven steps, and then someone must have pulled out the plug, because I gurgled, everything swirled, and the world ran away down the drain. The days that followed were ashes, and the nights were iron. The spirit that had been torn from my soul was buried deeper than any mummy that lay moldering beneath those sands. It is said that the dead forget the dead in the house of Hades, Cassandra, but I hoped it was not so. I went through the motions of conducting a tour, and Laurel suggested that I appoint someone else to finish it out and take a leave of absence myself. I couldn't. What would I do then, sit and brood in some old place, cadging drinks from unwary travelers? No, some kind of motion is always essential at such times. Its forms eventually generate a content for their empty insides. So I went on with the tour and turned my attention to the small mysteries it contained. I took Rolam apart and studied his governor. It had been broken, of course, which meant that either I had done it during the early stages of our conflict, or Hassan had done it as he had souped him up to take the fight out of me. If Hassan had done it, then he did not just want me beaten, but dead. If such was the case, then the question was, why? I wondered whether his employer knew that I had once been Caragiosis. If he did, though, why should he want to kill the founder and first secretary of his own party? the man who had sworn that he would not see the earth sold out from under him and turned into a sporting house by a pack of blue aliens, not see it without fighting anyhow, and had organized about himself a cabal which systematically lowered the value of all vegan-owned Terran property to zero, and even went so far as to raise the Talarite's lush realty office on Madagascar, the man whose ideals he allegedly espoused, though they were currently being channeled into more peaceful, legalistic modes of property defense. Why should he want that man dead? Therefore, he had either sold out the party, or he didn't know who I was, and it had some other end in mind when he'd instructed Hassan to kill me. Or else Hassan was acting under someone else's orders. But who else could there be? And again, why? I had no answer. I decided I wanted one. The first condolence had been George's. I'm sorry, Conrad, he'd said, looking past my elbow and then down at the sand and then glancing up quickly into my face. Saying human things upset him and made him want to go away, I could tell. It is doubtful that the parade consisting of Ellen and myself, which had passed that previous summer, had occupied much of his attention. His passion stopped outside the biological laboratory. I remember when he'd dissected the last dog on earth. After four years of scratching his ears and combing the fleas from his tail and listening to him bark, George had called Ralph to him one day. Ralph had trotted in, bringing along the old dish rag they'd always played at tug-of-war with, and George had tugged him real close and gave him a hypo and then opened him up. He'd wanted to get him while he was still in his prime, still has the skeleton mounted in his lab. He'd also wanted to raise his kids, Mark and Dorothy and Jim, in Skinner boxes, but Ellen had put her foot down each time, like bang, 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 in post-pregnancy seizures of motherhood, which had lasted for at least a month, which had been just long enough to spoil the initial stimuli balances George had wanted to establish so I couldn't really see him as having much desire to take my measure for a wooden sleeping bag of the underground sort. If he wanted me dead, it would probably have been subtle, fast, and exotic. 
with something like divban rabbit venom. But no, he didn't care that much, I was sure. Ellen herself, while she is capable of intense feelings, is ever the faulty wind-up doll. Something always goes strong before she can take action on her feelings, and by the next day she feels as strongly about something else. She choked me to death back at the port, and as far as she was concerned, that affair was a dead issue. Her condolence went something like this. Conrad, you just don't know how sorry I am. Really. Even though I never met her, I know how you must feel. And her voice went up and down the scale, and I knew she believed what she was saying, and I thanked her too. Hassan, though, came up beside me while I was standing there, staring out over the suddenly swollen and muddy Nile. We stood together for a time, and then he said, Your woman is gone, and your heart is heavy. Words will not lighten the weight, and what is written is written. But let it also be put down that I grieve with you. And then we stood there a while longer, and he walked away. I didn't wonder about him. He was the one person who could be dismissed, even though his hand had set the machine in motion. He never held grudges. He never killed for free. He had no personal motive to kill me. That his condolences were genuine, I was certain. Killing me would have nothing to do with the sincerity of his feelings in a matter like this. A true professional must respect some sort of boundary between self and task. Mistigo said no words of sympathy. It would have been alien to his nature. Among the vegans, death is a time of rejoicing. On a spiritual level, it means sago, completion, the fragmentation of the psyche into little pleasure-sensing pinpricks which are scattered all over the place to participate in the great universal orgasm. And on the material plane, it is represented by Ansakundabad. The ceremonial auditing of most of the deceased personal possessions, the reading of his distribution desire and the division of his wealth, accompanied by much feasting, singing, and drinking. Dos Santos said to me, It is a sad thing that has happened to you, my friend. It is to lose the blood of one's own veins, to lose one's woman. Your sorrow is great, and you cannot be comforted. It is like a smoldering fire that will not die out, and it is a sad and terrible thing. Death is cruel, and it is dark, he finished, and his eyes were moist. For be it gypsy, Jew, Moor, or what have you, a victim is a victim to a Spaniard, a thing to be appreciated on one of those mystically obscure levels which I lack. Then Redwig came up beside me and said, Dreadful. Sorry. Nothing else to say, to do, but sorry. I nodded. Thanks. And there is something I must ask you. Not now, though. Later. Sure, I said. And I returned to watching the river after they left, and I thought about those last two. They had sounded as sorry as everyone else, but it seemed they had to be mixed up in the golem business somehow. I was sure, though, that it had been Diane who had screamed while Rollam had been choking me, screamed for Hassan to stop him. That left Don, and I had by then come to entertain strong doubts that he ever did anything without first consulting her, which left nobody. And there was no real motive apparent, and it could all have been an accident. But, but I had this feeling that someone wanted to kill me. I knew that Hassan was not about taking two jobs at the same time and for different employers if there was no conflict of interest, and this made me happy. It gave me a purpose, something to do. There's really nothing quite like someone's wanting you dead to make you want to go on living. I would find him, find out why, and stop it. Death's second pass was fast and as much as I would have liked to have pinned it on human agent, I couldn't. It was just one of those diddles of dumb destiny which sometimes come like uninvited guests at dinner time. Its finale, however, left me quite puzzled and gave me some new, confusing thoughts to think. It came like this. Down by the river, that great, fertile flutter, that eraser of boundaries and father of plain geometry, sat the vegan making sketches of the opposite bank. I suppose, had he been on that bank, he would have been sketching the one he sat upon, but this is cynical conjecture. What bothered me was the fact that he had come off alone, down to this warm, marshy spot, 
had not told anyone where he was going, and had brought along nothing more lethal than a number two pencil. It happened. An old mottled log, which had been drifting in near the shore, suddenly ceased being an old mottled log. A long serpentine back end whipped skyward, a bushel full of teeth appeared at the other end, and lots of little legs found solid ground and started acting like wheels. I yelled and snatched at my belt. Mishtigo dropped his pad and bolted. It was on him, though, and I couldn't fire them. So I made a dash, but by the time I got there, it had two coils around him, and he was about two shades bluer, and those teeth were closing in on him. Now there is one way to make any kind of constrictor loosen up, at least for a moment. I grabbed for its high head, which had slowed down just a bit as it contemplated its breakfast, and I managed to catch my fingers under the scaly ridges at the sides of that head. I dug my thumbs into its eyes as hard as I could. Then a spastic giant hit me with a gray-green whip. I picked myself up, and I was about ten feet from where I had been standing. Mishtigo had been thrown further up the bank. He was recovering his feet just as it attacked again. Only it attacked me, not him. It reared up about eight feet off the ground and toppled toward me. I threw myself to the side, and that big flat head missed me by inches, its impact showering me with dirt and pebbles. I rolled further and started to rise, but the tail came around and knocked me down again. Then I scrambled backward, but was too late to avoid the coil it threw. It caught me low around the hips, and I fell again. Then a pair of blue arms wrapped themselves around the body above the coil, and I couldn't hold on for more than a few seconds. Then we were both tied up in knots. I struggled, but how do you fight a thick, slippery, armored cable with messes of little legs that keep tearing at you? My right arm was pinned to my side by then, and I couldn't reach far enough with my left hand to do any more gouging. The coils tightened. The head moved toward me, and I tore at the body. I beat at it, and I clawed it, and I finally managed to tear my right arm free, giving up some skin in the process. I blocked with my right hand as the head descended. My hand came up beneath the lower jaw, caught it, and held it there, keeping the head back. The big coil tightened around my waist, more powerful than even the grip of the golem had been. Then it shook its head sideways, away from my hand, and the head came down, and the jaws opened wide. Mishtigo's struggles must have irritated it and slowed it some, giving me time for my last defense. I thrust my hands up into its mouth and held its jaws apart. The roof of its mouth was slimy, and my palm began to slip along it slowly. I pressed down harder on the lower jaw as hard as I could. The mouth opened another half foot and seemed locked there. It tried to draw back then to make me let go, but its coils bound us too tightly to give it the necessary footage. So it unwound a little, straightening some and pulling back its head. I gained a kneeling position. Mishtigo was in a sagging crouch about six feet away from me. My right hand slipped some more, almost to the point where I would lose all my leverage. Then I heard a great cry. The shudder came almost simultaneously. I snapped my arms free as I felt the thing's strength wane for a second. There was a dreadful clicking of teeth and a final constriction. I blacked out for a moment. Then I was fighting free, untangling myself. The smooth wooden shaft which had skewered the boa dial was taking the life from it, and its movement suddenly became spasmodic rather than aggressive. I was knocked down twice by all its lashing about, but I got Mishtigo free, and we got about fifty feet away and watched it die. This took quite a while. Hassan stood there expressionless. The Asagai he had spent so much time practicing with had done its work. When George dissected the creature later, we learned that the shaft had lodged within two inches of its heart, severing the big artery. By the way, it had two dozen legs evenly distributed on either side, as might be expected. Dos Santos stood beside Hassan, and Diane stood beside Dos Santos. Everyone else from the camp was there, too. Good show, I said. Fine shot, thanks. It was nothing, Hassan replied. It was nothing, he had said. Nothing but the death blow to my motion that he had gimmicked the golem. If Hassan had tried to kill me then, why should he have saved me from the boa dial? 
unless what he had said back at the port was the overriding truth, that he had been hired to protect the Vagan. If that was his main job and killing me was only secondary, then he would have had to save me as a by-product of keeping Mishtigo alive. But then, oh hell, forget it. I threw a stone as far as I could and another. Our skimmer would be flown up to our campsite the following day, and we would take off for Athens, stopping only to drop Ramesses and three others at New Cairo. I was glad I was leaving Egypt, with its must and its dust and its dead half-animal deities. I was already sick of the place. Then Phil's call came through from the port, and Ramesses called me into the radio tent. Yeah, said I to the radio. Conrad, this is Phil. I've just written her elegy, and I should like to read it to you. Even though I never met her, I've heard you speak of her, and I've seen her picture, so I think I've done a pretty good job. Please, Phil, I'm not interested in the consolations of poetry right now. Some other time, perhaps. This is not one of the fill-in sort. I know that you do not like those, and in a way I do not blame you. My hand hovered above the cut-off toggle, paused, reached for one of Ramsey's cigarettes instead. Sure, go ahead, I'm listening. And he did, and it wasn't a bad job either. I don't remember much of it. I just remember those crisp, clear words coming from halfway around the world, and me standing there, bruised inside and out, hearing them. He described the virtues of the nymph whom Poseidon had reached for but lost to his brother Hades. He called for a general mourning among the elements, and as he spoke my mind went time-traveling back to those two happy months on Kaz, and everything since then was erased and we were back aboard the vanity, sailing toward our picnic islet with its semi-sacred grove, and we were bathing together and lying together in the sun, holding hands and not saying anything, just feeling the sun fall, like a waterfall bright and dry and gentle, come down upon our pink and naked spirits, there on the endless beach that circled and circled the tiny realm, and always came back to us. And he was finished, and cleared his throat a couple times, and my isle sank from sight, carrying that one part of me along with it, because that was the time that was. Thanks, Phil, I said. That was very nice. I'm pleased that you find it appropriate, he said. Then, I am flying to Athens this afternoon. I should like to join you on this leg of your tour, if it is all right with you. Surely, I replied. May I ask why, though? I have decided that I want to see Greece once more. Since you are going to be there, it might make it seem a little more like the old days. I'd like to take a last look at some of the old places. You make it sound rather final. Well, I've pushed the SS series about as far as it will go. I fancy I can feel the mainspring running down now. Maybe it will take a few more windings, and maybe it won't. At any rate, I want to see Greece again, and I feel as if this is my last chance. I'm sure you're wrong, but... We'll all be dining at the garden altar tomorrow evening around eight. Fine, I'll see you then. Check. Goodbye, Conrad. Goodbye. I went and showered and rubbed me with liniment, and I put on clean clothing. I was still sore in several places, but at least I felt clean. Then I went and found the vegan, who had just finished doing the same thing, and I fixed him with my baleful glare. Correct me if I'm wrong, I stated, but one of the reasons you wanted me to run this show is because I have a high survival potential. Is that correct? That is correct. Thus far I have done my best to see that it did not remain potential, but that it was actively employed to promote the general welfare. Was that what you were doing when you attacked the entire group single-handed? I started to reach for his throat, thought better of it, dropped my hand. I was rewarded by a flicker of fear that widened his eyes and twitched the corners of his mouth. He took a step backward. I'll overlook that, I told him. I am here only to take you where you want to go and to see that you come back with a whole skin. You caused me a small problem this morning by making yourself available as Boadile bait. Be warned, therefore, that one does not go to hell to light a cigarette. Whenever you wish to go off by yourself, Check first to see whether you are in safe country. His gaze faltered. He looked away. If you are not, I continued, then take along an armed escort, since you refuse to carry weapons yourself. That is all I have to say. 
If you do not wish to cooperate, tell me now, and I'll quit and get you another guide. Laurel has already suggested that I do this anyway. So what's the word? I asked. Did Laurel really say that? Yes. How extraordinary. Well, certainly, yes, I shall comply with your request. I see that it is a prudent one. Great. You said you wanted to visit the Valley of Queens again this afternoon. Ramses will take you. I don't feel like doing it myself. We're pulling out tomorrow morning at ten. Be ready. I walked away then, waiting for him to say something, just one word even. He didn't. Fortunately, both for the survivors and for the generations as yet unborn, Scotland had not been hard hit during the three days. I fetched a bucket of ice from the freeze unit and a bottle of soda from our mess tent. I turned down the cooling coil beside my bunk, opened a fifth from out of my private stock, and spent the rest of the afternoon reflecting upon the futility of all human endeavor. Late that evening, after I had sobered up to an acceptable point and scrounged me a bite to eat, I armed myself and went looking for some fresh air. I heard voices as I neared the eastern end of the warning perimeter, so I sat down in darkness, resting my back against a largish rock, and tried to eavesdrop. I'd recognized the vibrant diminuendos of Mishtigo's voice, and I wanted to hear what he was saying. I couldn't, though. They were a little too far away, and desert acoustics are not always the finest in the world. I sat there straining with that part of me which listens, and it happened as it sometimes does. I was seated on a blanket beside Ellen, and my arm was around her shoulders, my blue arm. The whole thing faded as I recoiled from the notion of being a vegan, even in a pseudo-telepathic wish-fulfillment, and I was back beside my rock once again. I was lonesome, though, and Ellen had seemed softer than the rock, and I was still curious. So I found myself back there once more, observing. Can't see it from here, I was saying, but Vega is a star of the first magnitude, located in what your people call the constellation Lyra. What is it like on Tala? asked Ellen. There was a long pause, then. Meaningful things are often the things people are least able to describe. Sometimes, though, it is a problem in communicating something for which there is no corresponding element in the person to whom you are speaking. Taller is not like this place. There are no deserts. The entire world is landscaped. But let me take that flower from your hair. There, look at it. What do you see? A pretty white flower. That's why I picked it and put it in my hair. But it is not a pretty white flower, not to me anyway. Your eyes perceive light with wavelengths between about 4,000 and 7,200 angstrom units. The eyes of a vegan look deeper into the ultraviolet, for one thing, down to around 3,000. We are blind to what you refer to as red, but on this white flower I see two colors for which there are no words in your language. My body is covered with patterns you cannot see, but they are close enough to those of the others in my family so that another vegan, familiar with the Shtigogens, could tell my family and province on our first meeting. Some of our paintings look garish to earth eyes, or even seem to be all of one color, blue usually, because the subtleties are invisible to them. Much of our music would seem to you to contain big gaps of silence, gaps which are actually filled with melody. Our cities are clean and logically disposed. They catch the light of day and hold it long into the night. They are places of slow movement, pleasant sounds. This means much to me, but I do not know how to describe it to a human. But people, earth people I mean, live on your worlds, but they do not really see them or hear them or feel them the way we do. There is a gulf we can appreciate and understand, but we cannot really cross it. That is why I cannot tell you what Toller is like. It would be a different world to you than the world it is to me. I'd like to see it, though, very much. I think I'd even like to live there. I do not believe you would be happy there. Why not? Because non-vegan immigrants are non-vegan immigrants. You are not of a low caste here. I know you do not use that term, but that is what it amounts to. Your office personnel and their families are the highest caste on this planet. Wealthy non-office persons come next, then those who work for the wealthy non-office persons, followed by those who make their own living from the land. Then at the bottom are those unfortunates who inhabit the old places. You are at the top here. On Tala you would be at the bottom. 
Why must it be that way? she asked. Because you see a white flower, I handed it back. There was a long silence and a cool breeze. Anyhow, I'm happy you came here, she said. It is an interesting place. Glad you like it. Was the man called Conrad really your lover? I recoiled at the suddenness of the question. It's none of your blue business, she said, but the answer is yes. I can see why, he said, and I felt uncomfortable and maybe something like a voyeur or subtlety of subtleties, one who watches a voyeur watch it. Why, she asked. Because you want the strange, the powerful, the exotic, because you are never happy being where you are, what you are. That's not true. Or maybe it is. Yes, he once said something like that to me. Perhaps it is true. I felt very sorry for her at that moment. Then, without realizing it, as I wanted to console her in some way, I reached out and took her hand. Only it was Mishtigo's hand that moved, and he had not willed it to move. I had. I was afraid suddenly. So was he, though. I could feel it. There was a great drunk-like, room-swimming feeling, as I felt that he felt occupied, as if he had had sensed another presence within his mind. I wandered away quickly then, and I was back there beside my rock, but not before she dropped the flower and I heard her say, Hold me. Damn those pseudo-telepathic wish-fulfillments, I thought. Someday I'll stop believing that that's all they are. I had seen two colors in that flower, colors for which I have no words. I walked back toward the camp. I passed through the camp and kept on going. I reached the other end of the warning perimeter, sat down on the ground, lit a cigarette. The night was cool, the night was dark. Two cigarettes later I heard a voice behind me, but I did not turn. In the great house and in the house of fire, on that great day when all the days and years are numbered, oh, let my name be given back to me, it said. Good for you, I said softly, appropriate quote. I recognize the Book of the Dead when I hear it taken in vain. I wasn't taking it in vain, just, as you said, appropriately. Good for you. On that great day, when all the days and years are numbered, if they do give you back your name, then what name will it be? They won't. I plan on being late. And what's in a name, anyhow? Depends on the name. So try Caragiosis. Try sitting down where I can see you. I, I don't like to have people standing behind me. All right, there. So? So what? So try Caragiosis. Why should I? Because it means something. At least it did once. Caragiosis was a figure in the old Greek shadow shows, sort of like Punch in the European Punch and Judy plays. He was a slob and a buffoon. He was Greek, and he was subtle. Ha! Huh. He was half coward, and he was greasy. He was also half hero, cunning, somewhat gross, sense of humor. He'd tear down a pyramid. Also, he was strong when he wanted to be. Where is he now? I'd like to know. Why ask me? Because that is the name Hassan called you on the night you fought the golem. Oh, I see. Well, it was just an expletive, a generic term, a synonym for fool, a nickname, like if I were to call you Red. And now that I think of it, I wonder how you look to Vistigo, anyhow. Vagans are blind to the color of your hair, you know. I don't really care how I look to Vagans. Wonder how you look, though. I understand that Mishtigo's file on you is quite thick. Says something about you being several centuries old. Doubtless an exaggeration. But you seem to know a lot about it. How thick is your file on Mishtigo? Not very, not yet. It seems that you hate him more than you hate everyone else. Is that true? Yes. Why? He's a vegan. So? I hate vegans, is all. No, there's more. True. You're quite strong, you know. I know. In fact, you're the strongest human being I've ever seen. Strong enough to break the neck of a spider bat then fall into the bay at Piraeus and swim ashore and have breakfast. Odd example you've chosen. Not so, not really. Did you? Why? I want to know, need to know. Sorry. Sorry is not good enough. Talk more. Said all. No, we need Caragiosis. Who's we? The Radpole, me. Why, again? 
Hassan is half as old as time. Caragiosis is older. Hassan knew him, remembered, called you Caragiosis. You are Caragiosis, the killer, the defender of Earth, and we need you now, very badly. Armageddon has come, not with a bang, but a checkbook. The Vagan must die. There is no alternative. Help us stop him. What do you want of me? Let Hassan destroy him. No. Why not? What is he to you? Nothing, really. In fact, I dislike him very much. But what is he to you? Our destroyer. Then tell me why and how, and perhaps I'll give you a better answer. I can't. Why not? Because I don't know. Then good night, that's all. Wait, I, I really do not know. But the word has come down from Taller, from the Radpole liaison there. He must die. His book is not a book, his self is not a self, but many. I do not know what this means, but our agents have never lied before. You've lived on Tala, you've lived on Bakehab and a dozen other worlds. You are Caragiosis. You know that our agents do not lie because you are Caragiosis and you establish the spy circuit yourself. Now you hear their words and you do not heed them. I tell you that they say he must die. He represents the end of everything we've fought for. They say he is a surveyor who must not be permitted to survey. You know the code, money against earth, more vegan exploitation. They could not specify beyond that point. I'm sorry, I've pledged myself to his defense. Give me a better reason and maybe I'll give you a better answer. And Hassan tried to kill me. He was told only to stop you, to incapacitate you, so that we could destroy the vegan. Not good enough, not good enough, no. I admit nothing. Go your ways, I will forget. No, you must help us. What is the life of one vegan to Caragiosis? I will not countenance his destruction without a just and specific cause. Thus far you have shown me nothing. That's all I have. Then good night. No, you have two profiles. From the right side you are a demigod, from the left you are a demon. One of them will help us, must help us. I don't care which one it is. Do not try to harm the vegan. We will protect him. We sat there. She took one of my cigarettes, and we sat there smoking. Hate you, she said after a time. It should be easy, but I can't. I said nothing. I've seen you many times, swaggering in your dress blacks, drinking rum like water, confident of something you never share, arrogant in your strength. You'd fight your weight in anything that moves, wouldn't you? Not red ants or bumblebees. Do you have some master plan of which we know nothing? Tell us, and we will help you with it. It is your idea that I am Caragiosis. I've explained why Hassan called me by that name. Phil knew Caragiosis, and you know Phil. Has he ever said anything about it? You know he hasn't. He is your friend, and he would not betray your confidence. Is there any other indication of identity than Hassan's random name-calling? There is no recorded description of Caragiosis. You were quite thorough. All right, then, go away and don't bother me. Don't, please. Hassan tried to kill me. Yes, he must have thought it easier to kill you than to try keeping you out of the way. After all, he knows more about you than we do. Then why did he save me from the Boadile today, along with Mishtigo? I'd rather not say. Then forget it. No, I will tell you. The Asagai was the only thing handy. He is not yet proficient with it. He was not aiming to hit the Boadile. Oh? But he was not aiming at you either. The beast was writhing too much. He wanted to kill the Vagan, and he would simply have said that he had tried to save you both by the only means at hand, and that there had been a terrible accident. Unfortunately, there was no terrible accident. He missed his target. Why did he not just let the Boadile kill him? Because you had already gotten your hands upon the beast. He feared you might still save him. He fears your hands. That's nice to know. Will he continue trying, even if I refuse to cooperate? I'm afraid so. That is very unfortunate, my dear, because I will not permit it. You will not stop him. Neither will we call him off, even though you are Caragiosis and hurt, and my sorrow for you overflows the horizons. Hassan will not be stopped by you or by me. He is the assassin. He has never failed. Neither have I. Yes, you have. 
You have just failed the Rad Paul and the Earth and everything that means anything. I keep my own counsel, woman, go your ways. I can't. Why is that? If you don't know, then Caragiosis is indeed the fool, the buffoon, the figure in a shadow play. A man named Thomas Carlyle once wrote of heroes and hero worship. He too was a fool. He believed there were such creatures. Heroism is only a matter of circumstances and expediency. Ideals occasionally enter into the picture. What is an ideal? A ghost of a ghost, that's all. Do not say these things to me, please. I must, they are true. You lie, Caragiosis. I do not. Or if I do, it is for the better, girl. I am old enough to be anyone's grandmother but yours, so do not call me girl. Do you know that my hair is a wig? Yes. Do you know that I once contracted a vegan disease and that that is why I must wear a wig? No, I'm very sorry. I did not know. When I was young, long ago, I worked at a vegan resort. I was a pleasure girl. I have never forgotten the puffing of their horrid lungs against my body, nor the touch of their corpse-colored flesh. I hate them, Caragiosis, in ways that only one such as you could understand, one who has hated all the great hates. I'm sorry, Diane. I am so sorry that it hurts you still, but I am not yet ready to move. Do not push me. You are Caragiosis? Yes. Then I am satisfied, somewhat. But the vegan will live. We shall see. Yes, we shall. Good night. Good night, Conrad. And I rose, and I left her there, and I returned to my tent. Later that night she came to me. There was a rustling of the tent flap and the bedclothes, and she was there. And when I have forgotten everything else about her, the redness of her wig and the little upside-down V between her eyes and the tightness of her jaws, and her clip talk and all her little mannerisms of gesture, and her body warm as the heart of a star, and her strange indictment of the man I once might have been, I will remember this, that she came to me when I needed her that she was warm, soft, and that she came to me. After breakfast the following morning, I was going to seek Mishtigo, but he found me first. I was down by the river talking with the men who would be taking charge of the felucca. Conrad, he said softly, may I speak with you? I nodded and gestured toward a gully. Let's walk up this way. I finished here. We walked. After a minute, he said, You know that on my world there are several systems of mental discipline, systems which occasionally produce extrasensory abilities. So I've heard, I said. Most vegans, at some time or other, are exposed to it. Some have an aptitude along these lines, many do not. But just about all of us, though, possess a feeling for it, a recognition of its operations. Yes? I am not telepathic myself, but I am aware that you possess this ability because you used it on me last night. I could feel it. It is quite uncommon among your people, so I had not anticipated this, and I had taken no precautions to prevent it. Also, you hit me at the perfect moment. As a result, my mind was open to you. I have to know how much you learned. So there apparently had been something extrasensory connected with those sight-vision overlays. All they usually contained were what seemed the immediate perceptions of the subject, plus a peek at the thoughts and feelings that went into the words he made. And sometimes I got them wrong. Mishtigo's question indicated that he did not know how far mine went, and I had heard that some professional vague psyche stirrers could even elbow their way into the unconscious, so I decided to bluff. I gather that you are not writing a simple travel book, I said. He said nothing. Unfortunately, I am not the only one who is aware of this, I continued, which places you in a bit of danger. Why? he asked suddenly. Perhaps they misunderstand, I ventured. He shook his head. Who are they? Sorry, but I need to know. Sorry again. If you want out, I can get you back to the port today. No, I can't do that. I must go on. What am I to do? Tell me a little more about it, and I'll make suggestions. No, you know too much already. Then that must be the real reason Donald Dos Santos is here, he said quickly. He is a moderate. The activist wing of the Radpole must have learned something of this and, as you say, misunderstood. He must know of the danger. Perhaps I should go to him. No, I said quickly. I don't think you should. It really wouldn't change anything. What would you tell him, anyhow? A pause, then, I see what you mean, he said. The thought has also occurred to me that he might not be as moderate as I have believed. If that is the case, then, 
Yeah, I said. Want to go back? I can't. Okay, then, blue boy. You're going to have to trust me. You can start by telling me more about this survey. No, I do not know how much you know and how much you do not know. It is obvious that you are trying to elicit more information, so I do not think you know very much. What I am doing is still confidential. I am trying to protect you, I said. Therefore, I want as much information as I can get. Then protect my body and let me worry about my motives and my thoughts. My mind will be closed to you in the future, so you needn't waste your time trying to probe it. I handed him an automatic. I suggest you carry a weapon for the duration of the tour to protect your motives. Very well. It vanished beneath his fluttering shirt. Puff, 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 went the vegan. Damn, 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 went my thought strings. Go get ready, I said. We'll be leaving soon. As I walked back toward the camp via another route, I analyzed my own motives. A book alone could not make or break the earth, the Radpole, Returnism. Even Phil's call of earth had not done that, not really. But this thing of Mishtigo's was to be more than just a book. A survey. What could it be? A push in what direction? I did not know, and I had to know. For Mishtigo could not be permitted to live if it would destroy us. And yet I could not permit his destruction if the thing might be of any help at all, and it might. Therefore, someone had to call time out until we could be sure. The leash had been tugged. I followed. Diane, said I, as we stood in the shade of her skimmer, you say that I mean something to you, as me, as Caragiosis. That would seem to follow. Then hear me. I believe that you may be wrong about the Vagan. I'm not sure, but if you are wrong, it would be a very big mistake to kill him. For this reason, I cannot permit it. Hold off on anything you've planned until we reach Athens. Then request a clarification of that message from the Radpole. She stared me in both eyes, then said, All right. Then what of Hassan? He waits. He makes his own choice as to time and place, does he not? He awaits only the opportunity to strike. Yes. Then he must be told to hold off until we know for sure. Very well. You will tell him. He will be told. Good enough. I turned away. And when the message comes back, she said, if it should say the same thing as before, what then? We'll see, I said, not turning. I left her there beside her skimmer and returned to my own. When the message did come back, saying what I thought it would say, I knew that I would have more trouble on my hands. This is because I had already made my decision. Far to the south and east of us, parts of Madagascar still deafened the geigs with radioactive pain cries, a tribute to the skill of one of us. Hassan, I felt certain, could still face any barrier without blinking those sun-drenched, death-accustomed yellow eyes. He might be hard to stop. It, down below. Death, heat, mud-streaked tides, new shorelines. Vulcanism, Ankios, Samos, Acaria, Naxos, Helicarnassus bitten away, the western end of Cos visible again, but so what? Death, heat, mud-streaked tides, new shorelines. I had brought my whole convoy out of its way in order to check the scene. Mishtigo took notes, also photos. Laurel had said, continue on with the tour. Damage to property has not been too severe because the Mediterranean was mostly full of junk stuff. Personal injuries were either fatal or are already being taken care of. So continue on. I skimmed in low over what remained of Kaz, the westward tail of the island. It was a wild volcanic country and there were fresh craters, fuming ones amidst the new bright sea laces that crisscrossed over the land. The ancient capital of Astapalia had once stood there. Thucydides tells us it had been destroyed by a powerful earthquake. He should have seen this one. My northern city of Kars had then been inhabited from 366 B.C. Now all was gone but the wet and the hot. There were no survivors, and the plane tree of Hippocrates and the mosque of the Logia and the castle of the Knights of Rhodes and the fountains and my cottage and my wife swept by what tides or caught in what sea pits, I do not know, had gone the ways of dead Theocritus, he who had done his best to immortalize the place so many years before, gone, away, far, immortal and dead to me. Further east, a few peaks of that high mountain range which had interrupted the northern coastal plain were still poking themselves up out of the waters. 
There was the mighty peak of Decaius, or Christ the Just, which had overlooked the villages of the northern slopes. Now it was a tiny islet, and no one had made it up to the top in time. It must have been like this, that time so many years ago, when the sea near my homeland, bounded by the Chalcidic Peninsula, had risen up and assaulted the land. In that time when the waters of the inland sea had forced them an outlet through the gorge of Tempe, the mighty convulsions of the thing scoring even the mountain walls of the home of the gods itself, Olympus. And those it spared were only Mr. and Mrs. Deucalion, kept afloat by the gods for purposes of making a myth and some people to tell it to. You lived there, said Mishtigo. I nodded. You were born in the village of Makrinitsa, though, in the hills of Thessaly? Yes, but you made your home there, for a little while. Home is a universal concept, said he. I appreciate it. Thanks. I continued to stare downward, feeling sad, bad, mad, and then nothing. Athens, after absence, returns to me with a sudden familiarity which always refreshes, often renews, sometimes incites. Phil once read me some lines by one of the last great Greek poets, George Seferis, maintaining that he had referred to my Greece when he said, A country that is no longer our own country nor yours either, because of the vegans. When I pointed out that there were no vegans available during Seferis's lifetime, Phil retorted that poetry exists independent of time and space, and that it means whatever it means to the reader. While I have never believed that a literary license is also good for time travel, I had other reasons for disagreeing, for not reading it as a general statement. It is our country. The Goths, the Huns, the Bulgars, the Serbs, the Franks, the Turks, and lately the Vegans have never made it go away from us. People I have outlived, Athens and I have changed together somewhat. Mainland Greece, though, is mainland Greece, and it does not change for me. Try talking it away, whatever you are, and my clefties will stalk the hills like the Sithonic Avengers of old. You will pass, but the hills of Greece will remain, will be unchanged with the smell of goat thigh bones burning, with a mingling of blood and wine, a taste of sweetened almonds, a cold wind by night, and skies as blue bright as the eyes of a god by day. Touch them if you dare. That is why I am refreshed whenever I return, because now that I am a man with many years behind me, I feel this way about the entire earth. That is why I fought, and why I killed and bombed, and why I tried every legal trick in the book, too, to stop the vegans from buying up the earth plot by plot from the absentia government there on Tala. That is why I pushed my way, under another new name, into the big civil service machine that runs this planet, and why arts, monuments, and archives in particular. There I could fight to preserve what still remained while I waited for the next development. The Radpal Vendetta had frightened the expatriates as well as the Vegans. They did not realize that the descendants of those who had lived through the three days would not willingly relinquish their best areas of coastline for Vegan resorts, nor yield up their sons and daughters to work in those resorts. Nor would they guide the Vegans through the ruins of their cities, indicating points of interest for their amusement. That is why the office is mainly a foreign service post for most of its staff. We had sent out the call of return to those descendants of the Martian and Titanian colonies, and there had been no return. They had grown soft out there, soft from leeching on a culture which had had a head start on ours. They lost their identity. They abandoned us. Yet they were the Earth Gov, the jury, legally elected by the absent majority, and maybe de facto too, if it ever came to that. Probably so. I hoped it wouldn't come to that. For over half a century there had been a stalemate. No new veggie resorts, no new Radpaul violence, no return either. Soon there would be a new development that was in the air, if Mishtigo was really surveying. So I came back to Athens on a bleak day, during a cold, drizzling rainfall, and Athens rocked and rearranged by the recent upheavals of earth, and there was a question in my head and bruises on my body, but I was refreshed. The National Museum still stood there between Tarsisa and Vasileos Erakliu. The Acropolis was even more ruined than I remembered, and the Garden Altar Inn, formerly the old royal palace, there at the northwest corner of the National Gardens, across from Syndagma Square, had been shaken but was standing and open for business despite. We entered and checked in. As Commissioner of Arts, Monuments, and Archives, I received special considerations. I got the suite, number 19. 
It wasn't exactly the way I'd left it. It was clean and neat. The little metal plate on the door said, This suite was the headquarters of Constantine Karagiosis during the founding of the Rad Pole and much of the Returnist Rebellion. Inside there was a plaque on the bedstead which read, Constantine Karagiosis slept in this bed. In the long, narrow front room, I spotted one on the far wall. It said, The stain on this wall was caused by a bottle of beverage hurled across the room by Constantine Karagiosis in celebration of the bombing of Madagascar. Believe that if you want to. Constantine Karagiosis sat in this chair, insisted another. I was really afraid to go into the bathroom. Later that night, as I walked the wet and rubble-strewn pavements of my almost deserted city, my old memories and my current thoughts were like the coming together of two rivers. I'd left the others snoring inside, descended the wide stairway from the altar, paused to read one of the inscriptions from Pericles' funeral oration, The entire earth is the tomb of great men, there on the side of the memorial to the unknown soldier, and I studied for a moment those great feud limbs of that archaic warrior laid out with all his weapons on his funeral bed, all marble and bas-relief, yet somehow almost warm because night becomes Athens, and then I walked on by, passing up Leophoros Amalius. It had been a fine dinner, Uzu, Juvetsi, Kokinele, Yorti, Metaxa, lots of dark coffee, and Phil arguing with George about evolution. Do you not see a convergence of life and myth here during the last days of life on this planet? What do you mean? asked George, polishing off a mess of Naranci and adjusting his glasses for peering. I mean that as humanity rose out of darkness, it brought with it legends and myths and memories of fabulous creatures. Now we are descending again into that same darkness. The life force grows weak and unstable, and there is a reversion to those primal forms which for so long existed only as dim racial memories. Nonsense, Phil. Life force? In what century do you make your home? You speak as though all of life were one single sentient entity. It is. Demonstrate, please. You have the skeletons of three satyrs in your museum, and photographs of live ones. They live in the hills of this country. Centaurs, too, have been seen here, and there are vampire flowers and horses with vestigial wings. There are sea serpents in every sea. Imported spider bats plow our skies. There are even sworn statements by persons who have seen the black beast of Thessaly, an eater of men, bones and all, and all sorts of other legends are coming alive. George sighed. What you have said so far proves nothing other than that in all of infinity there is a possibility for any sort of life form to put in an appearance given the proper precipitating factors and a continuous congenial environment. The things you have mentioned which are native to Earth are mutations, creatures originating near various hot spots about the world. There is one such place up in the hills of Thessaly. If the black beast were to crash through that door at this moment, with a satyr mounted on its back, it would not alter my opinion, nor prove yours. I'd looked at the door at that moment, hoping not for the black beast, but for some inconspicuous-looking old man who might sidle by, stumble, and pass on, or for a waiter bringing Diane an unordered drink with a note folded inside the napkin. But none of these things happened. As I passed up Leophorus Amalius by Hadrian's Gate and passed the Olympa Ion, I still did not know what the word was to be. Diane had contacted the Radpole, but there had been no responses yet. Within another thirty-six hours we would be skimming from Athens to Lamia, then onward by foot through areas of strange new trees with long, pale, red-veined leaves, hanging vines, and things that brachiate up above, and all the budding places of the strige fleur down among their roots, and then on across sun-washed plains, up twisty goat trails, through high rocky places and down deep ravines, past ruined monasteries. It was a crazy notion, but Nishtigo again had wanted it that way. Just because I'd been born there, he thought he'd be safe. I'd tried to tell him of the wild beasts, of the cannibal Coretis, the tribesmen who wandered there, but he wanted to be like Pisanius and see it all on foot. Okay, then, I decided, if the radpole didn't get him, then the fauna would. But just to be safe, I had gone to the nearest EarthGov post office, obtained a dueling permit, and paid my death tax. I might as well be on the up-and-up about these things, I decided, me being a commissioner and all. 
If Hassan needed killing, I'd kill him legally. I heard the sound of a bazooki coming from a small cafe on the other side of the street, partly because I wanted to and partly because I had a feeling that I was being followed I crossed over and entered the place. I moved to a small table where I could keep my back to the wall and my eyes on the door, ordered Turkish coffee, ordered a package of cigarettes, listened to the songs of death, exile, disaster, and the eternal faithlessness of women and men. It was even smaller inside than it had seemed from the street, low ceiling, dirt floor, real dark. The singer was a squat woman wearing a yellow dress and much mascara. There was a rattling of glasses. A steady fall of dust descended through the dim air. The sawdust was damp underfoot. My table was set at the near end of the bar. There were maybe a dozen other people spotted about the place. Three sleepy-eyed girls sat drinking at the bar, and a man wearing a dirty fez, and a man resting his head on an outstretched arm and snoring. Four men were laughing at a table diagonally across from me. A few others, solitary, were drinking coffee, listening, watching, nothing in particular waiting, or maybe not waiting, for something or someone to happen. Nothing did, though. So, after my third cup of coffee, I paid the fat, moustached owner his tab and left the place. Outside, the temperature seemed to have dropped several degrees. The street was deserted and quite dark. I turned right into Leophorus Dionysio Areopagatu and moved on until I reached the battered fence that runs along the southern slope of the Acropolis. I heard a footfall way back behind me at the corner. I stood there for half a minute, but there was only silence and very black night. Shrugging, I entered the gate and moved to the Tenemos of Dionysius Eleutherius. Nothing remains of the temple itself but the foundation. I passed on, heading toward the theater. Phil then had suggested that history moved in great cycles like big clock hands passing the same numbers day after day. Historical biology proves you wrong, said George. I didn't mean literally, replied Phil. Then we ought to agree on the language we are speaking before we talk any further. Mishtigo had laughed. Ellen touched Dos Santos's arm and asked him about the poor horses the picadors rode. He had shrugged, poured her some more coquinelle, drank his own. It is a part of the thing, he'd said. And no message, no message. I walked down through the mess time makes of greatness, a frightened bird leaped up on my right, uttered a frightened cry, was gone. I kept walking, wandered into the old theater at last, moved downward through it. Diane was not so amused as I had thought she would be by the stupid plaques that decorated my suite. But they belong here, of course, they do. Ah, at one time it would have been the heads of animals you had slain, or the shields of your vanquished enemies. We're civilized now. This is the new way. Ha, ah, again, I changed the subject. Any word on the vegan? No. You want his head? I'm not civilized. Tell me, was Phil always such a fool back in the old days? No, he wasn't. Isn't now, either. His was the curse of a half-talent. Now he is considered the last of the romantic poets, and he's gone to seed. He pushes his mysticism into nonsense, because, like Wordsworth, he has outlived his day. He lives now in distortions of a pretty good past. Like Byron, he once swam the Hellespont. But now, rather like Yeats, the only thing he really enjoys is the company of young ladies whom he can bore with his philosophy or occasionally charm with a well-told reminiscence. He is old. His writing occasionally shows flashes of its former power, but it was not just his writing that was his whole style. How so? Well, I remember one cloudy day when he stood in the theater of Dionysius and read a hymn to Pan, which he had written. There was an audience of two or three hundred, and only the guards know why they showed up, but he began to read. His Greek wasn't very good yet, but his voice was quite impressive, his whole manner rather charismatic. After a time it began to rain, lightly, but no one left. Near the end there was a peal of thunder, sounding awfully like laughter, and a sudden shudder ran through the crowd. I'm not saying that it was like that in the days of Thespis, but a lot of those people were looking over their shoulders as they left. I was very impressed also. Then, several days later, I read the poem, and it was nothing. It was doggerel, it was trite. It was the way he did it that was important. He lost that part of his power along with his youth, and what remained of what might be called art was not strong enough to make him great to keep alive his personal legend. 
He resents this, and he consoles himself with obscure philosophy, but in answer to your question, no, he was not always such a fool. Perhaps even some of his philosophy is correct. What do you mean? The big cycles, the age of strange beasts is come upon us again, also the age of heroes, demigods. I've only met the strange beasts. Caragiosa slept in this bed, it says here. Looks comfortable. It is, see? Yes, do I get to keep the plaque? If you want. I move to the Priscinian. The relief sculpture work started at the steps, telling tales from the life of Dionysius. Every tour guide and every member of a tour must, under a regulation promulgated by me, carry no fewer than three magnesium flares on his person while traveling. I pulled the pin from one and cast it to the ground. The dazzle would not be visible below because of the angle of the hillside and the blocking masonry. I did not stare into the bright flame, but above, at the silver-limbed figures. There was Hermes presenting the infant god to Zeus, while the Corybantes tripped the Pyrrhic fantastic on either side of the throne. Then there was Icarus, whom Dionysius had taught to cultivate the vine. He was preparing to sacrifice a goat, while his daughter was offering cakes to the god, who stood aside, discussing her with a satyr. And there was drunken Selenus attempting to hold up the sky like Atlas, only not doing so well. And there were all the other gods of the cities paying a call to this theater. And I spotted Hestia, Theseus, and Irene with a horn of plenty. You burn an offering to the gods, came a statement from nearby. I did not turn. It had come from behind my right shoulder, but I did not turn because I knew the voice. Perhaps I do, I said. It has been a long time since you walked this land, this Greece. That is true. Is it because there has never been an immortal Penelope, patient as the mountains, trusting in the return of her Calacanzaras, weaving, patient as the hills? Are you the village storyteller these days? He chuckled. I tend the many-legged sheep in the high places, where the fingers of Aurora come first to smear the sky with roses. Yes, you're the storyteller. Why are you not up in the high places now, corrupting youth with your song? Because of dreams. I. I turned and looked into the ancient face, its wrinkles in the light of the dying flare, as black as fishers' nets lost at the bottom of the sea, the beard as white as the snow that comes drifting down from the mountains, the eyes matching the blue of the headcloth corded about his temples. He did not lean upon his staff any more than a warrior leans on his spear. I knew that he was over a century old, and that he had never taken the SS series. A short time ago did I dream that I stood in the midst of a black temple, he told me, and Lord Hades came and stood by my side, and he gripped my wrist and bade me to go with him. But I said nay, and I awakened. This did trouble me. What did you eat that night, berries from the hot place? Do not laugh, please. Then of a later night did I dream that I stood in a land of sand and darkness, the strength of the old champions was upon me, and I did battle with Antaeus, son of the earth, destroying him. Then did Lord Hades come to me again, and taking me by the arm did say, Come with me now. But again did I deny him, and I awakened. The earth was a tremble. That's all? No, then more recent still, and not at night, but as I sat beneath a tree watching my flock, did I dream a dream while awake. Phoebus-like did I battle the monster Python, and was almost destroyed thereby. This time Lord Hades did not come. But when I turned about, there stood Hermes, his lackey, smiling and pointing his caduceus like a rifle in my direction. I shook my head, and he lowered it. Then he raised it once more in a gesture, and I looked where he had indicated. There before me lay Athens, this place, this theater, you, and here sat the old women. The one who measures out the thread of life was pouting, for she had wrapped yours about the horizon and no ends were in sight. But the one who weaves had divided it into two very thin threads. One strand ran back across the seas and vanished again from sight. The other led up into the hills. At the first hill stood the dead man who held your thread in his white, white hands. Beyond him, at the next hill, it lay across a burning rock. On the hill beyond the rock stood the black beast, and he shook and worried your thread with his teeth. And all along the length of the strand stalked a great foreign warrior, and yellow were his eyes, and naked the blade in his hands, and he did raise this blade several times in menace. 
So I came down to Athens to meet you here at this place, to tell you to go back across the seas, to warn you not to come up into the hills where death awaits you. For I knew when Hermes raised his wand that the dreams were not mine, but they were meant for you, O my father, and that I must find you here and warn you. Go away now while still you can. Go back, please. I gripped his shoulder. Jason, my son, I do not turn back. I take full responsibility for my own actions, right or wrong, including my own death if need be, but I must go into the hills this time up near the hot place. Thank you for your warning. Our family has always had this thing with dreams, and often it is misleading. I too have dreams, dreams in which I see through the eyes of other persons, sometimes clearly, sometimes not so clearly. Thank you for your warning. I am sorry that I must not heed it. Then I will return to my flock. Come back with me to the inn. We will fly you as far as Lamia tomorrow. No, I do not sleep in great buildings, nor do I fly. Then it's probably time you started, but I'll humor you. We can camp here tonight. I'm commissioner of this monument. I had heard you were important in the big government again. Will there be more killing? I hope not. We found a level place and reclined upon his cloak. How do you interpret the dreams? I asked him. Your gifts do come to us with every season, but when was the last time you yourself visited? It was about nineteen years ago, I said. Then you do not know of the dead man? No. He is bigger than most men, taller, fatter, with flesh the color of a fish belly and teeth like an animal's. They began telling of him about fifteen years ago. He comes out only at night. He drinks blood. He laughs a child's laugh as he goes about the countryside looking for blood. Peoples, animals, it does not matter. He smiles in through bedroom windows late at night. He burns churches. He curdles milk. He causes miscarriages from fright. By day it is said that he sleeps in a coffin guarded by the Coretti tribesmen. Sounds as bad as a Calacanzaris. He really exists, father. Some time ago something had been killing my sheep. Whatever it was had partly eaten them and drunk much of their blood. So I dug me a hiding place and covered it over with branches. That night I watched. After many hours he came, and I was too afraid to put a stone in my sling, for he is as I have described him, big, bigger than you even, and gross and colored like a fresh-dug corpse. He broke the sheep's neck with his hands and drank the blood from its throat. I wept to see it, but I was afraid to do anything. The next day I moved my flock and was not troubled again. I used the story to frighten my great-grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren, whenever they misbehave, and he is waiting up in the hills. Mm, yes, if you say you saw it, it must be true, and strange things do come out of the hot places, we know that, where Prometheus spilled too much of the fire of creation. No, where some bastard lobbed a cobalt bomb, and the bright-eyed boys and girls cried Eloi to the fallout. And what of the black beast? He too is real, I am certain. I have never seen him, though. The size of an elephant and very fast, an eater of flesh, they say. He haunts the plains. Perhaps some day he and the dead man will meet, and they will destroy one another. It doesn't usually work out that way, but it's a nice thought. That's all you know about him? Yes, I know of no one who has caught more than a glimpse. Well, I shall try for less than that. And then I must tell you of Bortan. Bortan, that name is familiar. Your dog. I used to ride on his back when I was a child and beat with my legs upon his great armored sides. Then he would growl and seize my foot, but gently. My Bortan has been dead for so long that he would not even chew upon his own bones were he to dig them up in a modern incarnation. I had thought so, too. But two days after you departed from your last visit, he came crashing into the hut. He apparently had followed your trail across half of Greece. You sure it was, Bortan? Was there ever another dog the size of a small horse with armor plates on his sides and jaws like a trap for bears? No, I don't think so. That's probably why the species died out. Dogs do need armor plating if they're going to hang around with people, and they didn't develop it fast enough. If he is still alive, he's probably the last dog on earth. He and I were puppies together, you know, so long ago that it hurts to think about it. That day he vanished while we were hunting. I thought he'd had an accident. I searched for him, then decided he was dead. 
He was incredibly old at the time. Perhaps he was injured and wandering that way for years, but he was himself and he followed your track that last time. When he saw that you were gone, he howled and took off after you again. We have never seen him since then. Sometimes, though, late at night, I hear his hunting cry in the hills. The damn fool mutt ought to know it's not right to care for anything that much. Dogs were strange. Yes, dogs were. And then the night wind, cool through arches of the years, came hounding after me. It touched my eyes. Tired, they closed. Greece is lousy with legend, fraught with menace. Most areas of mainland near the hot places are historically dangerous. This is because, while the office theoretically runs the earth, it actually only tends to the islands. Office personnel on much of the mainland are rather like 20th century revenue officers were in certain hill areas. They're fair game in all seasons. The islands sustained less damage than the rest of the world during the three days, and consequently they were the logical outposts for world district officers when the Talarites decided we could use some administration. Historically, the mainlanders have always been opposed to this. In the regions above the hot places, though, the natives are not always completely human. This compounds the historical antipathy with abnormal behavior patterns. This is why Greece is fraught. We could have sailed up the coast to Volos. We could have skimmed to Volos, or almost anywhere else for that matter. Mishtigo wanted to hike from Lamia, though, to hike and enjoy the refreshment of legend and alien scenery. This is why we left the skimmers at Lamia. This is why we hiked to Volos. This is why we encountered legend. I bade Jason goodbye in Athens. He was sailing up the coast, wise. Phil had insisted on enduring the hike rather than skimming ahead and meeting us up further along the line. Good thing, too, maybe, in a way, sort of. The road to Valos wanders through the thick and the sparse in the way of vegetation. It passes huge boulders, occasional clusters of shacks, fields of poppies. It crosses small streams, winds about hills, sometimes crosses over hills, widens and narrows without apparent cause. It was still early morning. The sky was somehow a blue mirror, because the sunlight seemed to be coming from everywhere. In places of shade, some moisture still clung to the grasses and lower leaves of the trees. It was in an interesting glade along the road to Volos that I met a half-namesake. The place had once been a shrine of some sort, back in the real old days. I came to it quite often in my youth because I liked the quality of it. I guess you'd call it peace that it contained. Sometimes I'd meet the half-people or the no-people there, or dream good dreams, or find old pottery or the heads of statues or things like that, which I could sell down in Lemia or in Athens. There is no trail that leads to it. You just have to know where it is. I wouldn't have taken them there, except for the fact that Phil was along, and I knew that he liked anything that smacks of an aditum, a sequestered significance, a sliding panel view onto dim things past, etc. About half a mile off the road, through a small forest, self-content in its disarray of green and shade and its haphazard heaps of stone, you suddenly go downhill, find the way blocked by a thick thicket, push on through, then discover a blank wall of rock. If you crouch, keep close to that wall and bear to the right. You then come upon a glade where it is often well to pause before proceeding further. There is a short, sharp drop, and down below is an egg-shaped clearing about fifty meters long, twenty across, and a small end of the egg butting into a bitten-out place in the rock. There is a shallow cave at the extreme end, usually empty. A few half-sunken, almost square stones stand about in a seemingly random way. Wild grapevines grow around the perimeter of the place, and in the center is an enormous and ancient tree whose branches act as an umbrella over almost the entire area, keeping it dusky throughout the day. Because of this, it is hard to see into the place even from the glade. But we could see a satyr in the middle, picking his nose. I saw George's hand go to the mercy gun he carried, I caught his shoulder, his eyes shook my head. He shrugged and nodded, dropping his hand. I withdrew from my belt the shepherd's pipe I had asked Jason to give me. I motioned to the others to crouch and remain where they were. I moved a few steps further ahead and raised the syrinx to my lips. My first notes were quite tentative. It had been too long since I'd played the pipes. His ears pricked forward and he looked all about him. 
He made rapid moves in three different directions, like a startled squirrel, uncertain as to which tree to make for. Then he stood there quivering as I caught up an old tune and nailed it to the air. I kept playing, remembering, remembering the pipes, the tunes, and the bitter, the sweet, and the drunken things I'd really always known. It all came back to me as I stood there, playing for the little guy in the shaggy leggings. The fingering and the control of the air, the little runs, the thorns of sound, the things only the pipes can really say. I can't play in the cities, but suddenly I was me again, and I saw faces in the leaves, and I heard the sound of hoofs. I moved forward. Like in a dream, I noticed I was standing with my back against the tree, and they were all about me. They shifted from hoof to hoof, never staying still, and I played for them as I had so often before, years ago, not knowing whether they were really the same ones who'd heard me then, or caring, actually. They cavorted about me. They laughed through white, white teeth, and their eyes danced, and they circled, jabbing at the air with their horns, kicking their goat legs high off the ground, bending far forward, springing into the air, stamping the earth. I stopped and lowered the pipes. It was not an human intelligence that regarded me from those wild, dark eyes as they all froze into statues, just standing there, staring at me. I raised the pipes once more, slowly. This time I played the last song I'd ever made. I remembered it so well. It was a dirge-like thing I had played on the night I decided Caragiosis should die. I had seen the fallacy of return. They would not come back, would never come back. The earth would die. I had gone down into the gardens and played this one last tune I'd learned from the wind and maybe even the stars. The next day, Caragiosis's big blazed boat had broken up in the bay at Piraeus. They seated themselves on the grass. Occasionally, one would dab at his eye with an elaborate gesture. They were all about me, listening. How long I played, I do not know. When I had finished, I lowered the pipes and sat there. After a time, one of them reached out and touched the pipes and drew his hand back quickly. He looked up at me. Go, I said, but they did not seem to understand. So I raised the syrinx and played the last few bars over again. The earth is dying, dying, soon it will be dead. Go home, the party's over, it's late, it's late, it's late. The biggest one shook his head. Go away, go away, go away now. Appreciate the silence. After life's most ridiculous gambit, appreciate the silence. What did the gods hope to gain, to gain? Nothing. Twas all but a game. Go away, go away, go away now. It's late, it's late, so late. They still sat there, so I stood up and clapped my hands, yelled go, and walked quickly away. I gathered my companions and headed back for the road. It is about sixty-five kilometers from Lemia to Volos, including the detour around the hot spot. We covered maybe a fifth of that distance on the first day. That evening we pitched our camp in a clearing off to the side of the road, and Diane came up beside me and said, Well? Well what? I just called Athens. Blank. The rad pole is silent. I want your decision now. You are very determined. Why can't we wait some more? We waited too long as it is. Supposing he decides to end the tour ahead of schedule. This countryside is perfect. So many accidents could come so easily here. You know what the Rad Paul will say. The same as before. And it will signify the same as before. Kill. My answer is also the same as before. No. She blinked rapidly, lowered her head. Please reconsider. No. Then do this much, she said. Forget it. The whole thing. Wash your hands of the affair. Take Laurel up on his offer and get us a new guide. You can skim out of here in the morning. No. Are you really serious, then, about protecting Mishtigo? Yes. I don't want you hurt, or worse. I'm not particularly fond of the idea myself, so you can save us both a lot of trouble by calling it off. I can't do that. Dos Santos does as you tell him. The problem is not an administrative one. Damn it, I wish I'd never met you. I'm sorry. The earth is at stake and you're on the wrong side. I think you are. What are you going to do about it? I can't convince you, so I'll just have to stop you. You couldn't turn in the secretary of the Radpal and his consort without evidence. We're too ticklish politically. I know that. 
So you couldn't hurt Dan, and I don't believe you'd hurt me. You're right. That leaves Hassan. Right again. And Hassan is Hassan. What will you do? Why don't you give him his walking papers right now and save me some trouble? I won't do that. I didn't think you would. She looked up again. Her eyes were moist, but her face and voice were unchanged. If it should turn out that you were right and we were wrong, she said, I am sorry. Me too, I said. Very, very. That night I dozed within knifing distance of Mishtigo, but nothing happened or tried to. The following morning was uneventful, as was most of the afternoon. Mishtigo, I said, as soon as we paused for purposes of photographing a hillside, why don't you go home? Go back to Tolem. Go anywhere. Walk away from it. Write some other book. The further we get into civilization, the less is my power to protect you. You gave me an automatic, remember, he said. He made a shooting motion with his right hand. All right, just thought I'd give it another try. That's a goat standing on the lower limb of that tree, isn't it? Yeah, they like to eat those little green shoots that come up off the branches. I want a picture of that, too. Olive tree, isn't it? Yes. Good, I wanted to know what to call the picture. Goat eating green shoots in olive tree, he dictated. That will be the caption. Great. Shoot while you have the chance. If only he weren't so uncommunicative, so alien, so unconcerned about his welfare. I hated him. I couldn't understand him. He wouldn't speak unless it was to request information or to answer a question. Whenever he did answer questions, he was terse, elusive, insulting, or all three at once. He was smug, conceited, blue, and overbearing. It really made me wonder about the Stigogen's tradition of philosophy, philanthropy, and enlightened journalism. I just didn't like him. But I spoke to Hassan that evening, after having kept an eye, the blue one, on him all day. He was sitting beside the fire, looking like a sketch by Delacroix. Ellen and Dos Santos sat nearby, drinking coffee, so I dusted off my Arabic and approached. Greetings. Greetings? You did not try to kill me today. No. Tomorrow, perhaps? He shrugged. Hassan, look at me. He did. You were hired to kill the blue one. He shrugged again. You needn't deny it or admit it. I already know. I cannot allow you to do this thing. Give back the money Dos Santos has paid you and go your way. I can get you a skimmer by morning. It will take you anywhere in the world you wish to go. But I am happy here, Karaji. You will quickly cease being happy if any harm comes to the blue one. I am a bodyguard, Karaji. No, Hassan, you are the son of a dyspeptic camel. What is dyspeptic, Karaji? I do not know the Arabic word, and you would not know the Greek one. Wait, I'll find another insult. You are a coward and a carrion eater and a skulker up alleyways because you are half jackal and half ape. Well, this may be true, Karaji, because my father told me that I was born to be flayed alive and torn into quarters. Why was that? I was disrespectful to the devil. Oh? Yes. Were those devils that you played music for yesterday? They had the horns, the hooves? No, they were not devils. They were the hot-born children of unfortunate parents who left them to die in the wilderness. They lived, though, because the wilderness is their real home. Ah, and I had hoped that they were devils. I still think they were, because one smiled at me as I prayed to them for forgiveness. Forgiveness? For what? A faraway look came into his eyes. My father was a very good and kind and religious man, he said. He worshipped Malak Tawas, whom the benighted Shiites, he spat here, call Iblis, or Shaitan, or Satan. And he always paid his respects to Halaj and the others of the Sanjak. He was well known for his piety, his many kindnesses. I loved him, but as a boy I had an imp within me. I was an atheist. I did not believe in the devil. And I was an evil child, for I took me a dead chicken and mounted it on a stick and called it the Peacock Angel, and I mocked it with stones and pulled its feathers. One of the other boys grew frightened and told my father of this. My father flogged me then in the streets, and he told me I was born to be flayed alive and torn into quarters for my blasphemies. He made me go to Mount Sanjar and pray for forgiveness, and I went there. But the imp was still within me, despite the flogging, and I did not really believe as I prayed. Now that I am older, the imp has fled, but my father too is gone, these many years, and I cannot tell him. 
I am sorry that I mocked the peacock angel. As I grow older, I feel the need for religion. I hope that the devil, in his great wisdom and mercy, understands this and forgives me. Hassan, it is difficult to insult you properly, I said, but I warn you, the blue one must not be harmed. I am but a humble bodyguard. Ah, yours is the cunning and the venom of the serpent. You are deceitful and treacherous, vicious too. No, Kerajin, thank you, but it is not true. I take pride in always meeting my commitments, that is all. This is the law I live by. Also, you cannot insult me so that I will challenge you to a duel, permitting you to choose bare hands or daggers or sabers. No, I take no offense. Then beware, I told him. Your first move toward the vegan will be your last. If it is so written, Kara Jane, and call me Conrad. I stalked away, thinking bad thoughts. The following day, all of us still being alive, we broke camp and pushed on, making about eight kilometers before the next interruption occurred. That sounded like a child crying, said Phil. You're right. Where is it coming from? Off to the left, down there. We moved through some shrubbery, came upon a dry stream bed, and followed it around a bend. The baby lay among the rocks, partly wrapped in a dirty blanket. Its face and hands were already burnt red from the sun, so it must have been there much of the day before. The bite marks of many insects were upon its tiny wet face. I knelt, adjusting the blanket to cover it better. Ellen cried a little as the blanket fell open in front, and she saw the baby. There was a natural fistula in the child's chest, and something was moving inside. Redwig screamed, turned away, began to weep. What is it? asked Mishtigo. One of the abandoned, I said, one of the marked ones. How awful, said Redwig. Its appearance, or the fact that it was abandoned, I asked. Both. Give it to me, said Ellen. Don't touch it, said George, stooping. Call for a skimmer, he ordered. We have to get it to a hospital right away. I don't have the equipment to operate on it here. Ellen, help me. She was at his side then, and they went through his med kit together. You write what I do and pin the note onto a clean blanket so the doctors in Athens will know. Dos Santos was phoning Lamia by then to pick up on one of our skimmers. And then Ellen was filling hypos for George and swabbing the cuts and painting the burns with unguents and writing it all down. They shot the baby full of vitamins, antibiotics, general adaptives, and half a dozen other things. I lost count after a while. They covered its chest with gauze, sprayed it with something, wrapped it in a clean blanket, and pinned the note to it. What a dreadful thing, said Dos Santos, abandoning a deformed child, leaving it to die in such a manner. It's done here all the time, I told him, especially about the hot places. In Greece there has always been a tradition of infanticide. I myself was exposed on a hilltop on the day I was born. Spent the night there, too. He was lighting a cigarette, but he stopped and stared at me. You? Why? I laughed, glanced down at my foot. Complicated story. I wear a special shoe because this leg is shorter than the other. Also, I understand I was a very hairy baby, and then my eyes don't match. I suppose I might have gotten by if that had been all, but then I went and got born on Christmas, and that sort of clinched things. What is wrong with being born on Christmas? The gods, according to local beliefs, deem it a bit presumptuous. For this reason, children born at that time are not of human blood. They are of the brood of destroyers, the creators of havoc, the panickers of man. They are called the Calacanzeroi. Ideally, they look something like those guys with horns and hoofs and all, but they don't have to. They could look like me, my parents decided, if they were my parents, so they left me on a hilltop to be returned. What happened then? There was an old Orthodox priest in the village. He heard of it and went to them. He told them that it was a mortal sin to do such a thing, and they had better get the baby back quick and have it ready for baptism the following day. Ah, and that is how you were saved and baptized? Well, sort of. I took one of his cigarettes. They came back with me all right, but they insisted I wasn't the same baby they'd left there. They'd left a dubious mutant and collected an even more doubtful changeling, they said. Uglier, too, they claimed, and they got another Christmas child in return. Their baby had been a satyr, they said, and they figured that perhaps some hot creature had had a sort of human child and had abandoned it in the same way we do them, making a swap, actually. Nobody had seen me before then, so their story couldn't be checked. 
The priest would have none of this, though, and he told them they were stuck with me. But they were very kind once they were reconciled to the fact. I grew fairly large, fairly young, and I was strong for my age. They liked that. And you were baptized? Well, sort of half baptized. Half baptized? This priest had a stroke at my christening. Died a little while later. He was the only one around, so I don't know that I got the whole thing done proper. One drop would be sufficient. I suppose so. I don't really know what happened. Maybe you had better have it done again, just to be safe. No, if heaven didn't want me then, I'm not going to ask a second time. We set up a beacon in a nearby clearing and waited for the skimmer. We made another dozen or so kilometers that day, which was pretty good, considering the delay. The baby had been picked up and dispatched directly to Athens. When the skimmer had sat down, I'd asked in a large voice whether anyone else wanted a ride back. There'd been no takers, though. And it was that evening that it happened. We reclined about a fire. Oh, it was a jolly fire, flapping its bright wing against the night, warming us, smelling woody, pushing a smoke stack into the air. Nice. Hassan sat there cleaning his aluminum barrel shotgun. It had a plastic stock, and it was real light and handy. As he worked on it, it tilted forward, moved slowly about, pointed itself right at Mishtigo. He'd done it quite neatly, I must admit that. It was during a period of over half an hour, and he'd advanced the barrel with almost imperceptible movements. I snarled, though, when its position registered in my cerebrum, and I was at his side in three steps. I struck it from his hands. It clattered on some small stone about eight feet away. My hand was stinging from the slap I'd given it. Hassan was on his feet, his teeth shuffling around inside his beard, clicking together like flint and steel. I could almost see the sparks. Say it, I cried. Go ahead, say something, anything. You know damn well what you were just doing. His hands twitched. Go ahead, I said. Hit me. Just touch me, even. Then what I do to you will be self-defense, provoked assault. Even George won't be able to put you back together again. I was only cleaning my shotgun. You've damaged it. You do not point weapons by accident. You are going to kill Mishtigo. You are mistaken. Hit me, or are you a coward? I have no quarrel with you. You are a coward. No, I am not. After a few seconds, he smiled. Are you afraid to challenge me? he asked. And there it was, the only way. The move had to be mine. I had hoped it wouldn't have to be that way. I had hoped that I could anger him or shame him or provoke him into striking me or challenging me. I knew then that I couldn't, which was bad, very bad. I was sure I could take him with anything I cared to name. But if he headed his way, things would be different. Everybody knows there are some people with an aptitude for music. They can hear a piece once and sit down and play it on the piano or the lindstrom. They can pick up a new instrument, and inside a few hours, they can sound as if they've been playing it for years. They're good, very good at such things, because they have that talent, the ability to coordinate a special insight with a series of new actions. Hassan was that way with weapons. Maybe some other people could be the same, but they don't go around doing it, not for decades and decades anyway, with everything from boomerangs to blowguns. The dueling code would provide Hassan with the choice of means, and he was the most highly skilled killer I'd ever known. But I had to stop him, and I could see that this was the only way it could be done short of murder. I had to take him on his terms. Amen, I said, I challenge you to a duel. His smile remained, grew, agreed, before these witnesses, name your second. Phil Graver, name yours. Mr. Dos Santos, very good. I happen to have a dueling permit and the registration forms in my bag, and I've already paid the death tax for one person, so there needn't be much of a delay. When, where, and how do you want it? We passed a good clearing about a kilometer back up the road. Yes, I recall it. We shall meet there at dawn tomorrow. Check. I said, and as to weapons? He fetched his nap case, opened it. It bristled with interesting sharp things, glistened with ovoid incendiaries, writhed with coils of metal and leather. He withdrew two items and closed the pack. My heart sank. The sling of David, he announced. I inspected them. At what distance? Fifty meters, he said. You've made a good choice, I told him, not having used one in over a century myself. I'd like to borrow one tonight to practice with. If you don't want to lend it to me, I can make my own. You may take either and practice all night with it. Thanks. I selected one and hung it from my belt. 
Then I picked up one of our three electric lanterns. If anybody needs me, I'll be up the road at the clearing, I said. Don't forget to post guards tonight. This is a rough area. Do you want me to come along? asked Phil. No, thanks anyway. I'll go alone. See you. Then good night. I hiked back along the way, coming at last to the clearing. I set up the lantern at one end of the place so that it reflected upon a stand of small trees, and I moved to the other end. I collected some stones and slung one at a tree. I missed. I slung a dozen more, hitting with four of them. I kept at it. After about an hour, I was hitting with a little more regularity. Still, at fifty meters, I probably couldn't match Hassan. The night wore on, and I kept slinging. After a time, I reached what seemed to be my learning plateau for accuracy. Maybe six out of seven of my shots were coming through. But I had one thing in my favor, I realized, as I twirled the sling and sent another stone smashing into a tree. I delivered my shots with an awful lot of force. Whenever I was on target, there was much power behind the strike. I had already shattered several of the smaller trees, and I was sure Hassan couldn't do that with twice as many hits. If I could reach him, fine, but all the power in the world was worthless if I couldn't connect with it. And I was sure he could reach me. I wondered how much of a beating I could take and still operate. It would depend, of course, on where he hit me. I dropped the sling and yanked the automatic gun from my belt when I heard a branch snap far off to my right. Hassan came into the clearing. What do you want? I asked him. I came to see how your practice was going, he said, regarding the broken trees. I shrugged, reholstered my automatic, and picked up the sling. Comes the sunrise, and you will learn. We walked across the clearing, and I retrieved the lantern. Hassan studied a small tree, which was now in part toothpicks. He did not say anything. We walked back to the camp. Everyone but Dos Santos had turned in. Don was our guard. He paced about the warning perimeter, carrying an automatic rifle. He waved to him and entered the camp. Hassan always pitched a gauzy a one-molecule-layer tent, opaque, feather-light, and very tough. He never slept in it, though. He just used it to stash his junk. I seated myself on a log before the fire, and Hassan ducked inside his gauzy. He emerged a moment later with his pipe and a block of hardened, resinous-looking stuff, which he proceeded to scale and grind. He mixed it with a bit of burley and then filled the pipe. After he got it going with a stick from the fire, he sat smoking it beside me. I do not want to kill you, Karaji, he said. I share this feeling. I do not wish to be killed. But we must fight tomorrow. Yes, you could withdraw your challenge. You could leave by skimmer. I will not, nor will I withdraw my challenge. It is sad, he said, after a time, sad that two such as we must fight over the blue one. He is not worth your life nor mine. True, I said, but it involves more than just his life. The future of this planet is somehow tied up with whatever he is doing. I do not know of these things, Karaji. I fight for money. I have no other trade. Yes, I know. The fire burnt low. I fed it more sticks. Do you remember the time we bombed the coast of gold in France? he asked. I remember. Beside the blue ones, we killed many people. Yes. The future of the planet was not changed by this, Karaji. For here we are, many years away from the thing, and nothing is different. I know that. And do you remember the day when we crouched in a hole on a hillside overlooking the bay at Piraeus? Sometimes you would feed me the belts, and I would strafe the blazed boats, and when I grew tired you would operate the gun. We had much ammunition. The office guard did not land that day, nor the next. They did not occupy Athens, and they did not break the rad pole. And we talked as we sat there those two days and that night waiting for the fireball to come, and you told me of the powers in the sky. I forget. I do not. You told me that there are men like us who live up in the air by the stars. Also, there are the blue ones. Some of the men, you said, seek the blue ones' favor, and they would sell the earth to them to be made into a museum. Others, you said, did not want to do this thing, but they wanted it to remain as it is now their property run by the office. The blue ones were divided among themselves on this matter because there was a question as to whether it was legal and ethical to do this thing. There was a compromise, and the blue ones were sold some clean areas which they used as resorts and from which they toured the rest of the earth. But you wanted the earth to belong only to people. 
You said that if we gave the blue ones an inch, then they would want it all. You wanted the men by the stars to come back and rebuild the cities, bury the hot places, kill the beasts which prey upon men. As we sat there waiting for the fireball, you said that we were at war, not because of anything we could see or hear or feel or taste, but because of the powers in the sky who had never seen us and whom we would never see. The powers in the sky had done this thing, and because of it men had to die here on earth. You said that by the death of men and blue ones, the powers might return to earth. They never did, though. There was only the death. And it was the powers in the sky which saved us in the end, because they had to be consulted before the fireball could be burnt over Athens. They reminded the office of an old law made after the time of the three days, saying that the fireball would never again burn in the skies of earth. You had thought that they would burn it anyhow, but they did not. It was because of this that we stopped them at Piraeus. I burnt Madagasky for you, Karaji, but the powers never came down to earth, and when people get much money they go away from here, and they never come back from the sky. Nothing we did in those days has caused a change. Because of what we did, things remained as they were, rather than getting worse, I told him. What will happen if this blue one dies? I do not know. Things may worsen then. If he is viewing the areas as we pass through as possible real estate tracks to be purchased by vegans, then it is the old thing all over again. And the Radpaul will fight again. We'll bomb them? I think so. Then let us kill him now, before he goes further, sees Moa. It may not be that simple. And they would only send another. There would also be repercussions, perhaps mass arrests of Radpaul members. The Red Pole is no longer living on the edge of life as it was in those days. The people are unready. They need time to prepare. This blue one, at least, I hold in my hand. I can watch him, learn of his plans. Then, if it becomes necessary, I can destroy him myself. He drew on his pipe. I sniff. It was something like sandalwood that I smell. What are you smoking? It comes from near my home. I visited there recently. It is one of the new plants which has never grown there before. Try it. I took several mouthfuls into my lungs. At first there was nothing. I continued to draw on it, and after a minute there was a gradual feeling of coolness and tranquility which spread down through my limbs. It tasted bitter, but it relaxed. I handed it back. The feeling continued, grew stronger. It was very pleasant. I had not felt that sedate, that relaxed, for many weeks. The fire, the shadows, and the ground about us suddenly became more real, and the night air and the distant moon and the sound of Dos Santos's footsteps came somehow more clearly than life really. The struggle seemed ridiculous. We would lose it in the end. It was written that humanity was to be the cats and dogs and trained chimpanzees of the real people, the vegans, and in a way it was not such a bad idea. Perhaps we needed someone wiser to watch over us, to run our lives. We had made a shambles of our own world during the three days, and the Vegans had never had a nuclear war. They operated a smoothly efficient interstellar government encompassing dozens of planets. Whatever they did was aesthetically pleasing. Their own lives were well-regulated, happy things. Why not let them have the Earth? They'd probably do a better job with it than we'd ever done. And why not be their coolies, too? It wouldn't be a bad life. Give them the old ball of mud full of radioactive sores and populated by cripples. Why not? I accepted the pipe once more, inhaled more peace. It was so pleasant not to think of these things at all, though. Not to think of anything you couldn't really do anything about. Just to sit there and breathe in the night and be one with the fire and the wind was enough. The universe was singing its hymn of oneness. Why open the bag of chaos there in the cathedral? But I had lost my Cassandra, my dark witch of Cos, to the mindless powers which move the earth and the waters. Nothing could kill my feelings of loss. It seemed further away, somehow insulated behind glass, but it was still there. Not all the pipes of the East could assuage this thing. I did not want to know peace. I wanted hate. I wanted to strike out at all the masks in the universe. Earth, water, sky, taller, earth, gov, and office so that behind one of them I might find that power which had taken her and make it, too, know something of pain. I did not want to know peace. I did not want to be at one with anything which had harmed that which was mine, by blood and by love. 
For just five minutes, even, I wanted to be Caragiosis again, looking at it all through crosshairs and squeezing a trigger. O Zeus of the hot red lightnings, I prayed, give it to me that I may break the powers in the sky. I returned the pipe again. Thank you, Hassan, but I'm not ready for the bow tree. I stood then and moved off toward the place where I had cast my pack. I am sorry that I must kill you in the morning, he called after me. Sipping beer in a mountain lodge on the planet Divba with a vegan seller of information named Krim, who is now dead, I once looked out through a wide window and up at the highest mountain in the known universe. It is called Kasla, and it has never been climbed. The reason I mention it is because on the morning of the duel I felt a sudden remorse that I had never attempted to scale it. It is one of those crazy things you think about and promise yourself that some day you're going to try, and then you wake up one morning and realize that it is probably exactly too late, and you never do it. There were no expressions on every face that morning. The world outside us was bright and clear and clean and filled with the singing of birds. I had forgotten the use of the radio until after the duel, and Phil carried some of its essential entrails in his jacket pocket just to be sure. Laurel would not know, the Radpole would not know, nobody would know until after. The preliminaries completed, the distance was measured off. We took our places at the opposite ends of the clearing. The rising sun was to my left. Are you ready, gentlemen? called out Dos Santos. Yes, and I am, were the replies. I make a final attempt to dissuade you from this course of action. Do either of you wish to reconsider? No and no. Each of you has ten stones in similar size and weight. The first shot is, of course, given to he who was challenged, Hassan. We both nodded. Proceed, then. He stepped back, and there was nothing but fifty meters of air separating us. We both stood sideways so as to present the smallest target possible. Hassan fitted his first stone to the sling. I watched him wind it rapidly through the air behind him, and suddenly his arm came forward. There was a crashing sound in back of me. Nothing else happened. He'd missed. I put a stone to my own sling then and whipped it back and around. The air sighed as I cut it all apart. Then I hurled the missile forward with all the strength of my right arm. It grazed his left shoulder, barely touching it. It was mostly garment that it plowed. The stone ricocheted from tree to tree behind him before it vanished finally. All was still then. The birds had given up on their morning concert. Gentlemen, called Dos Santos, you have each had one chance to settle your differences. It may be said that you have faced one another with honor, given vent to your wrath, and are now satisfied. Do you wish to stop the duel? No, said I. Hassan rubbed his shoulder, shook his head. He put the second stone to his sling, worked it rapidly through a powerful wind-up, then released it to me. Right between the hip and the rib cage, that's where it caught me. I fell to the ground, and it all turned black. A second later the lights came on again, but I was doubled up, and something with a thousand teeth had me by the side and wouldn't let go. They were running toward me, all of them, but Phil waved them back. Hassan held his position. Dos Santos approached. Is that it? asked Phil softly. Can you get up? Yeah. I need a minute to breathe and to put the fire out, but I'll get up. What is the situation? asked Dos Santos. Phil told him. I put my hand to my side and stood again, slowly. A couple inches higher or lower, and something bony might have broken. As it was, it just hurt like blazes. I rubbed it, moved my right arm through a few circles to test the play of muscles on that side. Okay. Then I picked up the sling and put a stone to it. This time it would connect, I had a feeling. It went around and around, and it came out fast. Hassan toppled, clutching at his left thigh. Dos Santos went to him. They spoke. Hassan's robe had muffled the blow, had partly deflected it. The leg was not broken. He would continue as soon as he could stand. He spent five minutes massaging it, then he got to his feet again. During that time, my pain had subsided to a dull throbbing. Hassan selected his third stone. He fitted it slowly, carefully. He took my measure. Then he began to lash at the air with a sling. All the while I had the feeling, and it kept growing, that I should be leading a little further to the right, so I did. He twirled it, threw it. It grazed my fungus and tore at my left ear. Suddenly my cheek was wet. 
Ellen screamed briefly. A little further to the right, though, and I wouldn't have been hearing her. It was my turn again. Smooth, grey, the stone had the feel of death about it. I will be it, this one seemed to say. It was one of those little premonitory tuggings at my sleeve of the sort for which I have a great deal of respect. I wiped the blood from my cheek. I fitted the stone. There was death riding in my right arm as I raised it. Hassan felt it too because he flinched. I could see this from across the field. You will all remain exactly where you are and drop your weapons, said the voice. He said it in Greek, so no one but Phil and Hassan and I understood it for sure. Maybe DeSantis or Redwig did, I'm still not certain, but all of us understood the automatic rifle the man carried and the swords and clubs and knives of the three dozen or so men and half-men standing behind him. They were Coretti's. Coretti's are bad. They always get their pound of flesh, usually roasted, sometimes fried, though, or boiled, or raw. The speaker seemed to be the only one carrying a firearm. And I had a handful of death circling high above my shoulder. I decided to make him a gift of it. His head exploded as I delivered it. Kill them, I said, and we began to do so. George and Diane were the first to open fire. Then Phil found a handgun. De Santos ran for his pack. Ellen got there fast, too. Hassan had not needed my order to begin killing. The only weapons he and I were carrying were the slings. The Coretis were closer than our fifty meters, though, and theirs was a mob formation. He dropped two of them with well-placed stones before they began their rush. I got one more also. Then they were halfway across the field, leaping over their dead and their fallen, screaming as they came on toward us. Like I said, they were not all of them human. There was a tall, thin one with three-foot wings covered with sores, and there were a couple microcephalics with enough hair so that they looked headless, and there was one guy who should probably have been twins, and there were several... Steatopegiacs and three huge hulking brutes who kept coming despite bullet holes in their chests and abdomens. One of these latter had hands which must have been twenty inches long and a foot across, and another appeared to be afflicted with something like elephantiasis. Of the rest, some were reasonably normal in form, but they all looked mean and mangy, and either wore rags or no rags at all, and were unshaven and smelled bad, too. I hurled one more stone and didn't get a chance to see where it hit because they were upon me then. I began lashing out, feet, fists, elbows. I wasn't too polite about it. The gunfire slowed down, stopped. You have to stop to reload sometime, and there'd been some jamming, too. The pain in my side was a very bad thing. Still, I managed to drop three of them before something big and blunt caught me on the side of the head, and I fell as a dead man falls. Coming to in a stiflingly hot place. Coming to in a stiflingly hot place that smells like a stable. Coming to in a dark, stiflingly hot place that smells like a stable. This is not real conducive to peace of mind, a settled stomach, or the resumption of sensory activities on a sure and normal keel. It stank in there, and it was damn hot, and I didn't really want to inspect the filthy floor too closely. It was just that I was in a very good position to do so. I moaned, numbered all my bones, and sat up. The ceiling was low, and it slanted down even lower before it met with the back wall. The one window to the outside was small and barred. We were in the back part of a wooden shack. There was another barred window in the opposite wall. It didn't look out on anything, though. It looked in. There was a larger room beyond it, and George and Dos Santos were talking through it with someone who stood on that other side. Hassan lay unconscious or dead about four feet away from me. There was dried blood in his head. Phil and Mishtigo and the girls were talking softly in the far corner. I rubbed my temple while all this was registering within. My left side ached steadily, and numerous other portions of my anatomy had decided to join in the game. He's awake, said Mishtigo suddenly. Hi, everybody. I'm back again, I agreed. They came toward me, and I assumed a standing position. This was sheer bravado, but I managed to carry it. We are prisoners, said Mishtigo. Oh, yeah, really? I'd never have guessed. Things like this do not happen on Toller, he observed, or on any of the worlds in the Vegan Combine. Too bad you didn't stay there, I said. Don't forget the number of times I asked you to go back. This thing would not have occurred if it had not been for your duel. I slapped him then. I couldn't bring myself to slug him. He was just too pathetic. I hit him with the back of my hand and knocked him over into the wall. 
Are you trying to tell me you don't know why I stood there like a target this morning? Because of your quarrel with my bodyguard, he stated, rubbing his cheek, over whether or not he was going to kill you. Me? Kill? Forget it, I said. It doesn't really matter anyway. Not now. You're still on Toller, and you may as well stay there for your last few hours. It would have been nice if you could have come to Earth and visited with us for a while, but things didn't work out that way. We are going to die here, aren't we? he asked. That is the custom of the country. I turned away and studied the man who was studying me from the other side of the bars. Hassan was leaning against the far wall then, holding his head. I hadn't noticed his getting up. Good afternoon, said the man behind the bars, and he said it in English. Is it afternoon? I asked. Quite, he replied. Why aren't we dead? I asked him. Because I wanted you alive, he stated. Oh, not you personally, Conrad Nomikos, Commissioner of Arts, Monuments, and Archives, and all your distinguished friends, including the Poet Laureate. I wanted any prisoners whom they came upon brought back alive. Your identities are, shall we say, condiments. To whom do I have the pleasure of speaking? I asked. This is Dr. Morby, said George. He is their witch doctor, said Dos Santos. I prefer shaman or medicine chief, corrected Morby, smiling. I moved closer to the grillwork and saw that he was rather thin, well-tanned, clean-shaven, and had all his hair woven into one enormous black braid, which was coiled like a cobra about his head. He had close-set eyes, dark ones, a high forehead, and lots of extra jaw reaching down past his Adam's apple. He wore woven sandals, a clean green sari, and a necklace of human finger bones. In his ears were big snake-shaped circlets of silver. Your English is rather precise, said I, and Morby is not a Greek name. Oh, goodness, he gestured gracefully in mock surprise. I'm not a local. How could you ever mistake me for a local? Sorry, I said. I can see now that you're too well dressed. He giggled. Oh, this old rag. I just threw it on. No, I'm from Tala. I read some wonderfully rousing literature on the subject of returnism, and I decided to come back and help rebuild the earth. Oh? What happened then? The office was not hiring at the time, and I experienced some difficulty in finding employment locally, so I decided to engage in research work. This place is full of opportunities for that. What sort of research? I hold two graduate degrees in cultural anthropology from New Harvard. I decided to study a hot tribe in depth, and after some blandishments I got this one to accept me. I started out to educate them, too. Soon, though, they were deferring to me all over the place, wonderful for the ego. After a time, my studies, my social work, came to be of less and less importance. Well, I dare say you've read Heart of Darkness, you know what I mean. The local practices are so, well, basic. I found it much more stimulating to participate than to observe. I took it upon myself to redesign some of their grosser practices along more aesthetic lines. So I did really educate them, after all. They do things with ever so much style since I've come here. Things such as... Well, for one thing, they were simple cannibals before. For another, they were rather unsophisticated in their use of their captives prior to slaying them. Things like that are quite important. If they're done properly, they give you class, if you know what I mean. Here I was, with a wealth of customs, superstitions, taboos from many cultures, many eras, right here at my fingertips. He gestured again. Man, even half-man, hot-man, is a ritual-loving creature, and I knew ever so many rituals and things like that. So I put all of this to good use, and now I occupy a position of great honor and high esteem. What are you trying to tell me about us? I asked. Well, things are getting rather dull around here, he said, and the natives were waxing restless, so I decided it was time for another ceremony. I spoke with Procrustes, the war chief, and suggested he find us some prisoners. I believe it is on page 577 of the abridged edition of the Golden Bough that it states... The Tola Laki, notorious headhunters of central Celebes, drink the blood and eat the brains of their victims that they may become brave. The Italones of the Philippine Islands drink the blood of their slain enemies and eat part of the back of their heads and of their entrails raw to acquire their courage. Well, we have the tongue of a poet, the blood of two very formidable warriors, the brains of a very distinguished scientist, the bilious liver of a fiery politician, and the interesting colored flesh of a vegan, all in this one room here, quite a hall, I should say. You make yourself exceedingly clear, I observe. What of the women? 
All for them we'll work out a protracted fertility rite, ending in a protracted sacrifice. I see. That is to say, if we do not permit all of you to continue on your way unmolested. Oh? Yes, Procrustes likes to give people a chance to measure themselves against a standard, to be tested, and possibly to redeem themselves. He is most Christian in that respect. And true to his name, I suppose. Hassan came over and stood beside me, stared out through the grill work at Morbing. Oh, good, good, said Morby. Really, I'd like to keep you around a while, you know. You have a sense of humor. Most of the Corettis lack this adjunct to what are otherwise exemplary personalities. I could learn to like you. Don't bother. Tell me about the way of redemption, though. Yes, we are the wardens of the dead man. He is my most interesting creation. I am certain that one of you two shall realize this during your brief acquaintanceship with him. He glanced from me to Hassan, to me to Hassan. I know of him, I said. Tell me what must be done. You are called upon to bring forth a champion to do battle with him, this night, when he rises again from the dead. What is he? A vampire. Crap, what is he really? He is a genuine vampire, you'll see. Okay, have it your way. He's a vampire, and one of us will fight him. How? Catch as catch can, barehanded, and he isn't very difficult to catch. He'll just stand there and wait for you. He'll be very thirsty and hungry, too, poor fellow. And if he is beaten, do your prisoners go free? That is the rule, as I originally outlined it some sixteen or seventeen years ago. Of course, this contingency has never arisen. I see. You are trying to tell me he's tough. Oh, he's unbeatable. That's the fun of it. It wouldn't make for a good ceremony if it could end any other way. I tell the whole story of the battle before it takes place, and then my people witness it. It reaffirms their faith in destiny and my own close association with its workings. Hassan glanced at me. What does he mean, Karaji? It's a fixed fight, I told him. On the contrary, said Morby, it is not. It doesn't have to be. There was once an old saying on this planet in connection with an ancient sport, Never bet against the damn Yankees or you'll lose money. The dead man is unbeatable because he was born with a considerable amount of native ability upon which I have elaborated considerably. He has dined upon many champions, so of course his strength is equal to all of theirs. Everyone who's read Fraser knows that. He yawned, covering his mouth with a feathered wand. I must go to the barbecue area now to supervise the decking of the hall with boughs of holly. Decide upon your champion this afternoon, and I'll see you all this evening. Good day. Trip and break your neck. He smiled and left the shack. I called a meeting. Okay, I said. They've got a weird hot one called the dead man, who is supposed to be very tough. I am going to fight him tonight. If I can beat him, we are supposed to go free, but I wouldn't take Morby's word for anything. Therefore, we must plan an escape, else we will be served up on a chafing dish. Phil, do you remember the road to Volus? I asked. I think so. It's been a long time. But where are we now, exactly? If it is of any help, answered Mishtigo from beside the window, I see a glowing. It is not any color for which there is a word in your language, but it is off in that direction, he pointed. It is a color which I normally see in the vicinity of radioactive materials if the atmosphere is dense enough about them. It is spread over quite a large area. I moved to the window and stared in that direction. That could be the hot spot, then, I said. If that is the case, then they've actually brought us further along toward the coast, which is good. Was anyone conscious when we were brought here? No one answered. All right, then we'll operate under the assumption that that is the hot spot, and that we are very close to it. The road to Volus should be back that way, then, I pointed in the opposite direction. Since the sun is on this side of the shack, and it's afternoon, head in the other direction after you hit the road, away from the sunset. It might not be more than twenty-five kilometers. They will track us, said Dos Santos. There are horses, said Hassan. What? Up the street in a paddock. There were three near that rail earlier. They are back behind the edge of the building now. There may be more. They were not strong-looking horses, though. Can all of you ride? I asked. I have never ridden a horse, said Mishtigo. But the thrid is something similar. I have ridden thrid. Everyone else had ridden horses. Tonight, then, I said, ride double if you must. If there are more than enough horses, then turn the others loose. Drive them away. As they watch me fight the dead man, you will make a break for the paddock. Seize what weapons you can, and try to fight your way to the horses. 
Phil, get them up to Makranitsa and mention the name of Coronas anywhere. They will take you in and protect you. I'm sorry, said DeSantis, but your plan is not a good one. If you've got a better one, let's hear it, I told him. First of all, he said, we cannot really rely on Mr. Graber. While you were still unconscious, he was in great pain and very weak. George believes that he suffered a heart attack during or shortly after our fight with the Coretis. If anything happens to him, we are lost. We will need you to guide us out of here if we do succeed in breaking free. We cannot count on Mr. Graber. Second, he said, you are not the only man capable of fighting an exotic menace. Hassan will undertake the defeat of the dead man. I can't ask him to do that, I said. Even if he wins, he will probably be separated from us at the time, and they'll doubtless get to him pretty fast. It would most likely mean his life. You hired him to kill for you, not to die. I will fight him, Karaji, he said. You don't have to. But I wish to. How are you feeling now, Phil? I asked. Better, much better. I think it was just an upset stomach. Don't worry about it. Do you feel good enough to make it to Makranitsa on horseback? No trick at all. It will be easier than walking. I was practically born on horseback, you remember. Remember? asked Dos Santos. What do you mean by that, Mr. Graber? How could Conrad remem remember his famous ballads on horseback? said Redwig. What are you reading up to, Conrad? I'm in charge here, thank you, said I. I'm giving the orders, and I've decided I'll do the vampire fighting. In a situation like this, I think we ought to be a little more democratic about these life-and-death decisions, she replied. You were born in this country. No matter how good Phil's memory is, you'll do a better job of getting us from here to there in a hurry. You're not ordering Hassan to die or abandoning him. He's volunteering. I will kill the dead man, said Hassan, and I will follow after you. I know the ways of hiding myself from men. I will follow your trail. It's my job, I told him. Then, since we cannot agree, leave the decision to the fates, said Hassan, toss a coin. Very well. Did they take our money as well as our weapons? I have some change, said Ellen. Toss a piece into the air. She did. Heads, said I, as it fell toward the floor. Tails, she replied. Don't touch it. It was tails, all right, and there was a head on the other side, too. Okay, Hassan, you lucky fellow, you, I said. You just... One a do-it-yourself hero kit, complete with a monster. Good luck. He shrugged. It was written. He sat down then, his back against the wall, extracted a tiny knife from the sole of his left sandal, and began to pare his fingernails. He'd always been a pretty well-groomed killer. I guess cleanliness is next to diablerie or something like that. As the sun sank slowly in the west, Morby came to us again, bringing with him a contingent of Coretti swordsmen. The time has come, he stated. Have you decided upon your champion? Hassan will fight him, I said. Very good. Then come along. Please do not try anything foolish. I should hate to deliver damaged goods at a festival. Walking within a circle of blades, we left the shack and moved up the street to the village, passing by the paddock. Eight horses, heads low, stood within. Even in the diminishing light I could see that they were not very good horses. Their flanks were all covered with sores, and they were quite thin. Everyone glanced at them as we went by. The village consisted of about thirty shacks, such as the one in which we had been confined. It was a dirt road that we walked on, and it was full of ruts and rubbish. The whole place smelled of sweat and urine and rotten fruit and smoke. We went about eighty meters and turned left. It was the end of the street, and we moved along a downhill path into a big cleared compound. A fat, ball-headed woman with enormous breasts and a face that was a lava field of carcinoma was tending a low and dreadfully suggestive fire at the bottom of a huge barbecue pit. She smiled as we passed by and smacked her lips moistly. Great sharpened stakes lay on the ground about her. Up further ahead was a level area of hard-packed bare earth, a huge, vine-infested, tropic-type tree which had adapted itself to our climate stood at the one end of the field, and all about the field's peripheries were rows of eight-foot torches already waving great lengths of fire-like pennants. At the other end was the most elaborate shack of them all. It was about five meters high and ten across the front. It was painted bright red and covered all over with Pennsylvania hex signs. The entire middle section of the front wall was a high sliding door. Two armed Coretis stood guard before that door. The sun was a tiny piece of orange rind in the west. Morby marched us the length of the field toward the tree. Eighty to a hundred spectators were seated on the ground on the other side of the torches on each side of the field. Morby gestured, indicating the red shack. 
How do you like my home? he asked. Lovely, said I. I have a roommate, but he sleeps during the day. You're about to meet him. We reached the base of the big tree. Morby left us there, surrounded by his guards. He moved to the center of the field and began addressing the Coretis in Greek. We had agreed that we would wait until the fight was near its end, whichever way, and the tribesmen all excited and concentrating on the finale before we made our break. We'd pushed the women into the center of our group, and I managed to get on the left side of a right-handed swordsman whom I intended to kill quickly. Too bad that we were at the far end of the field. To get to the horses, we'd have to fight our way back through the barbecue area. And then on that night, Morby was saying, did the dead man rise up, smiting down this mighty warrior Hassan, breaking his bones and casting him about this place of feasting? Finally, did he kill this great enemy and drink the blood from his throat and eat of his liver raw and still smoking in the night air? These things did he do on that night. Mighty is his power. Mighty, oh mighty, cried the crowd, and someone began beating upon a drum. Now will we call him to life again, the crowd cheered. To life again, to life again, to life again. Hail, hail, sharp white teeth, sharp white teeth, white white skin, white white skin. Hands which break, hands which break, mouth which drinks, mouth which drinks. The blood of life, the blood of life. Great is our tribe, great is our tribe, great is the dead man, great is the dead man, great is the dead man, great is the dead man. They bellowed it at the last. Throats, human, half-human, and inhuman, heaved the brief litany like a tidal wave across the field. Our guards, too, were screaming it. Mishtiga was blocking his sensitive ears, and there was an expression of agony on his face. My head was ringing, too. Dos Santos crossed himself, and one of the guards shook his head at him and raised his blade meaningfully. Don shrugged and turned his head back toward the field. Morby walked up to the shack and struck three times upon the sliding door with his hand. One of the guards pushed it open for him. An immense black catafalque, surrounded by the skulls of men and animals, was set within. It supported an enormous casket made of dark wood and decorated with bright twisting lines. At Morby's directions, the guards raised the lid. For the next twenty minutes, he gave hypodermic injections to something within the casket. He kept his movements slow and ritualistic. One of the guards put aside his blade and assisted him. The drummers kept up a steady, slow cadence. The crowd was very silent, very still. Then Morby turned. Now the dead man rises, he announced. Rises, responded the crowd. Now he comes forth to accept the sacrifice. Now he comes forth. Come forth, dead man, he called, turning back to the catafalque, and he did, at great length, for he was big, huge, obese. Great indeed was the dead man, maybe three hundred and fifty pounds worth. He sat up in his casket and he looked all about him. He rubbed his chest, his armpits, his neck, his groin. He climbed out of the big box and stood beside the catafalque, dwarfing morbid. He was wearing only a loincloth and large goatskin sandals. His skin was white, dead white, fish-belly white, moon white, dead white. An albino, said George, and his voice carried the length of the field because it was the only sound in the night. Morby glanced in our direction and smiled. He took the dead man's stubby-fingered hand and led him out of the shack and onto the field. The dead man shied away from the torchlight. As he advanced, I studied the expression on his face. There is no intelligence in that face, said Redwig. Can you see his eyes? asked George, squinting. His glasses had been broken in the fray. Yes, they're pinkish. Does he have epicanthial folds? Mm, yeah. Uh-huh, he's a mongoloid, an idiot, I'll wager, which is why it was so easy for Morby to do what he's done with him. And look at his teeth, they look filed. I did. He was grinning because he'd seen the colorful top of Redwig's head. Lots of nice, sharp teeth were exposed. His albinism is the reason behind the nocturnal habits Morby has imposed. Look, he even flinches at the torchlight. He's ultra-sensitive to any sort of actinics. What about his dietary habits? Acquired through imposition. Lots of primitive people bled their cattle. The Kazakhs did it until the twentieth century, and the Todas. You saw the sores on those horses as we passed by the paddock. Blood is nourishing, you know, if you can learn to keep it down. And I'm sure Morby has regulated the idiot's diet since he was a child. So, of course, he's a vampire. He was brought up that way. The dead man is risen, said Morby. 
The dead man is risen, agreed the crowd. Great is the dead man. Great is the dead man. He dropped the dead white hand then and walked toward us, leaving the only genuine vampire we knew of grinning in the middle of the field. Great is the dead man, he said, grinning himself as he approached us. Rather magnificent, isn't he? What have you done to that poor creature? asked Redwig. Very little, replied Morby. He was born pretty well equipped. What were those injections you gave him? inquired George. Oh, I shoot his pain centers full of Novocaine before encounters such as this one. His lack of pain responses adds to the image of his invincibility. Also, I've given him a hormone shot. He's been putting on weight recently, and he's grown a bit sluggish. That compensates for it. You talk of him and treat him as though he's a mechanical toy, said Diane. He is an invincible toy, an invaluable one also. You there, Hassan, are you ready? he asked. I am, Hassan answered, removing his cloak and his burnous and handing them to Ellen. The big muscles in his shoulders bulged, his fingers flexed lightly, and he moved forward and out of the circle of blades. There was a welt on his left shoulder, several others on his back. The torchlight caught his beard and turned it to blood, and I could not help but remember that night back at the home for when he had enacted a strangling, and Mama Julie had said, Your friend is possessed of Angel Sue, and Angel Sue is a death god, and he only visits with his own. Great is the warrior Hassan, announced Morby, turning away from us. Great is the warrior Hassan, replied the crowd. His strength is that of many. His strength is that of many, the crowd repeated. Greater still is the dead man. Greater still is the dead man. He breaks his bones and casts him about this place of feasting. He breaks his bones. He eats his liver. He eats his liver. He drinks the blood from his throat. He drinks the blood from his throat. Mighty is his power. Mighty is his power. Great is the dead man. Great is the dead man. Tonight, said Hassan quietly, he becomes the dead man indeed. Dead man, cried Morby, as Hassan moved forward and stood before him, I give you this man Hassan in sacrifice. Then Morby got out of the way and motioned the guards to move us to the far sideline. The idiot grinned an even wider grin and reached out slowly toward Hassan. Bismala, said Hassan, making as if to turn away from him and bending downward unto the side. He picked it off the ground and brought it up and around fast and hard like a whiplash, a great heel of the hand blow, which landed on the left side of the dead man's jaw. The white, white head moved maybe five inches, and he kept on grinning. Then both of his short, bulky arms came out and caught Hassan beneath the armpits. Hassan seized his shoulders, tracing fine red furrows up his sides as he went, and he drew red beads from the places where his fingers dug into snow-capped muscle. The crowd screamed at the sight of the dead man's blood. Perhaps the smell of it excited the idiot himself, that of the screaming, because he raised Hassan two feet off the ground and ran forward with him. The big tree got in the way, and Hassan's head sagged as he struck. Then the dead man crashed into him, stepped back slowly, shook himself, and began to hit him. It was a real beating. He flailed at him with his almost grotesquely brief thick arms. Hassan got his hands up in front of his face, and he kept his elbows in the pit of his stomach. Still the dead man kept striking him on his sides and head. His arms just kept rising and falling, and he never stopped grinning. Finally Hassan's hands fell, and he clutched them before his stomach. And there was blood coming from the corners of his mouth. The invincible toy continued its game. And then, far, far off, on the other side of the night, so far that only I could hear it, there came a voice that I recognized. It was the great hunting howl of my hellhound Bortan. Somewhere he had come upon my trail, and he was coming now, running down the night, leaping like a goat, flowing like a horse or a river, all brindle-colored, and his eyes were glowing coals, and his teeth were buzzsaws. He never tired of running, my Bortan. Such as he are born without fear, given to the hunt, and sealed with death. My hellhound was coming, and nothing could halt him in his course. But he was far, so far off, on the other side of the night. The crowd was screaming. Hassan couldn't take much more of it. Nobody could. From the corner of my eye, the brown one, I noticed a tiny gesture of Ellen's. It was as though she had thrown something with her right hand. Two seconds later it happened. I looked away quickly from that point of brilliance that occurred sizzling behind the idiot. The dead man wailed, lost his grip. 
Good old Reg 237.1, promulgated by me. Every tour guide and every member of a tour must carry no fewer than three magnesium flares on his person while traveling. Ellen only had two left, that meant. Bless her. The idiot had stopped hitting his sand. He tried to kick the flare away. He screamed. He tried to kick the flare away. He covered his eyes. He rolled on the ground. Hassan watched, bleeding, panting. The flare burnt. The dead man screamed. Hassan finally moved. He reached up and touched one of the thick vines which hung from the tree. He tugged at it. It resisted. He pulled harder. It came loose. His movements were steadier as he twisted an end around each hand. The flare sputtered, grew bright again. He dropped to his knees beside the dead man, and with a quick motion he looped the vine about his throat. The flare sputtered again. He snapped it tight. The dead man fought to rise. Hassan drew the thing tighter. The idiot seized him about the waist. The big muscles in the assassin's shoulders grew into ridges. Perspiration mingled with the blood on his face. The dead man stood, raising Hassan with him. Hassan pulled harder. The idiot, his face no longer white but mottled and with the veins standing out like cords in his forehead and neck, lifted him up off the ground. As I lifted the golem, did the dead man raise Hassan, the vine cutting ever more deeply into his neck as he strained with all his inhuman strength. The crowd was wailing and chanting incoherently. The drumming, which had reached a frenzied throb, continued at its peak without let-up. And then I heard the howl again, still very far away. The flare began to die. The dead man swayed. Then, as a great spasm racked him, he threw Hassan away from him. The vine went slack about his throat as it tore free from Hassan's grip. Hassan took Ukemi and rolled to his knees. He stayed that way. The dead man moved toward him. Then his pace faltered. He began to shake all over. He made a gurgling noise and clutched at his throat. His face grew darker. He staggered to the tree and put forth a hand. He leaned there, panting. Soon he was gasping noisily. His hand slipped along the trunk and he dropped to the ground. He picked himself up again into a half-crouch. Hassan arose and recovered the piece of vine from where it had fallen. He advanced upon the idiot. This time his grip was unbreakable. The dead man fell and he did not rise again. It was like turning off a radio which had been playing at full volume. Click. Big silence then. It had all happened so fast. And tender was the night, yea, verily, as I reached out through it and broke the neck of the swordsman at my side and seized his blade. I turned then to my left and split the skull of the next one with it. Then, like click again and full volume back on, but all static this time. The night was torn down to the middle. Mishtigo dropped his man with a vicious rabbit punch and kicked another in the shins. George managed a quick knee to the groin of the one nearest him. Dos Santos, not so quick, or else just unlucky, took two bad cuts, chest and shoulder. The crowd rose up from where it had been scattered on the ground like a speed-up film of bean sprouts growing. It advanced upon us. Ellen threw Hassan's burnous over the head of the swordsman who was about to disembowel her husband. Earth's poet laureate then brought a rock down hard on the top of the burnous, doubtless collecting much bad karma, but not looking too worried about it. By then Hassan had rejoined our little group, using his hand to parry a sword cut by striking the flat of the blade in an old samurai maneuver. I had thought lost to the world forever. Then Hassan, too, had a sword, after another rapid movement, and he was very proficient with it. We killed or maimed all our guards before the crowd was halfway to us, and Diane, taking a cue from Ellen, lobbed her three magnesium flares across the field and into the mob. We ran then, Ellen and Redwig supporting Dos Santos, who was kind of staggering. But the Coretis had cut us off, and we were running northwards, off at a tangent from our goal. We cannot make it, Karaji, called Hassan. I know, unless you and I delay them while the others go ahead. Okay, where? At the far barbecue pit, where the trees are thick about the path, it is a bottle's neck. They will not be able to hit us all at a time. Right, I turn to the others. You hear us? Make for the horses. Phil will guide you. Hassan and I will hold them for as long as we can. Redwig turned her head and began to say something. Don't argue. Go. You want to live, don't you? They did. They went. Hassan and I turned there beside the barbecue pit, and we waited. The others cut back again, going off to the woods, heading toward the village and the paddock. The mob kept right on coming toward Hassan and me. 
The first wave hit us, and we began the killing. We were in the V-shaped place where the path disgorged from the woods onto the plain. To our left was a smoldering pit, to our right a thick stand of trees. We killed three, and several more were bleeding when they fell back, paused, then moved to flank us. We stood back to back then, and cut them as they closed. If even one has a gun, we are dead, Karaji. I know. Another half-man fell to my blade. Hassan sent one, screaming into the pit. They were all about us then. A blade slipped in past my guard and cut me on the shoulder. Another nicked my thigh. Fall back, thou fools, I say withdraw, thou freaks. At that they did, moving back beyond thrust range. The man who had spoken was about five and a half feet tall. His lower jaw moved like that of a puppet's, as though on hinges, and his teeth were like a row of dominoes, all dark stained and clicking as they opened and closed. Yea, Procrustes, I heard one say, fetch nets, snare them alive, do not close with them, they have cost us too much already. Morby was at his side, and whimpering, I did not know, my lord. Silence, thou brewer of ill-tasting sloshes, thou hast cost us a god and many men. Shall we rush? asked Hazan. No, but be ready to cut the nets when they bring them. It is not good that they want us alive, he decided. We have sent many to hell to smooth our way, said I, and we are standing yet and holding blades. What more? If we rush them, we can take two, maybe four more with us. If we wait, they will net us and we die without them. What matters it once you are dead? Let us wait. So long as we live, there is the great peacock tail of probability growing from out of the next moment, as you say. And they found nets and cast them. We cut three of them apart before they tangled us in the fourth. They drew them tight and moved in. I felt my blade wrench from my grasp, and someone kicked me. It was Morbin. Now you will die as very few die, said he. Did the others escape? Only for the moment, he said. We will track them, find them, and bring them back. I laughed. You lose, I said. They'll make it. He kicked me again. This is how your rule applies, I asked. Hassan conquered the dead man. He cheated. The woman threw a flare. Procrestes came up beside him as they bound us within the nets. Let us take them to the Valley of Sleep, said Morby, and there work our wills with them and leave them to be preserved against future feasting. It is good, said Procrustes. Yes, it shall be done. Hassan must have been working his left arm through the netting all that while, because it shot out a short distance, and his nails raked Procrustes' leg. Procrustes kicked him several times, and me once more for good measure. He rubbed at the scratches on his calf. Why do you do that, Hassan? I asked, after Procrustes turned away and ordered us bound to barbecue steaks for carrying. There may still be some metacyanide left on my fingernails, he explained. How did it get there? From the bullets in my belt, Karaji, which they did not take from me. I coated my nails after I sharpened them today. Ah, you scratched the dead man at the beginning of your bout. Yes, Karaji, then it was simply a matter of my staying alive until he fell over. You are an exemplary assassin, Hassan. Thank you, Karaji. We were bound to the stake, still netted. Four men at the order of Procrustes raised us. Morby and Procrustes leading the way, we were borne off through the night. As we moved along an uneven trail, the world changed about us. It's always that way when you approach a hot spot. It's like hiking backward through geological eras. The trees along the way began to vary more and more. Finally, we were passing up a moist aisle between dark towers with fern-like leaves, and things peered out through them with slitted yellow eyes. High overhead, the night was a tarp stretched tent-wise across the treetops, pricked with faint star marks, torn with a jagged yellow crescent of a tear. Bird-like cries ending in snorts emerged from the great wood. Up further ahead, a dark shape crossed the pathway. As we advanced along the way, the trees grew smaller, the spaces between them wider. But they were not like the trees we had left beyond the village. They were twisted and twisting forms, with seaweed swirls of branches, gnarled trunks, and exposed roots, which crept slowly about the surface of the ground. Tiny invisible things made scratching noises as they scurried from the light of Morby's electric lantern. By turning my head, I could detect a faint pulsating glow just at the border of the visible spectrum. It was coming from up ahead. A profusion of dark vines appeared underfoot. They writhed whenever one of our bearers stepped on them. The trees became simple ferns. Then these two vanished. 
Great quantities of shaggy, blood-colored lichens replaced them. They grew over all the rocks. They were faintly luminous. There were no more animal sounds. There were no sounds at all, save for the panting of our forebearers, the footfalls, and the occasional muffled click as Procrustes automatic rifle struck a padded rock. Our bearers wore blades in their belts. Morby carried several blades as well as a small pistol. The trail turned sharply upward. One of our bearers swore. The night tent was jerked downward at its corners then. It met with the horizon, and it was filled with a hint of a purple haze, fainter than exhaled cigarette smoke. Slow, very high, and slapping the air like a devilfish coasting on water, the dark form of a spider bat crossed over the face of the moon. Procrustes fell. Morby helped him to his feet, but Procrustes swayed and leaned upon him. What ails you, Lord? A sudden dizziness, numbness in my members. Take down my rifle, it grows heavy. Hassan chuckled. Procrustes turned toward Hassan, his puppet jaw dropping open. Then he dropped too. Morby had just taken the rifle and his hands were full. The guard set us down rather urgently and rushed to Procrustes' side. Hast thou any water, he asked, and he closed his eyes. He did not open them again. Morby listened to his chest, held the feathery part of his wand beneath his nostrils. He is dead, he finally announced. Dead? The bearer who was covered with scales began to weep. He was good, he sobbed. He was a great war chief. What will we do now? He is dead, Morby repeated, and I am your leader until a new war chief is declared. Wrap him in your cloaks. Leave him on that flat rock up ahead. No animals come here, so we will not be molested. We will recover him on the way back. Now, though, we must have our vengeance on these two. He gestured with his wand. The valley of sleep is near at hand. You have taken the pills I gave you? Yes, 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 yes. Very good. Take your cloaks now and wrap him. They did this, and soon we were raised again and borne to the top of a ridge from which a trail ran down into a fluorescent pot-blasted pit. The great rocks of the place seemed almost to be burning. This, I said to Hassan, was described to me by my son as the place where the thread of my life lies across a burning stone. He saw me as threatened by the dead man, but the fates thought twice and gave that menace unto you. Back when I was but a dream in the mind of death, this site was appointed as one of the places where I might die. To fall from shin back is to roast, said Hassan. They carried us down into the fissure, dropped us on the rocks, Morby released the safety catch on the rifle and stepped back. Release the Greek and tie him to that column, he gestured with the weapon. They did this, binding my hands and feet securely. The rock was smooth, damp, killing without indication. They did the same to Hassan, about eight feet to my right. Morby had set down the lantern so that it cast a yellow semicircle about us. The four Coretis were demon statues at his side. He smiled. He leaned the rifle against the rocky wall behind him. This is the valley of sleep, he told us. Those who sleep here do not awaken. It keeps the meat preserved, however, providing us against the lean years. Before we leave you, though, his eyes turned to me, do you see where I have set the rifle? I did not answer him. I believe your entrails will stretch that far, Commissioner. At any rate, I intend to find out. He drew a dagger from his belt and advanced upon me. The four half-men moved with him. Who do you think has more guts, he asked, you or the Arab? Neither of us replied. You shall both get to see for yourselves, he said, through his teeth. First you. He jerked my shirt free and cut it down the front. He rotated the blade in a slow, significant circle about two inches away from my stomach, all the while studying my face. You are afraid, he said. Your face does not show it yet, but it will. Then look at me. I am going to put the blade in very slowly. I am going to dine on you one day. What do you think of that? I laughed. It was suddenly worth laughing at. His face twisted, then it straightened into a momentary look of puzzlement. Has the fear driven you mad, Commissioner? Feathers or lead? I asked him. He knew what it meant. He started to say something, and then he heard a pebble click about twelve feet away. His head snapped in that direction. He spent the last second of his life screaming as the force of Bortan's leap poked him against the ground before his head was snatched from his shoulders. My hellhound had arrived. 
The Coretti scream, for his eyes are glowing coals and his teeth are buzzsaws. His head is as high above the ground as a tall man's. Although they seized their blades and struck at him, his sides are as the sides of an armadillo. A quarter ton of dog, my Bortan. He is not exactly the kind Albert Payson Terhune wrote about. He worked for the better part of a minute, and when he was finished, they were all in pieces and none of them alive. What is it? asked Hassan. A puppy I found in a sack washed up on the beach, too tough to drown. My dog, said I, Bortan. There was a small gash in the softer part of his shoulder. He had not gotten it in the fight. He sought us first in the village, I said, and they tried to stop him. Many Coretis have died this day. He trotted up and licked my face. He wagged his tail, made dog noises, wriggled like a puppy, and ran in small circles. He sprang toward me and licked my face again. Then he was off, cavorting once more, treading on pieces of Coretis. It is good for a man to have a dog, said Hassan. I have always been fond of dogs. Bortan was sniffing him as he said it. You've come back, you dirty old hound, I told him. Don't you know that dogs are extinct? He wagged his tail, came up to me again, licked my hand. I'm sorry that I can't scratch your ears. You know that I'd like to, though, don't you? He wagged his tail. I opened and closed my right hand within its bonds. I turned my head that way as I did it. Bortan watched, his nostrils moist and quivering. Hands, Bortan, I need hands to free me, hands to loosen my bonds. You must fetch them, Bortan, and bring them here. He picked up an arm that was lying on the ground, and he deposited it at my feet. He looked up then and wagged his tail. No, Bortan, live hands, friendly hands, hands to untie me. You understand, don't you? He licked my hand. Go and find hands to free me, still attached and living, the hands of friends. Now quickly go. He turned and walked away, paused, looked back once, then mounted the trail. Does he understand? asked Hassan. I think so, I told him. His is not an ordinary dog brain, and he has had many, many more years than even the lifetime of a man in which to learn understanding. Then let us hope he finds someone quickly before we sleep. Yes. We hung there, and the night was cold. We waited for a long time. Finally, we lost track of time. Our muscles were cramped and aching. We were covered with the dried blood of countless little wounds. We were all over bruises. We were groggy from fatigue, from lack of sleep. We hung there, the ropes cutting into us. Do you think they will make it to your village? We gave them a good start. I think they have a decent chance. It is always difficult to work with you, Karaji. I know. I have noticed the same thing myself. Like the summer we rotted in the dungeons of Corsica. I, or our march to the Chicago station after we had lost all our equipment in Ohio. Yes, that was a bad year. You are always in trouble, though, Karaji. Born to not the tiger's tail, he said. That is the saying for people such as you. They are difficult to be with. Myself, I love the quiet and the shade, a book of poems, my pipe. Hush, I hear something. There was a clatter of hooves. A satyr appeared beyond the cockeyed angle of light from the fallen lantern. He moved nervously, his eyes going from me to Hassan and back again and up, down, around, and past us. Help us, little horny one, said I in Greek. He advanced carefully. He saw the blood, the mangled caretes. He turned as if to flee. Come back, I need you. It is I, the player of the pipes. He stopped and turned again, his nostrils quivering, flaring and falling. His pointed ears twitched. He came back, a pained expression on his near-human face, as he passed through the place of gore. The blade at my feet, I said, gesturing with my eyes. Pick it up. He did not seem to like the notion of touching anything man-made, especially a weapon. I whistled the last lines of my last tune. It's late, it's late, so late. His eyes grew moist. He wiped at them with the backs of his shaggy wrists. Pick up the blade and cut my bonds. Pick it up. Not that way. You'll cut yourself. The other end. Yes. He picked it up properly and looked at me. I moved my right hand. The ropes. Cut them. He did. It took him twenty minutes and left me wearing a bracelet of blood. I had to keep moving my hand to keep him from slashing an artery, but he freed it and looked at me expectantly. Now give me the knife and I'll take care of the rest. He placed the blade in my extended hand. I took it. Seconds later I was free. Then I freed Hassan. When I turned again, the satyr was gone. I heard the sound of frantic hoofbeats in the distance. The devil has forgiven me, said Hassan. 
We went far away from the hot spot as fast as we could, skirting the Coretti village and continuing northward until we came upon a trail that I recognized as the road to Volos. Whether Bortan had found the satyr and had somehow conned him into coming to us, or whether the creature had spotted us himself and remembered me, was something of which I couldn't be sure. Bortan had not returned, though, so I had a feeling it was the latter case. The closest friendly town was Volos, a probable twenty-five kilometers to the east. If Bortan had gone there, where he would be recognized by many of my relatives, it would still be a long while before his return. My sending him after help had been a last-ditch sort of thing. If he'd tried elsewhere than Volos, then I'd no idea when he'd be back. He'd find my trail, though, and he'd follow it again. We pushed on, putting as much road as possible behind us. After about ten kilo, we were staggering. We knew that we couldn't make it much further without rest, so we kept our eyes open for a possible safe sleep site. Finally, I recognized a steep rocky hill where I had herded sheep as a boy. The small shepherd's cave, three-quarters of the way up the slope, was dry and vacant. The wooden façade that faced it was fallen to decay, but it still functioned. We pulled some clean grass for bedding, secured the door, and stretched out within. In a moment, Hassan was snoring. My mind spun for a second before it drifted, and in that second I knew that of all pleasures, a drink of cold water when you are thirsty, liquor when you are not, sex, a cigarette after many days without one, there is none of them can compare with sleep. Sleep is best. I might say that if our party had taken the long way from La Mia to Volos, the coastal road, the whole thing might never have happened the way that it did, and Phil might be alive today. But I can't really judge all that occurred in this case. Even now, looking back, I can't say how I'd rearrange events if it were all to be done over again. The forces of final disruption were already goose-stepping amidst the ruins, arms upraised. We made it to Volos the following afternoon, and on up Mount Pelion to Portaria. Across a deep ravine lay Makranitsa. We crossed over and found the others. Phil had guided them to Makranitsa, asked for a bottle of wine and his copy of Prometheus Unbound, and had sat up with the two well into the evening. In the morning Diane had found him, smiling and cold. I built him a pyre amidst the cedars near the ruined Episcopi, because he did not want to be buried. I heaped it with incense, with aromatic herbs, and it was twice the height of a man. That night it would burn, and I would say goodbye to another friend. It seems, looking back, that my life has mainly been a series of arrivals and departures. I say hello, I say goodbye, only the earth endures. Hell. So I walked with the group that afternoon, out to Pagasy, the port of ancient Iolcus, set on the promontory opposite Volos. We stood in the shade of the almond trees on the hill that gives good vantage to both seascape and rocky ridge. It was from here that the Argonauts set sail on their quest for the Golden Fleece, I told no one in particular. Who all were they? asked Ellen. I read the story in school, but I forget. There was Heracles and Theseus and Orpheus the singer, and Asclepius and the sons of the North Wind, and Jason the captain, who was a pupil of the centaur Chiron, whose cave, incidentally, is up near the summit of Mount Pelion there. Really? I'll show it to you sometime. All right. The gods and the titans battled near here also, said Diane, coming up on my other side. Did the titans not uproot Mount Pelion and pile it atop Asa in an attempt to scale Olympus? So goes the telling, but the gods were kind and restored the scenery after the bloody battle. A sail, said Hassan, gesturing with a half-peeled orange in his hand. I looked out over the waters, and there was a tiny blip on the horizon. Yes, this place is still used as a port. Perhaps it is a shipload of heroes, said Ellen, returning with some more fleece. What will they do with all that fleece, anyhow? It's not the fleece that's important, said Redwig. It's the getting of it. Every good storyteller used to know that. The women folk can always make stunning garments from fleeces. They're used to picking up the remains after quests. It wouldn't match your hair, dear. Yours either, child. That can be changed, not so easily as yours, of course. Across the way, said I, in a loud voice, is a ruined Byzantine church, the Episcopi, which I've scheduled for restoration in another two years. It is the traditional site of the wedding feast of Peleus, also one of the Argonauts, and the sea nymph Thetis. Perhaps you've heard the story of that feast. 
Everyone was invited but the goddess of discord, and she came anyhow and tossed down a golden apple marked for the fairest. Lord Paris judged at the property of Aphrodite, and the fate of Troy was sealed. The last time anyone saw Paris, he was none too happy. Ah, decisions. Like I've often said, this land is lousy with myth. How long will we be here? asked Ellen. I'd like a couple more days in Macronitsa, I said. Then we'll head northward. Say about a week more in Greece, and then we'll move on to Rome. No, said Mishtigo, who had been sitting on a rock and talking to his machine as he stared out over the waters. No, the tour is finished. This is the last stop. How come? I'm satisfied, and I'm going home now. What about your book? I've got my story. What kind of story? I'll send you an autographed copy when it's finished. My time is precious, and I have all the material I want now. All that I'll need, anyhow. I called the port this morning, and they are sending me a skimmer tonight. You people go ahead and do whatever you want, but I'm finished. Is something wrong? No, nothing is wrong, but it's time that I left. I have much to do. He rose to his feet and stretched. I have some packing to take care of, so I'll be going back now. You do have a beautiful country here, Conrad, despite... Uh, I'll see you all at dinner time. He turned and headed down the hill. I walked a few steps in his direction, watching him go. I wonder what prompted that, I thought aloud. There was a footfall. He is dying, said George softly. My son Jason, who had preceded us by several days, was gone. Neighbors told of his departure for Hades on the previous evening. The patriarch had been carried off on the back of a fire-eyed hellhound who had knocked down the door of his dwelling place and borne him off through the night. My relatives all wanted me to come to dinner. Dos Santos was still resting. George had treated his wounds and had not deemed it necessary to ship him to the hospital in Athens. It's always nice to come home. I walked down to the square and spent the afternoon talking to my descendants. Would I tell them of Toller, of Haiti, of Athens? Aye, I would, I did. Would they tell me of the past two decades in Macronitsa? Ditto. I took some flowers to the graveyard then, stayed a while, and went to Jason's home and repaired his door with some tools I found in the shed. Then I came upon a bottle of his wine and drank it all, and I smoked a cigar. I made me a pot of coffee, too, and I drank all of that. I still felt depressed. I didn't know what was coming off. George knew his diseases, though, and he said the vegan showed unmistakable symptoms of a neurological disorder of the E.T. variety, incurable, invariably fatal. And even Hassan couldn't take credit for it. Etiology unknown was George's diagnosis. So everything was revised. George had known about Mishtigo since the reception, what had set him on the track. Phil had asked him to observe the vegan for signs of a fatal disease. Why? Well, he hadn't said why, and I couldn't go ask him at the moment. I had me a problem. Mistigo had either finished his job, or he hadn't enough time left to do it. He said he'd finished it. If he hadn't, then I'd been protecting a dead man all the while, to no end. If he had, then I needed to know the results, so that I could make a very fast decision concerning what remained of his lifespan. Dinner was no help. Mishtigo had said all he cared to say, and he ignored or parried our questions. So, as soon as we'd had our coffee, Redwig and I stepped outside for a cigarette. What happened? she asked. I don't know. I thought maybe you did. No? What now? You tell me. Kill him? Perhaps yes. First, though, why? He's finished it. What? Just what has he finished? How should I know? Damn it, I have to. I like to know why I'm killing somebody. I'm funny that way. Funny? Very. Obvious, isn't it? The vegans want to buy in again, Earthside. He's going back to give them a report on the sites they're interested in. Then why didn't he visit them all? Why cut it short after Egypt and Greece? Sand, rocks, jungles, and assorted monsters, that's all he saw. Hardly makes for an encouraging appraisal. Then he's scared, is why, and lucky he's alive. He could have been eaten by a boadile or coretti. He's running. Good, then let him run. Let him hand in a bad report. He can't, though. If they do want in, they won't buy anything that sketchy. They'll just send somebody else, somebody tougher, to finish it. If we kill Mishtigo, they'll know we're still for real, still protesting, still tough ourselves. And he's not afraid for his life, I mused. No, what then? I don't know. I have to find out, though. 
How? I think I'll ask him. You are a lunatic. She turned away. My way or not at all, I said. Anyway, then, it doesn't matter. We've already lost. I took her by the shoulders and kissed her neck. Not yet. You'll see. She stood stiffly. Go home, she said. It's late. It's too late. I did that. I went back to Ayakov Koroni's big old place where Mishtigo and I were both quartered and where Phil had been staying. I stopped there in the death room in the place where Phil had last slept. His Prometheus Unbound was still on the writing table, set down beside an empty bottle. He had spoken of his own passing when he'd called me in Egypt and he had suffered an attack, had been through a lot. It seemed he'd leave a message for an old friend then on a matter like this. So I opened Percy B.'s dud epic and looked within. It was written on the blank pages at the end of the book in Greek, not modern Greek, though, classical. It went something like this. Dear friend, although I abhor writing anything, I cannot rewrite. I feel I had best tend to this with dispatch. I am unwell. George wants me to skim to Athens. I will, too, in the morning. First, though, regarding the matter at hand, get the vegan off the earth alive at any cost. It is important. It is the most important thing in the world. I was afraid to tell you before, because I thought Mishtigo might be a telepath. That is why I did not go along for the entire journey, though I should dearly have loved to do so. That is why I pretended to hate him, so that I could stay away from him as much as possible. It was only after I managed to confirm the fact that he was not telepathic that I elected to join him. I suspected what with Dos Santos, Diane, and Hassan, that the Rad Paul might be out for his blood. If he was a telepath, I figured he would learn of this quickly and do whatever needed to be done to assure his safety. If he was not a telepath, I still had great faith in your ability to defend him against almost anything, Hassan included. But I did not want him apprised of my knowledge. I did try to warn you, though, if you recall. Tatrim Ishtigo, his grandfather, is one of the finest, most noble creatures alive. He is a philosopher, a great writer, an altruistic administrator of services to the public. I became acquainted with him during my stay on Toller thirty-some years ago, and we later became close friends. We have been in communication ever since that time, and that far back even was I advised by him of the Vegan Combine's plans regarding the disposition of Earth. I was also sworn to secrecy. Even court cannot know that I am aware. The old man would lose faith, disastrously, if this thing came out ahead of time. The Vegans are in a very embarrassing position. Our expatriate countrymen have forced their own economic and cultural dependence upon Vega. The Vegans were made aware, quite vividly, during the days of the Radpole Rebellion, of the fact that there is an indigenous population possessing a strong organization of its own and desiring the restoration of our planet. The Vegans, too, would like to see this happen. They do not want the Earth, whatever for. If they want to exploit Earth folk, they have more of them on Taller than we do here on Earth, and they're not doing it, not massively or maliciously at any rate. Our ex-pop has elected what labor exploitation it does undergo in preference to returning here. What does this indicate? Returnism is a dead issue. No one is coming back. That is why I quit the movement. Why you did too, I believe. The vegans would like to get the home world problem off their hands. Sure, they want to visit it. It is instructive, sobering, humbling, and downright frightening for them to come here and see what can be done to a world. What needed to be done was for them to find a way around our ex-pop gov on Tala. The Tallerites were not anxious to give up their only claim for taxes and existence, the office. After much negotiation, though, and much economic suasion, including the offer of full vegan citizenship to our ex-pop, it appeared that a means had been found. The implementation of the plan was given into the hands of the Stigo Gens, Tatrum in especial. He finally found a way, he believed, of returning the earth proper to an autonomous position and preserving its cultural integrity. That is why he sent his grandson, Court, to do his survey. Court is a strange creature. His real talent is acting. All the Stigo are quite gifted, and he loves to pose. I believe that he wanted to play the part of an alien very badly, and I am certain that he has carried it with skill and efficiency. Tatrum also advised me that it would be Court's last role. He is dying of Drinfan, which is incurable. Also, I believe it is the reason he was chosen. Believe me, 
Constantine, Caragiosus, Coronis, Nomikos, and all the others which I do not know, Conrad, when I say that he was not surveying real estate, no. But allow me one last Byronic gesture. Take my word that he must live, and let me keep my promise and my secret. You will not regret it when you know all. I am sorry that I never got to finish your elegy, and damn you for keeping my Lara that time in Kirch. Phil. Very well, then, I decided life, not death, for the vegan. Phil had spoken, and I did not doubt his words. I went back to Mikar Coronis's dinner table and stayed with Mishtigo until he was ready to leave. I accompanied him back to Ayakov Coronis and watched him pack some final items. We exchanged maybe six words during this time. His belongings we carried out to the place where the skimmer would land in front of the house. Before the others, including Hassan, came up to bid him goodbye, he turned to me and said, Tell me, Conrad, why are you tearing down the pyramid? To needle Vega, I said, to let you know that if you want this place and you do manage to take it away from us, you'll get it in worse shape than it was after the three days. There wouldn't be anything left to look at. We'd burn the rest of our history, not even a scrap for you guys. The air escaping from the bottom of his lungs came out with a high-pitched whine, the vegan equivalent of a sigh. Commendable, I suppose, he said, but I did so want to see it. Do you think you could ever get it back together again, soon, perhaps? What do you think? I noticed your men marking many of the pieces. I shrugged. I have only one serious question, then, about your fondness for destruction, he stated. What is that? Is it really art? Go to hell. Then the others came up. I shook my head slowly at Diane and seized Hassan's wrist long enough to tear away a tiny needle he'd taped to the palm of his hand. I let him shake hands with the vegan, too, then, briefly. The skimmer buzzed down out of the darkening sky, and I saw Mishtigo aboard, loaded his baggage personally, and closed the door myself. It took off without incident and was gone in a matter of moments. End of a nothing joint. I went back inside and changed my clothing. It was time to burn a friend. Heaped high into the night, my ziggurat of logs bore what remained of the poet, my friend. I kindled a torch and put out the electric lantern. Hassan stood at my side. He had helped bear the corpse to the cart and had taken over the reins. I had built the pyre on the cypress-filled hill above Volus, near the ruins of that church I mentioned earlier. The waters of the bay were calm, the sky was clear, and the stars were bright. Dos Santos, who did not approve of cremation, had decided not to attend, saying that his wounds were troubling him. Diane had elected to remain with him back in Macredica. She had not spoken to me since our last conversation. Ellen and George were seated on the bed of the cart, which was backed beneath a large cypress, and they were holding hands. They were the only others present. Phil would not have liked my relatives wailing their dirges about him. He'd once said he wanted something big, bright, fast, and without music. I applied the torch to a corner of the pyre. The flame bit slowly, began to chew at the wood. Hassan started another torch going, stuck it into the ground, and stepped back and watched. As the flames ate their way upwards, I prayed the old prayers and poured out wine upon the ground. I heaped aromatic herbs onto the blaze. Then I, too, stepped back. Whatever you were, death has taken you to, I told him. You have gone to see the moist flower open along Acheron among hell's shadows darting fitfully. Had you died young, your passing would have been mourned as the destruction of a great talent before its fulfillment. But you lived, and they cannot say that now. Some choose a short and supernal life before the walls of their Troy, others a long and less troubled one. But who is to say which is the better? The gods did keep their promise of immortal fame to Achilles by inspiring the poet to sing him an immortal paean. But is he the happier for it, being now as dead as yourself? I cannot judge, old friend. Lesser bard, I remember some of the words you two wrote of the mightiest of the archives and of the time of hard-hurled deaths. Bleak disappointments rage this coming-together place, menace of size and a jeopardy of time. But the ashes do not burn backward to timber. Flames' invisible music shapes the air to heat, but the day is no longer. Fare thee well, Philip Graver. May the lords, Phoebus and Dionysius, who do love and kill their poets, commend thee to their dark brother Hades. And may his Persephone, queen of the night, look with favor upon thee and grant thee high stead and Elysium. Goodbye. The flames had almost reached the top. 
I saw Jason then standing beside the cart, Bortan seated by his side. I backed away further. Bortan came to me and sat down on my right. He licked my hand once. Mighty hunter, we have lost us another, I said. He nodded his great head. The flames reached the top and began to nibble at the night. The air was filled with sweet aromas and the sound of fire. Jason approached. Father, he said, he bore me to the place of burning rocks, but you had already escaped. I nodded. A no-man friend freed us from that place. Before that, this man Hassan destroyed the dead man, so your dreams have thus far proved both right and wrong. He is the yellow-eyed warrior of my vision, he said. I know, but that part too is past. What of the black beast? Not a snort, not a snuffle. Good. We watched for a long, long time as the night retreated into itself. At several points, Bortan's ears pricked forward and his nostrils dilated. George and Ellen had not moved. Hassan was a stranger-eyed watcher without expression. What will you do now, Hassan? I asked. Go again to Mount Sinjar, he said, for a while. And then? He shrugged. Howsoever it is written, he replied. And a fearsome noise came upon us then, like the groans of an idiot giant, and the sound of splintering trees accompanied it. Bortan leaped to his feet and howled. The donkeys who had drawn the cart shifted uneasily. One of them made a brief braying noise. Jason clutched the sharpened staff which he had picked from the heap of kindling, and he stiffened. It burst in upon us then, there in the clearing, big and ugly, and everything it had ever been called. The eater of men, the shaker of the earth, the mighty foul one, the black beast of Thessaly. Finally, someone could say what it really was, if they got away to say it, that is. It must have been drawn to us by the odor of burning flesh, and it was big, the size of an elephant at least. What was Heracles' fourth labor? The wild boar of Arcadia, that's what. I suddenly wished Herc was still around to help. A big pig, a razorback with tusks the length of a man's arm, little pig eyes black and rolling in the firelight wildly. It knocked down trees as it came. It squealed, though, as Hassan drew a burning brand from the blaze and drove it fire end forward into its snout and then spun away. It swerved, too, which gave me time to snatch Jason's staff. I ran forward and caught it in the left eye with it. It swerved again then and squealed like a leaky boiler and Bortan was upon it, tearing at its shoulder. Neither of my two thrusts at its throat did more than superficial damage. It wrestled shoulder against fang, and finally shook itself free of Bortan's grip. Hassan was at my side by then, waving another firebrand. It charged us. From somewhere off to the side, George emptied a machine pistol into it. Hassan hurled the torch. Bortan leapt again, this time from its blind side and these things caused it to swerve once more in its charge, crashing into the now-empty cart and killing both donkeys. I ran against it then, thrusting the staff up under its left front leg. The staff broke in two. Bortan kept biting, and his snarl was a steady thunder. Whenever it slashed at him with its tusks, he relinquished his grip, danced away, and moved in again to worry it. I am sure that my needlepoint death lance of steel would not have broken, it had been aboard the vanity, though. Hassan and I circled it with the sharpest and most stake-like of the kindling we could find. We kept jabbing to keep it turning in a circle. Bortan kept trying for its throat, but the great snouted head stayed low, and the one eye rolled and the other bled, and the tusks slashed back and forth and up and down like swords. Cloven hooves the size of bread loaves tore great holes in the ground as it turned counterclockwise, trying to kill us all there in the orange and dancing flame light. Finally it stopped and turned, suddenly, for something that big, and its shoulder struck Bortan in the side and hurled him ten or twelve feet past me. Hassan hit it across the back with his stick, and I drove in toward the other eye, but missed. Then it moved toward Bortan, who was still regaining his feet, its head held low, tusks gleaming. I threw my staff and leapt as it moved in on my dog. It had already dropped its head for the death blow. I caught both tusks as the head descended almost to the ground. Nothing could hold back that scooping slash, I realized, as I bore down upon it with all my strength. But I tried, and maybe I succeeded somehow for a second. At least, 
As I was thrown through the air, my hands torn and bleeding, I saw that Bortan had managed to get back out of the way. I was dazed by the fall, for I had been thrown far and high, and I heard a great pig-mad squealing. Hassan screamed, and Bortan roared out his great-throated battle challenge once more, and the hot red lightning of Zeus descended twice from the heavens, and all was still. I climbed back slowly to my feet. Hassan was standing by the blazing pyre of flaming stakes still upraised in spear-throwing position. Bortan was sniffing at the quivering mountain of flesh. Cassandra was standing beneath the cypress beside a dead donkey, her back against the trunk of the tree, wearing leather trousers, a blue woolen shirt, a faint smile, and my still-smoking elephant gun. Cassandra! She dropped the gun and looked very pale, but I had her in my arms almost before it hit the ground. I'll ask you a lot of things later, I said. Not now, nothing now. Let's just sit here beneath this tree and watch the fire burn. And we did. A month later, Dos Santos was ousted from the Radpole. He and Diane have not been heard of since. Rumor has it that they gave up on returnism, moved to Toller, and are living there now. I hope it's not true, what with the affairs of these past five days. I never did know the full story on Redwig, and I guess I never will. If you trust a person, really trust him, I mean, and you care for him, as she might have cared for me, it would seem you'd stick around to see whether he was right or wrong on your final big disagreement. She didn't, though, and I wonder if she regrets it now. I don't really think I'll ever see her again. Slightly after the Radpole shake-up, Hassan returned from Mount Sinjar, stayed a while at the port, then purchased a small ship and put out to sea early one morning without even saying goodbye or giving any indication as to his destination. It was assumed he'd found new employment somewhere. There was a hurricane, though, several days later, and I heard rumors in Trinidad to the effect that he had been washed up on the coast of Brazil and met with his death at the hands of the fierce tribesmen who dwell there. I tried but was unable to verify this story. However, two months later, Ricardo Bonaventura, chairman of the Alliance Against Progress, a Radpole splinter group which had fallen into disfavor with Athens, died of apoplexy during a party function. There were some murmurings of divban rabbit venom in the anchovies, an exceedingly lethal combination, George assures me, and the following day the new captain of the palace guard vanished mysteriously along with a skimmer and the minutes of the last three secret sessions of the AAP, not to mention the contents of a small wall safe. He was said to have been a big yellow-eyed man with a slightly eastern cast to his features. Jason is still herding his many-legged sheep in the high places up where the fingers of Aurora come first to smear the sky with roses, and doubtless he is corrupting youth with his song. Ellen is pregnant again, all delicate and big-waisted, and won't talk to anybody but George. George wants to try some fancy embryo surgery now before it's too late, and make his next kid a water breather as well as an air breather, because of all that big virgin frontier down underneath the ocean where his descendants can pioneer, and him be father to a new race and write an interesting book on the subject and all that. Ellen is not too hot on the idea, though, so I have a hunch the oceans will remain virgin a little longer. Oh, yes, I did take George to Capistrano some time ago to watch the spider bats return. It was real impressive, them darkening the sky with their flight, nesting about the ruins the way they do, eating the wild pigs, leaving green droppings all over the streets. Laurel has hours and hours of it in Tri-D color, and he shows it at every office party. It's sort of a historical document, spider bats being on the way out now. True to his word, George started a sleeshy plague among them, and they're dropping like flies these days. Just the other week, one dropped down in the middle of the street with a big splat as I was on my way to Mama Julie's with a bottle of rum and a box of chocolates. It was quite dead when it hit. The sleeshy are very insidious. The poor spider bat doesn't know what's happening. He's flying along happily looking for someone to eat, and then zop, it hits him, and he falls into the middle of a garden party or somebody's swimming pool. I've decided to retain the office for the time being. I'll set up some kind of parliament after I've whipped up an opposition party to the Radpole, in Dreb or something like that, maybe, like independent rebuilders or such. Good old final forces of disruption. We needed them down here amid the ruins. And Cassandra, my princess, my angel, my lovely lady, she even likes me without my fungus. That night in the Valley of Sleep did it in. 
She, of course, had been the shipload of heroes Hassan had seen that day back at Pagasay. No golden fleece, though, just my gun rack and such. It had been the golden vanity which I'd built by hand, me, stout enough, I was pleased to learn, to take even the tsunami that followed that 9.6 Richter thing. She'd been out sailing in it at the time the bottom fell out of cars. Afterwards, she'd set sail for Volus because she knew Macronitza was full of my relatives. Oh, good thing that she had had this feeling that there was danger and had carried the heavy artillery ashore with her. Good thing, too, that she knew how to use it. I'll have to learn to take her premonitions more seriously. I purchased a quiet villa on the end of Haiti, opposite from the port. It's only about fifteen minutes skimming time from there, and it has a big beach and lots of jungle all around it. I have to have some distance, like the whole island between me and civilization, because I have this, well, hunting problem. The other day, when the attorneys dropped around, they didn't understand the sign, Beware the Dog. They do now. The one who's in traction won't sue for damages, and George will have him as good as new in no time. The others were not so severely taken. Good thing I was nearby, though. So here I am, in an unusual position as usual. The entire planet Earth was purchased from the Tolerite government, purchased by the large and wealthy Stigo Gens. The preponderance of expatriates wanted vegan citizenship anyhow, rather than remaining under the Tolerite ex-gov and working in the Combine as registered aliens. This has been coming for a long time, so the disposal of the earth became mainly a matter of finding the best buyer, because our exile regime lost its only other cause for existence the minute the citizenship thing went through. They could justify themselves while there were still earthmen out there, but now they're all vegans and can't vote for them, and we're sure not going to down here. Hence the sale of a lot of real estate, and the only bidder was the Stigo Gens. Wise old Tatrum saw that the Stigo Gens did not own Earth, though. The entire purchase was made in the name of his grandson, the late Court Mishtigo. And Mishtigo left this distribution desire, or last will and testament, vegan style, in which I was named, I've, uh, inherited a planet. The Earth, to be exact. Well, hell, I don't want the thing. I mean, I mean, sure, I'm stuck with it for a while, but I'll work something out. It was that infernal Weitstats machine and four other big think tanks that old Tatrum used. He was looking for a local administrator to hold the earth in fief and set up a resident representative government and then to surrender ownership on a fairly simple residency basis once things got rolling. He wanted somebody who'd been around a while, was qualified as an administrator, and who wouldn't want to keep the place for his very own. Among others, it gave him one of my names, then another, the second as a possibly still living. Then my personnel file was checked and more stuff on the other guy, and pretty soon the machine had turned up a few more names, all of them mine. It began picking up discrepancies and peculiar similarities, kept capocketing, and gave out more puzzling answers. Before long, Tatrum decided I had better be surveyed. Court came to write a book. He really wanted to see if I was good, honest, noble, pure, loyal, faithful, trustworthy, selfless, kind, cheerful, dependable, and without personal ambition. Which means he was a cockeyed lunatic because he said, yes, he's all that. I sure fooled him. Maybe he was right about the lack of personal ambition, though. I am pretty damn lazy, and am not at all anxious to acquire the headaches I see as springing up out of the tormented earth and blackjacking me daily. However, I am willing to make certain concessions so far as personal comfort is concerned. I'll probably cut myself back to a six-month vacation. One of the attorneys, not the one in traction, the one with the sling, delivered me a note from the blue one. It said in part, Dear whatever the blazes your name is, it is most unsettling to begin a letter this way, so I'll respect your wishes and call you Conrad. Conrad, by now you are aware of the true nature of my visit. I feel I have made a good choice in naming you as heir to the property commonly referred to as Earth. Your affection for it cannot be gainsaid. As Caragiosis, you inspired men to bleed in its defense. You are restoring its monuments, preserving its works of art. And as one stipulation of my will, by the way, I insist that you put back the Great Pyramid. And your ingenuity, as well as your toughness, both physical and mental, is singularly amazing. You also appear to be the closest thing to an immortal overseer available. I'd give a lot to know your real age, and this, together with your high survival potential, makes you really the only candidate. 
If your mutation ever does begin to fail you, there is always the SS series to continue linking the great chain of your days. I could have said forging, but it would not have been polite, inasmuch as I know you are an accomplished forger. All those old records. You drove poor Weitstats half mad with discrepancies. It is now programmed never to accept another Greek birth certificate as proof of age. I commend the earth into the hands of the Calacanzarus. According to legend, this would be a grave mistake. However, I am willing to gamble that you are even a Calacanzaros under false pretenses. You destroy only what you mean to rebuild. Probably you are Great Pan who only pretended to die. Whatever you will have sufficient funds and a supply of heavy equipment which will be sent this year, and lots of forms for requisitioning more from the Stigo Foundation. So go thou and be thou fruitful and multiply and re-inherit the earth. The gens will be around watching. Cry out if you need help, and help will be forthcoming. I don't have time to write you a book, sorry. Here is my autograph anyway. Court Mishtigo. P.S. I still don't know if it's art. Go to hell yourself. That is the gist of it. Pan, machines don't talk that way, do they? I hope not, anyway. The earth is a wild inhabitation. It is a tough and rocky place. The rubbish will have to be cleared section by section before some anti-rubbish can be put up, which means work, lots of it, which means I'll need all the office facilities as well as the Radpole organization to begin with. Right now I'm deciding whether or not to discontinue the ruin tours. I think I'll let them go on because for once we'll have something good to show. There is that certain element of human curiosity which demands that one halt in his course and peer through a hole in any fence behind which construction work is going on. We have money now, and we own our own property again, and that makes a big difference. Maybe even returnism isn't completely dead. If there is a vital program to revive the earth, we may draw back some of the ex-pop, may snag some of the new tourists. Or, if they all want to remain vegans, they can do that too. We'd like them, but we don't need them. Our outbound immigration will be dropping off, I feel, once people know that they can get ahead here. And our population will increase more than just geometrically, what with the prolonged fertility period brought on by the now quite expensive SS series. I intend to socialize SS completely. I'll do it by putting George in charge of a public health program featuring mainland clinics and offering SS all over the place. We'll make out. I'm tired of being a gravekeeper, and I don't really want to spend from now till Easter cutting through the tree of the world, even if I am a dark born with a propensity for trouble. When the bells do ring, I want to be able to say, Alethos Aneste, risen indeed, rather than dropping my saw and running, ring-a-ding the bells, clackety-clack the hooves, etc. Now is the time for all good Calacanzaroi, you know. So... Cassandra and I have this villa on the Magic Island. She likes it here. I like it here. She doesn't mind my indeterminate age anymore, which is fine. Just this early morning, as we lay on the beach watching the sun chase away stars, I turned to her and mentioned that this is going to be a big, big ulcer-giving job full of headaches and such. No, it isn't, she replied. Don't minimize what is imminent, I said. It makes for incompatibility. None of that either. You are too optimistic, Cassandra. No, I told you that you were heading into danger before, and you were, but you didn't believe me then. This time I feel that things should go well, that's all. Granting your accuracy in the past, I still feel you are underestimating that which lies before us. She rose and stamped her foot. You never believe me. Of course I do. It just happens that this time you're wrong, dear. She swam away then, my mad mermaid, out into the dark waters. After a time, she came swimming back. Okay, she said, smiling, shaking down gentle reins from her hair. Sure. I caught her ankle, pulled her down beside me, and began tickling her. Stop that. Hey, I believe you, Cassandra. Really. Hear that? Oh, how about that? I really believe you. Damn, you sure are right. And you are a smart, alecky, calicans. Ouch! And she was lovely by the seaside. So I held her in the wet till the day was all around us feeling good. Which is a nice place to end a story. Sick. End of This Immortal by Roger Zelazny.
narrated by Donald Hotaling in the studios of American Foundation for the Blind Incorporated for the Library of Congress, August 1979. For special distribution as authorized by Act of Congress under Public Law 89-522 with the permission of the copyright holder and the publisher, Ace Books, Grosset and Dunlap. End of book.